Community Affairs Officer and uh, Vice President of Community Development Studies and Education here at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. It is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all here to the bank and welcome you to the Research Symposium on Gentrification and Neighborhood Change. I'm going to start off by um, really thanking our partners. This was a joint event. Um, we uh, have collaborated with the, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis, and you'll hear from my colleague, uh, Michael Grover, at the end of the day. Uh, and we've also collaborated with NYU's Furman Center. Uh, Ingrid Gould Allen has been uh, not only a leader in this field of research, but also a tremendous partner in helping us think through uh, how to organize this event and bring uh, such an esteemed uh, uh, collection of uh, uh, academics and practitioners together to discuss these issues. Together with Lee Ding, uh, who is on our staff here in the Community Development Department, uh, and Sydney Diava, who is our Community Engagement Associate, uh, as well as well as Michael Williams from the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. They've designed what I see as an extraordinarily ambitious agenda for today. I, I told our, our panelists earlier, uh, we had no expectation that all of these people would accept. We were just hopeful uh, that they would, and every one of them accepted. I, I assume people would have uh, much more exciting summer plans, but they wanted to be here with you all here um, to discuss these uh, important issues. Uh, the panel is the panels that we have uh, for you today include um, a, a foundational panel, which will be our first, talking about the patterns and causes of gentrification. We'll then move and talk about uh, the consequences and the policy approaches to gentrification. And then we're going to have a policy I'm sorry, a practitioner responses panel where we'll talk about the various ways in which community organizations and city governments have really thought about addressing these issues, uh, critical issues of neighborhood change. We're also going to hear through a keynote um, speech uh, from Catherine O'Regan, the Assistant Deputy Secretary for PDNR. And so we're very much looking forward to that conversation about how the federal government is really thinking about these issues, specifically around how they impact uh, housing uh, and access to opportunity. Um, this is an important conversation for us on, on a couple of different levels. Uh, you know, our department's goal, one of our goals and our objectives and all of the work that we do is really to create an environment where we are encouraging research-informed practice and practice-informed research. And I think today's agenda just really clearly epitomizes the importance of bringing together the practitioner and the academic audience. It's, it's through those interactions and through those conversations that I think we get um, the best responses to some of the issues that are impacting our communities. Um, I'm going to say a couple of logistical things. Uh, uh, and then uh, turn it over to our um, opening uh, uh, speaker. Uh, but uh, first, I want to just uh, point out a couple of things in your packets. Um, there's an evaluation form, and I want you to please take the opportunity to, uh, to look at that and fill it out. I think it's important in this context, not only for what you have to say about the event, but what contributions or what thoughts you have about what we could be doing in the future on this and other topics. We really look carefully at those evaluation forms. And so if you have thoughts about how we can extend this conversation, I ask you to um, please share those with us. Uh, if you need Wi-Fi, please look at the back of your uh, uh, name tag, and you'll see a, a passcode for the Wi-Fi. And if you need any assistance, staff is all around uh, in the uh, room here and out in the lobby, and they'll be happy to assist you. Um, also, on in terms of the conversation, I encourage you, if those of you who are on Twitter, please uh, you know, tweet your responses and tweet your comments at the hashtag gentrification talk. We encourage you to uh, participate in that conversation. And lastly, on that topic, Please note that there's a camera there, which is why I'm so uncomfortable this morning. Uh, we are live streaming. Uh, and uh, thank you. Kathy Pettit sent the message out on her thank you uh, this morning. Uh, so I either owe you a thanks or, uh, you know, a no, not, not, not good, um, to ask people to please tune in to this day. I think there is, there is a huge, huge, huge amount of interest in this session. I think we were having a conversation last night. HUD ha hosted a, a, a webinar around this topic. There were 1,100, 1,200 people participating in in that conversation. We had a webinar a couple of weeks ago. Again, 1,100 people registered to participate in that webinar conversation. Uh, we have a maximum capacity here of about 115 in this room. We've got about 120 people registered and another 25 who are waiting uh, in the wings in case one of you leaves your seat. We will be filling it. Um, so we anticipate this room to be full throughout the day. Um, 
And lastly, I just wanted to say that um, uh, the presentations that you will see today will all be available shortly, and you'll receive an email notification when those are posted online. Um, I, I want to end off by thanking our presenters, because I, I realized something that hit me late on Sunday. I'm looking through some of the materials, including this you know, fantastic um, packet, and my 15-year-old daughter comes into the room, and she looks at the packet, and she says, oh, gentrification, um, is that good or is that bad? Um, and so two things happened in that moment. So I have a daughter who has for 15 years resisted learning anything about the work that I do. So I had that moment for those of you who have teenagers when you're like, don't blow this, don't blow it. Um, and so I was, you know, I was like, don't be too excited. So, you know, we're getting into a conversation and at the end she said, no, seriously, is it good or is it bad? And so I realized that we're asking our presenters to do, you know, a tremendous task here today. We're asking them to take a subject where people really just want the black or white. Tell me how I'm supposed to feel about this. Is this a good thing or a bad thing? And we're asking them to really delve into the nuances of this topic and to provide us with some objective research that allows us to form which I, what I think is going to be a very kind of complicated uh, perspective on a complicated topic. And so um, I thank my daughter for giving me that perspective, but I really want to thank our presenters for spending the time and energy to not only do this great work, but to come here and share it with us in a way that I think we're all going to be able to use it much more effectively. So with that, my real job is to introduce introduce our opening uh, speaker who really needs no introduction. After a long and impressive career in, in housing research where he has written and spoken on a broad range of topics related to housing and urban issues, um, and in, in his professional capacity, um, he has been fantastic. But I think I can say this as someone who uh, had just the, um, the great honor of him just sh sharing information with me in the hallway as like a graduate student or a research analyst. So someone who has given up his knowledge in ways that I think have benefited the field. And um, I am just uh, really pleased to say that you were, we've been very lucky to have him now in the system uh, as the director of the Division of Consumer and Con Consumer Affairs, I'm sorry, Consumer and Community Affairs at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Um, so Eric Belsky has held that position since 2014. And in this capacity, he oversees the system's work on consumer-focused supervision, research, and policy analysis. Uh, so I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Eric Belsky to the podium. Thank you. I was on the wrong side of the room, but now I'm on the right side of the room. So uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with you. I think Teresa did a terrific job in introducing uh, the event uh, and also an incredibly gracious job of introducing me. So thank you for that, Teresa. I'm glad you had that moment of parental connection with your child over a conference. That's fringe benefit when you do something like this. Uh, but it's really a pleasure uh, to be here. <clears throat> I think when you hear uh, Teresa's enthusiasm and you just look around the room at the quality of the participants in this event, you can see why it's such a, a privilege to be part of an enterprise like this. The Federal Reserve System has in each of its District 12 uh, Federal Reserve District banks community affairs officers like uh, Teresa, whose job it is to oversee a function that has a variety of different aims and goals, one of which is to conduct research on important urban topics, another of which is to try to convene stakeholders uh, in local communities who are interested in addressing issues in ways that they can uh, hope to come together in ways that solve uh, their, their issues and their challenges. And the Federal Reserve takes great pride in its ability to convene a very wide range of different kinds of participants. I think what we have here today, which is uh, wonderful, is the combination of people who are studying issues of gentrification, practitioners who are working on these issues, and policymakers who are trying to set policy around these issues. And that's a really uh, wonderful combination. It's very common for people to come to the Federal Reserve district banks from a very wide variety of different uh, uh, perspectives and from a wide uh, range of different sectors to try to come together and work on issues. And we feel we're at our best in our community's affairs function when we're helping uh, bring those people together and equipping them with information that we think is meaningful uh, to them and that will help them make uh, choices in how they're going to address issues that's rooted in fact. And I think Teresa said it very well, that when you do that kind of thing, you realize that uh, the nature of most issues is that they're complicated and they're complex. 
Having said that, after years of research, and many of the issues that people are looking at have had years of research, you start to take a step back and you understand um, what those complexities look like and how you can tailor your strategies to the particular situation that you find yourself in. And you're going to hear throughout the day, because I uh, reviewed the papers for the conference uh, on a couple of flights this week, uh, a lot uh, about what we know or what we think we know and the complexity of what we think we know. So I wanted to uh, just do a couple of things in, in my remarks. One is talk a little bit about why the Federal Reserve System is interested in low and moderate income communities and what happens to them. And then talk a little bit about just the broader question of uh, gentrification as a way to set the stage for what's to follow. So let me start a little bit with why the Federal Reserve is interested in this. And it really relates to uh, two of its statutory mandates. Uh, it's understanding what happens in low and moderate income communities and the process and change in those communities and what causes some communities to be more vital economically to offer uh, greater employment opportunities to the people living in those communities comes from the half of our dual mandate, uh, which is full employment. And we understand full well that uh, the tools of monetary policy are limited in their ability to reach uh, more targeted and tailored uh, kind of populations. So we're interested in understanding what works uh, in economic development in low and moderate income communities, what works in workforce development, what works in fostering innovation and entrepreneurship and small businesses in those communities. Uh, because those are things and tools and actions that are beyond the reach of monetary policy. But as a, a central bank that has invested a lot in research capacity, helping others understand those kinds of things, who can use those other kinds of tools, who can take those other kind of actions, is one way in which uh, we can uh, pursue that, that, uh, that mission. Uh, the second, of course, is our set of responsibilities, again, statutory in nature, for the Community Reinvestment Act, which provides an affirmative obligation on <clears throat> deposit-taking institution banks uh, to meet the service investment and the lending needs of low and moderate income communities subject to safe and sound lending. So in this context, we're also very interested in what works in community development, how you build communities and strengthen them, and how you uh, can identify and actually uh, cultivate and nurture opportunities for investment in those communities? What are the approaches that attract capital? And I think importantly, because uh, the Community Reinvestment Act, as I think everyone in the room knows, was intended to uh, place this affirmative obligation on financial institutions, but as I said, subject to safe and sound lending. And one of the ways that you make lending safe and sound is to make communities uh, to stabilize communities, to see communities improving, so that if you're lending to uh, real estate, the collateral values are secure uh, and potentially increasing. Uh, if you lend to households in that community, they have opportunities to earn steady incomes. Uh, those kinds of things matter. So uh, across the Federal Reserve System, especially in the community affairs function, we spend a lot of time, energy, and effort trying to understand what works in community development. We spend a lot of time trying to get people together to uh, focus on what they see as common uh, opportunities for investment and common challenges and impediments to investment in low and moderate income communities in the hope that they can make progress in making uh, more uh, and sounder investment and in the end uh, create not only a better a living environment for uh, people in those communities, the residents of those communities, but more vital neighborhoods, more vital economies, stronger economic growth, stronger employment. So the kinds of topics that you're going to be here discussing today are, from our perspective, very, very important. Uh, and so I want to thank you for taking your time uh, to be with us here today. When I look around the room, I, I am very impressed by the quality of the participants and very thankful to our many partners who you'll see uh, on the stage. I think many of you are, are audience and participants on the, 
on the podium because there's so many people crammed into this agenda. I look at Michael Grover, who does a very similar set of functions in Minneapolis, a partnership with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, you know, a federal agency, and of course my good friend uh, Ingrid Ellen Gould, who I think everybody knows, uh, uh, Ingrid Gould Ellen, everyone knows very well, uh, and is just a, a terrific uh, and thoughtful person on these issues. So let me talk a second about um, the issues of gentrification. So obviously gentrification just uh, represents one process of change in low and moderate income communities, and I think it's interesting uh, when she asks, is gentrification good or bad, I thought she'd start by asking, what is gentrification? Uh, because as you know, there isn't really necessarily a single common definition of gentrification. I think for the purposes of what we're here to talk about today, probably the most salient feature is that it's a process and change in which the resident composition in a low and moderate income neighborhood shifts towards people with relatively higher incomes uh, and does so in uh, uh, with some uh, materiality, so it gets uh, to a threshold that people think of as gentrification, because of course neighborhoods are changing all the time. When you look at renter mobility rates, and a lot of these neighborhoods are half or greater renters, there's people moving in and out of apartments all the time, in and out of neighborhoods all the time. But there's something unique in this process where you see that shift towards people with relatively higher incomes. And often there's a, 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 another dimension, which is an, a racial or ethnic composition. Uh, shift associated with it, but I'll focus more on the relatively higher income one, but also just the notion of uh, uh, increased demand for a community from a group of, uh, of, of residents that are different from the composition of the residents there because it also creates competition for uh, housing in those communities. And I think the main consequence of gentrification that we're here to discuss and that gets highlighted, and I think for appropriate reasons, is the, uh, is the erosion of housing affordability. Now, there's a lot, as you know, of argument and a lot of literature, uh, I wouldn't say a lot, a, a, a significant number of efforts to understand displacement. Uh, and they've uh, produced uh, some mixed results, uh, with most suggesting that, yes, when you have uh, people with relatively higher incomes moving in. There are people who literally feel displaced and forced out when you ask them after the fact as to why they left that neighborhood. But more generally, it causes uh, housing to become unaffordable. And the reason I like to focus on that is that has consequences for the people who stay and the people who left. Uh, and it has the consequences for people who stay, which is, you know, underscored all the time by my, my, uh, my uh, old uh, home, the Joint Center for Housing Studies what happens when you have that little to spend on everything less, and it has very significant consequences, including economic consequences. So I think it's the unaffordability that I, I'd, I'd ask you to focus on. Uh, and several studies have shown that it's not just that housing costs, of course, rise, it's that when rents go up in that community, the cost of everything goes up because it becomes part of the cost of doing business in that community. So the cost of retail goods go up, the cost of living uh, gets higher. So that's the, the consequence that I think you'll hear a lot about, and appropriately so. The causes of gentrification, about which you'll hear a lot, are complicated, and they can vary depending on place and over time. And again, you're going to hear a lot about it. So I just wanted to give you sort of like the, uh, uh, I guess I was at 40,000 feet or whatever uh, yesterday, uh, flying here, probably not that high, 25,000 feet view. Um, and that is, it can reflect changing preferences of certain households with relatively higher income. Over time, those people with relatively higher income uh, decide that they want some amenity that a community offers uh, where low and moderate income people are living. It can reflect mixed changes, holding preferences uh, constant, such as uh, if younger households who have shown uh, a markedly higher propensity to live in cities uh, and a greater willingness to move into communities uh, that uh, start with lower incomes than they have, then you don't have to have preferences change, you can just have the mix of the population change. Or it can reflect, and this is an important one which I'll come back to, conditions in low and moderate income communities that make them more appealing to those with higher incomes. Um, and the reasons why conditions can change in those communities in a favorable direction that makes them more attractive to people who can pay more 
for housing, uh, the reasons for those improving conditions are very varied. Uh, and some of them can be just the fact that gentrifiers are moving into those uh, communities. So I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then also, of course, the other challenges in cities under the greatest gentrification pressures are places uh, that will inevitably create greater distance between low and moderate income people because a lot of the gentrification, and there's one of the papers talks about within two kilometers of the central business district, a lot of the gentrification tends to take place uh, close to uh, the downtown, and therefore people are, uh, who have lower incomes are forced to find housing at greater distances, which moves them further uh, often from transit and further from uh, employment opportunities. So it's another consequence that we have to think about. So I think that scholars and practitioners have come to understand that gentrification can be both a cause and a consequence of increased investment in low moderate income communities. It can be a cause, obviously, because housing costs can rise due to the private investment that people with relatively higher incomes bring, or developers and others who uh, look to take advantage of uh, the, the interest of people who are willing to pay higher rents uh, to make private investments that improve housing, can improve community amenities, uh, and it can attract other forms of private investment by you know, retailers and others. Uh, and it creates greater competition for existing housing uh, from those who are gentrifying the neighborhood. So that's where gentrification itself is a significant cause uh, for that change. And sometimes there are neighborhoods where the conditions seem ripe, but there wasn't particularly anything going on until um, there was a, 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 a growing number, and there was a lot of early studies in the 70s and 80s. I remember reading about, and one was Kathy Nelson, who was at HUD. Um, I think she did her dissertation on it about, you know, the pioneers, the in-movers. But what we also started to realize is that it can also be a consequence, um, because housing costs can also rise and gentrification begin, at least initially, as a result of public investment in community development that then attracts those with higher incomes. And it's this potential uh, for public investment uh, to result in gentrification that raises in turn the question of which residents should benefit from public investments in community development. And this is where the latter part of your day will head. These investments can take a, a number of uh, forms. Of course, public subsidies for real estate development and preservation of housing tax incentives, we've got low-income housing tax credits, we've got new markets tax credits for housing, businesses, community facilities, <clears throat> to direct public investment in better public facilities and services that are often part and parcel of the full-fledged neighborhood revitalization. As I'm standing here, I thought of the other huge one, of course, which is government guarantees, things like the Small Business Administration, which may be used um, disproportionately highly in communities like this. So in this context, there's heightened awareness of the importance of deliberateness uh, in uh, taking steps to ensure that if the consequence you're concerned about is housing becoming increasingly unaffordable and or displacing people, that you have to take deliberate steps to ensure that affordable housing is preserved or developed in neighborhoods that are transitioning towards stronger markets, towards higher rents, that all these things end up getting capitalized into rents. And the only way to really, therefore, uh, ensure that there's going to be a continuing opportunity for people who can't pay those kinds of rents uh, to stay in those communities or for those people who can't afford those kind of rents but skimp and scrimp on everything else. Uh, not to have to do that is to do something deliberate. And there are a lot of deliberate steps. Again, I think you'll hear about some of them. My good friend Jeff Lubell will talk about some of this inclusionary zoning, uh, stewarded shared equity home ownership models like community land trusts, shared equity programs that are more scattered site in nature, uh, co-ops, limited equity co-ops, all of these, there's a lot of research, some there's less, um, and uh, in some cases we've learned lessons about how to get it right, and in some cases we're still trying to understand. Then of course there's rental properties, which is the most common way, which are subject to rent restrictions tied to tax credits or direct subsidies, and then there's lots of other models as well. Absent these kinds of deliberate approaches, uh, fewer low-income people will be able to afford to live in gentrified communities. Policymakers will uh, have missed an opportunity to, to um, 
reduce residential segregation by income. Many people see in gentrification when they know it's starting a missed opportunity to try to get in when uh, land values have not risen to the extent that they're going to, uh, to try to tie down more housing uh, for affordable use. So you have a, a feast of riches in front of you today. I'm not going to get into uh, which I, I, I was asked to, but I don't have enough time. Uh, research questions I thought were important and uh, some of the findings I thought were important, but I, I erred on the side of a general framing. We're going to move right now into a conversation of where I think uh, a, a meeting like this with the ambitiousness of scope that it has ought to start, which is about what are we seeing in terms of gentrification, how much activity, where, the patterns, the, co the causes of gentrification, and what we think we know and how to think about those things. And that's going to build the foundation for a discussion of the consequences um, uh, beyond the ones that I mentioned, importantly focusing on uh, consequences for business, which has been an understudied and underappreciated area, and then move uh, into the afternoon to think about policy and then practice. And I think that's the... Uh, I don't know, is that the trifecta or the, or the uh, four bases? I, I, don't, I, didn't, I was, wasn't keeping count. Uh, but either way, you have a great day uh, in front of you with remarkable people. Uh, and I'm just uh, so privileged to be part of this and want to thank you all for attending. Thanks. There we go. Part. There we go. So good morning. I think um, Eric did a fantastic job laying out what this panel is supposed to do and setting a foundation for the rest of our conversation. So I'm going to forego my remarks because I would much rather hear from our uh, great panelists. I'm going to let you know that uh, we're going to go in the following order and folks are going to um, uh, do the presentations uh, and then we'll hear from a discussant and then we'll open up the conversation for questions. We'll start with Nathaniel Baum Snow, Associate Professor of Business Economics at the University of Toronto, uh, and then we'll move uh, to Lena Edland, Associate Professor of Economics at Columbia University. We'll hear then from Jesse Hanbury, who is an Assistant Professor um, here in Philadelphia at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, go third district. Um, <laughs> and uh, then we will hear from Ingrid Gold Ellen, uh, the Paulette Goddard Professor of Urban Policy and Planning and the Director of the Furman Center for real estate and urban policy at New York. As I said, we would then, we'll then take a break and hear from our discussant, Jeffrey Lin, who is an economic advisor and economist here in the research department at the Philadelphia Fed. Uh, I'm gonna ask that you all hold your questions until our panelists have had a chance to respond to the discussant and then we'll take as many questions as we can. Um, I'm holding it my personal responsibility to try to keep us on time as much as possible. Uh, and I'm also asking, um, to rem I'm, gonna, I'm gonna remind you all that we are live streaming the event and so if you do, uh, ask a question, please use your table microphones and speak clearly uh, so that we're able to capture those questions for our audience. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nathaniel. All right, well, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thanks a lot for, for organizing this. This is going to be a great uh, uh, session. Um, so, so what I want to do in this talk is think about kind of uh, some facts about uh, neighborhood change, essentially neighbor, especially central neighborhood change uh, that are laid out there. And then I want to show uh, uh, that these rebounds of central neighborhoods I'm going to talk about have been more pronounced uh, in metro areas with uh, stronger 
uh, labor demand growth, strong, stronger job growth, especially in downtown areas. Um, and then I want to provide a sort of an accounting of the central neighborhood changes that have occurred uh, by thinking about how different demographic groups share of the total population uh, ha have affected this and how their changes in the share of, of sort of minorities and, and college educated, et cetera, have mechanically affected downtown neighborhood change. And also then thought about for each specific demographic group, how their changes in neighborhood choices have been important. Okay. Um, and then I want to kind of tee off uh, the, the, the remaining speakers in this session to think about a little bit about the causes of these changes uh, uh, conceptually. So uh, a few motivating graphs. This is uh, a graph of um, taking the top 120 metropolitan areas in the U.S. and looking as a function of distance to the central business district uh, what population growth has looked like. Uh, in each of these decades. And what you see here is that right at CBDs, you've had population growth uh, happening that's been more rapid than just outside CBDs, even starting in the 80s, uh, uh, going into the 90s, but then that's really expanded uh, a lot between 2000 and 2010. And in fact, between 2000 and 2010, these neighborhoods right at CBDs have been the fastest growing in terms of population in the median of the top 120, uh, sort of the large metro areas. Okay, so this is kind of the phenomenon that I think this session is about and we're trying to understand here. Okay, um, so that's population. It's hard to see with population because you've got to look right at CBDs. If you look at um, other, other measures that are more about the composition of the population, I think it's a little bit more stark. So if you look at fraction white, fraction of the residential population that's white, you see kind of, uh, uh, hard to tell before 2000, but then after 2000, you see this big uh, relative increase in fraction white for these areas within about four kilometers of CBDs. Um, and in fact, these are the only neighborhoods, uh, the only types of neighborhoods in metro areas that have been growing in terms of the fraction of the population that's white, given the declining white fraction in the population overall. Okay, um, and then uh, we have the fraction with a college degree, and kind of the same story there. Okay, that, that right near CBDs, you see this rapid relative increase in the fraction of the residential population with the college degree. Okay, so, you know, this session is called gentrification, and this, this conference is about gentrification. What do we mean by this, or how, how do I want to think about this? Well, conceptually, I want to think about gentrification as increases in housing demand, uh, uh, in neighborhoods that start off poor or with low socioeconomic status, okay? So that could manifest itself in different ways in different places. So it could manifest itself as increases in housing costs, as increases in population, or as uh, kind of changes in the socioeconomic status of the population. And, and which one, which combination of those three things we see, I think is going to depend on kind of how easy it is to build new homes. And so I think it makes sense to look for all of those things. Um, for the, the next few kind of facts I want to show you, I'm going to use uh, what I call an SES index, which is just an equally weighted index of uh, uh, fraction white, uh, median income, and uh, the fraction with a college degree. Um, and those things are going to be kind of the, the three indicators that are pretty stark. Okay, so these are the 120 metropolitan areas that we looked at. Um, and in 1980, you see two that had, uh, w whose neighborhoods within four kilometers of CBDs were kind of more, had a higher socioeconomic status than the median neighborhood in the, in, in, in the metro area. New York, New York and Santa Barbara, okay? Uh, by 2010, you see a, a bunch more, you know, you see Atlanta and Portland, uh, Chicago up there, et cetera, uh, but not so many more, okay? Uh, uh, really, the changes that we've seen, the changes that I showed you in those initial graphs, uh, have been very widespread, and they've maybe been a little bit more oriented towards larger metro areas in terms of population, but they've been very widespread. But still, you know, downtown neighborhoods are more distressed than kind of the median neighborhood in metros, okay? So we're not talking, I mean, we talk about revitalization of downtowns. I think there's, there's still a ways to go even to get most of these downtowns of most metros to look like kind of the typical neighborhood in the metro, okay? Um, 
this is just showing for Chicago. Um, this is the, the socioeconomic status index in 1980 and 2010. Um, and each dot here is a census tract in the metro. Okay. And so we have the 45 degree line and then we have the regression line. And, and the fact that the regression line is flatter than the 45 degree line says that kind of neighborhoods have a tendency to converge in terms of their socioeconomic status. And that's, uh, that's true basically whichever metro area you look at. Um, and I think we want to think about gentrifying areas as areas kind of in the upper left of the graph that started off with low SES status that moved up faster than you would expect given kind of trends in the metro. And the darker dots there are census tracts that are within four kilometers of the CBD. And you see a lot of dark dots up in the left, left, upper left quadrant of the graph there. Um, I think it's really uh, quite stark what's going on uh, with these downtown neighborhoods. And you see this for Chicago, and I want to look at it systematically uh, across, across these metros in our sample. Okay? So what could be the drivers of of gentrification for these central areas or for any neighborhoods, I guess. Well, as I said, one could be shifts in the, just demographic shifts in the population. Um, and the other could be kind of changes in the cho neighborhood choices of demographic subgroups. Okay, so I think there are two broad classes of reasons why neighborhood choices should change, could change. One is that the spatial structure of labor demand uh, has changed or, or job opportunities have changed, maybe especially for more high skilled uh, high educated people. And the other is that the amenity value of, of these neighborhoods have changed. And so I, later, you know, as we go through the session, we're going to hear about both of these things. Um, Dan Hartley and I looked uh, more at the, at, the, at the labor market opportunities. So I'm going to have a little bit to say about that, but I think Lena Edlin's going to have more. Um, you know, just looking at the data on where new, where employment growth has happened, you do see a, a shift uh, a little bit that means it looks like maybe there is something there. So this is just uh, as a function of CBD distance, what employment growth looked like in the 90s and between 2000 and 2010. And so for the downtown areas, you basically got the stabilization of employment declines. The employment had been declining there, the number of jobs there have been declining, and after 2000, kind of it stabilized and started looking more like the rest of, of sort of other neighborhoods. And so maybe that's something there, but there certainly hasn't been robust employment growth in downtown neighborhoods. Okay, so what I want to do is a few exercises where I look at, well, basically one exercise where I look at uh, whether employment growth can predict changes in SES status or SES for, for downtown neighborhoods. And to do that, we want to pick out kind of some exogenous variation, some, some source of randomization and employment growth, both at the metro level and uh, for neighborhoods that are near downtowns, okay? So I'm going to use these, uh, these uh, so-called Bartik variables to do that. I think Lena Edlin will tell you more about these. Um, and look at a regression that looks like this. So basically take the data at the track level and regress uh, the socioeconomic status uh, of the, at the track at year T in a metro area, uh, account for different uh, uh, slopes and intercepts uh, relative to 10 years earlier, and, and then look at uh, whether there, you can find significant differences in this kind of convergence or, or e upgrading in terms of socioeconomic status of tracks near central business districts, and whether that's been particularly true for metro areas with strong employment growth at the metro level or, uh, and strong employment growth at the, at, at, at the, at, in the neighborhood near within four kilometers of the central business district, okay, with some controls in there. Okay, so what you get when you do that is kind of first as a baseline, you see these neighborhoods near the CBDs uh, have declining socioeconomic status up until 2000 when uh, they start increasing. So the red means po significantly positive, the blue means significantly negative. And these, uh, you know, there's some evidence here that, the, that there's been increases in the socioeconomic status of downtown neighborhoods that have been bigger in metros that have had uh, positive uh, 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 employment growth. But I think maybe somewhat stronger evidence that, you know, particularly it's been true in, in metros that have had positive employment growth downtown, okay? Um, and this is, these are, this is for neighborhoods starting off poor, okay? Starting off in the, in the bottom tercile. You see somewhat similar uh, patterns looking at middle tercile and top tercile neighborhoods, kind of medium, and, and rich neighborhoods, 
um, that they tended to turn around, but it's a little bit less clear and the turnarounds are less pronounced. Okay, so that's that's one set of facts I wanted to show you. And then let me skip the math here. And then then, then the second thing I wanted to show you, bit, sort of uh, to try to understand a little bit more what's going on here, is to look at the, the the relative importance of demographic change versus change in neighborhood choices by demographic subgroups. So I want to kind of walk through uh, adding uh, cumulatively adding the the shifts in central neighborhood choices. By these very by these demographic subgroups, and then on top of that, holding the demographic the shares of the population that are black, educated, etc., constant, and then add on that additional kind of demographic component to see how important each of these things have been for the central neighborhood change that I've been talking about. So, kind of as a so, so what these this this table shows on the left hand side there is that basically downtown neighborhoods were declining in population within four kilometers of CBDs, sorry, two kilometers of CBDs uh, in, uh, between 1980 and 2000, while CBSAs were growing at about 20%. After 2000, you kind of have similar population growth rates for the two, okay? Um, so that's a baseline. And then th th this kind of tells you how much of the, the, the changes, the population declines in these central neighborhoods are accounted for by changing neighborhood choices of each of these demographic subgroups. Uh, uh, depending on, and so on the left there, you kind of see different ways of, 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 of uh, assigning kind of uh, the, de the demographics, okay? So, so kind of the, the broad picture is for low socioeconomic status minorities and whites alike, they were leaving these neighborhoods like crazy in the 80s and the 90s, whereas kind of high socioeconomic status whites, and to some extent non-whites too, they had essentially stable central neighborhood choices. They weren't leaving in droves like the, the lower socioeconomic status people were, okay? And really what the change was is that, uh, yes, the higher socioeconomic status whites started coming back uh, rather than just not, not leaving, they actually started moving in, but the, uh, the low socioeconomic status whites actually kind of stopped leaving as well, okay? And so when you look at white fraction, uh, that, that accounts for a lot of that, and that, that accounts for a lot of the population growth uh, that, that started occurring in these downtown neighborhoods. <laughs> the low socioeconomic status minorities kept leaving at this pretty much the same rate. Okay? So that, that's kind of an accounting for those population changes. Uh, looking at uh, sort of family structure, it does, there is some evidence that, that the fact that there are more single people, uh, people and families without children it, uh, has been important. Um, and, and, and this is at a baseline with, with growing uh, fraction of the population that's minority, which has actually helped downtown neighborhoods. Okay, so I'm, I'm kind of out of time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, just run through these. You can do the same sort of exercise with fraction white and, uh, and, find, and find similar conclusions. Uh, but overall, you know, I think this is a big phenomenon. These downtown neighborhoods have been growing in terms of population very close to CBDs and socioeconomic status. And, uh, you know, I sh think I showed you some facts about, I think, that maybe to help us understand better uh, why this is. Okay, so I'll turn it over to Lee Thank you. So uh, very pleased to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me, and uh, uh, wonderful to be part of this uh, very exciting session. Uh, this is joint work with uh, Cecilia Machado and Maria Sviatki, um, and uh, we use uh, restricted use census data, and we have been given um, the uh, it's been cleared for disclosure. So we are going to um, look at. Uh, Gentrification is the, is the theme, and, and our take on gentrification is to go straight to housing prices. And uh, what we, um, there's going to be a focus in my talk uh, on what high income households want to do. This is not because we think this is necessarily something that is only about high income, but we think high income households are very interesting because if we think of in the simplest form, real estate being in fixed supply, 
Uh, high income households can outbid low income households. So where the high income households, we need to watch them because where they want to be, that's where low income households will not be able to compete. So uh, this is uh, just a one, uh, I think gentrification is in the news every day. This is, this is old, but the, the, the story is current. Um, so um, this is plotting um, the median. This is self-reported uh, value of a two to three bedroom home in $1980,000. Uh, but each observation is a tract. We do this by mouse uh, from the CDD. And you probably cannot see this, but um, this is the series in uh, 1980. I should mention that this is, uh, we picked the 20 largest cities in the US in um, 1970 and in 2010. Um, the union of, of those two sets uh, is 27 cities. Uh, we pick a CBD in, in those cities and then we just draw a circle 30, with a 35 mile radius. The tracts are, uh, constitute uh, our, our sample. We have about 65,000 tracts. Um, and what you see here is in 1980 is that there's a slight premium to centrality. Uh, but that pretty much. Uh, out of three miles out, it, it reverses, and then the further out you go, the higher the house prices. So uh, I think in the back of our mind, what we should is, is of course, that house prices are endogenous. So, so we could have on the uh, y-axis, say, household income or some measure of uh, socioeconomic status. What we find very interesting is that already in 1990, this pattern has reversed. <laughs> so we have a pivoting of this relationship with the um, centrality being commanding a high premium. And I think this is particularly interesting in view of the role of crime. So we have, uh, as, as you know, uh, crime has declined dramatically and crime was very much a central city phenomena. It is actually no longer the case. And, um, but what is interesting about this, you know, this is not to deny that r lower crime rates have made uh, living in the central city immeasurably more um, safer and, and uh, more enjoyable. But the 1980s is actually a decade with rising crime. Okay? Crime only comes down in the beginning of the 1990s. So in this 80s decade, we see this flipping of the relationship. This continues, uh, this is from 2000, and then uh, there's a shift up in 2010. So the difference here is uh, the red highlighted line, and we see that there's really important price gains uh, that increase uh, close to the, the center. And so th then this then raises a question, you know, why, why is that? Why has centrality become the amenity? And um, our hypothesis is that this has to do with uh, high income households working longer hours. And this happens for two reasons, or you can, not for two reasons, but we can decompose that. Um, we have more, um, the, the members of high income households work more. Okay? They, are, they are more likely to be in the workforce or work full time. And then we have, um, phenomena of a longer work week. I think uh, you're all familiar with 40 hours being sort of a nominal description of your work week. Many people now report closer to 50 hour work week. Okay? The, um, now, once you, uh, once you live at work, it makes a lot of sense to try to cut down on uh, low utility non-work activities and we put commuting in there. The other thing I need to note is that many of the uh, benefits of what the suburbs can provide, uh, primarily cheap space uh, and therefore a large home, is really something that you enjoy less if you're not going to be home. So this uh, tips the balance towards the, uh, the center. We have, um, when I say uh, that we have um, sort of more, uh, less leisure um, among the spouse slash a head in a head spouse in, in a household. We also have, as Nathan mentioned, we have more singles. Now, uh, well-educated, we tend to be the high income. Uh, they, they tend to marry eventually, but we should note that uh, the uh, average age for first marriage is 27 for women now. It's up from 20 around 1960. Okay. So we have an additional uh, seven years of singlehood. 
The, um, just to illustrate this further, the, uh, this is using the IPMs, plotting. Um, this is the household income distribution. If you look to the, this is a series showing the percent, say at, uh, at each point, that uh, of households that, or the fraction, that uh, is, um, is a dual earner where both spouses work full time. And you see that that actually increases throughout the income distribution. This is in 1980. And then it sort of, uh, and then it dips because we get more, um, we, we, we get uh, more housewives um, at the very top. Now in um, 2012, which was the last year I could do, uh, what you see is that whole thing is shifting up towards the right. Right, so it, it no, no, uh, so so we have more households here that are dual earner, full time, uh, two full time earners, to the uh, right of the 80, uh, 80th percentile. Now we also have singles, but uh, so the uh, the the I don't know, top or something a gray line here is showing the uh, the fraction single households uh, that work full time in 1980, and the darker one is in 2012. But the sum of this is that the um, the fraction of households at the top of the income distribution that has uh, at least one person not working full time has decreased. Okay, the um, this is showing this over time um, in in another way is just looking at uh, the um, Conditional on having no, this is by by education level, and uh, this is showing the uh, the fraction of uh, men and women who uh, work full time. Conditional on education. The dark series here is uh, is uh, people with a bachelor's degree or more, and what you can see here is that especially for women, which is the, the red lower two series, there's been a very strong increase since 1970. So I'm uh, just going to run through a little model. We're going to have rich and poor. You can be in the city or you can be in the countryside. And I'm going to build the countryside. OK, so get the suburb there right away. Um, the rich person can live in the city or uh, and in that case, the poor person is going to live in the suburb. The suburb is already built, so the, the, the poor person doesn't need to build. Okay? Or we can have the uh, rich person wanting to live in the city, in that case, sorry, in the suburb, in that case, the, the poor person is going to live in the city. So what is it going to be? Um, well, um, so, and sorry, obviously this then will impact rent. So what we emphasize here is that when we have short hours, okay, then, or we have more leisure, we have more non-market time, then uh, the choice is actually going to be the suburb. We can, we, we can show this in a very standard setup. Uh, whereas um, when we have long hours, uh, they're all 60 minutes, but you know what I'm talking about, then uh, the, uh, the choice is going to be the city and the, uh, the poor person is going to make do with what is uh, left. Now, uh, I, I only had uh, guys in there, but uh, let's, uh, uh, that include women, and I think that's uh, make this uh, uh, maybe uh, even more compelling. We can have a woman who is primarily a homemaker or a, a woman who works. Now, if the woman is a homemaker, she's going to want a home, okay? Uh, and if uh, she's uh, working, she, uh, she will want to be close to work. So our point here is that we have more of the high-income households having... Uh, uh, fewer non-working members, adult members, and that is going to shift priorities towards the center. This is this is our story. Now the question is, why is it that uh, this has happened? Um, and uh, I'm going to skip through this. Um, now, one of the things that I think comes up is, you know, where are jobs located? Implicit in this, I assume that jobs are in the CBD, and there, um, as, as Nathan showed, there's been uh, more growth actually in outside of the CBD. CBD is crowded, as you may know. Uh, the, the, the hinterland is area-wise much bigger. And this is showing the, um, so uh, please disregard the y-axis here because I, I got the denominator wrong. But um, what the, if you look at, can I point you? No. Uh, if you look at the upper left quadrant, that's people with, this is jobs held by people uh, who do not have a college degree. And the series is from 1980 
through uh, to 2010. What you see is that in 1980, if you can see that the dotted line there, there's a, uh, there's there's a concentration in the CBD that falls. Okay, so uh, the the central uh, business district loses a lot of unskilled jobs. When we look at the uh, BA plus, just go. Um, Maybe I can, is this how, okay. Here, if we go here, what you see is that there's an increase in jobs uh, held by people with a college degree, not so surprising, and the concentration in the CBD remains, okay? Okay, is this possible? Okay, so <laughs> one more minute. So what we do is something uh, very straightforward. Okay, so think of this regression, price in a tract as uh, a function of the fraction of the population prime age population that uh, is skilled and works full time. Now, uh, even I can uh, see a problem with this kind of regression. And um, so we're, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why we would find a positive relationship between that and not be very impressed. So what we wanted to do was to, imp uh, to uh, find a shifter, the Bartik shifter, thank you for <laughs> introducing that, um, which, um, takes uh, a base year and 1970 we think is a good base year because that is many uh, most people uh, assign that as the, the start of the IT revolution and the increasing returns to scale. So we take uh, the um, uh, 1970 as the base year and then project out um, the, uh, the predicted demand for skilled work. So, so uh, I will have to zoom past all of uh, uh, all of the what we do, uh, but what I want to show you is uh, let's see. This is uh, once we get to the IV. The, so the people, you know, I'm not empirical, but with with IV you can look at IV, you can look at the reduced form. They tell the same story. So I'm just going to go to the IV. This is uh, where we instrument the uh, fraction of skilled full time uh, by the Spartik that we let vary by the uh, distance to the CBD. This is, um, the, the gray here is the actual price change. These four series is the, uh, are, are the predicted price changes using four different measures of, the, um, of, of, of skilled full-time labor. And um, the, uh, here, is, here is another term. The, the lower panel uh, does a little bit better out, out here, and that is because we include an interaction with full time and distance. Now we don't quite have the power to do that, so that's sort of a weakness of that. So uh, uh, we do a number of cuts of the data, and uh, what I just want to say is that uh, in interesting for us is, is that it actually holds in in all these cuts, and we also pr uh, do a tracked panel data set where we hold uh, we can have panel fixed effect. So just to sum up, our observation is that we see an increasing premium to housing close to CBD, and this is our proposed explanation. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the invitation um, to present my work here. Um, this is joint work with Victor Couture, who's um, in the room as well. If you want to speak to either of us after, um, we'd be like, delighted. So, what are we doing um, in this work? Well, it's going to be similar to what we saw. What are you doing? What Nate's been doing? What Ingrid's doing? We're really trying to do two things. First, we're trying to document a trend that we've heard anecdotal evidence of. So uh, this trend that we're trying to document specifically is something that we refer to as urban revival, but it's really for us the urbanization of the college educated or the reurbanization of the college educated. And then we're going to try to explain this trend. And here we're going to try to identify the factors right, that are driving the young and the college educated to be moving back downtown. Okay, so 
In case I don't get through everything, I'm going to have a brief preview of our approach and our main results. Okay, so what do we do? We first establish a set of stylized facts. Um, these stylized facts um, uh, describe who's moving downtown, when did they start moving downtown again, and where they're moving downtown. So what we identify is we identify that this urban revival or this reurbanization of the college educated is a recent phenomenon, right? As we've seen, it's really taken off this compositional change of the people living downtown has really taken off in the past um, 10, 15 years. We find that it's very localized in downtown areas. So it's, as you'll, I'll show sp the spatial distribution in Philadelphia, and you'll see it's really sort of in and around this center city neighborhood here. And it's mostly in large cities. Right, larger cities relative to smaller cities. And then, as I've mentioned, it's driven by sort of the younger cohorts of the college educated women downtown. We're then going to try to explain these trends. And our approach here is going to be to estimate a model that describes or tries to explain why different types of households move to different types of locations generally. Right, so why do you choose to move into one tract versus another? And why do the young and college educated choose to move in certain types of tracts versus other types of tracts, regardless of whether they're urban or not? Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to use our estimated preferences to try to um, tease out why we're seeing the young and college educated now increasingly move downtown to urban areas versus suburban areas. And what we find here is that we find that the preferences for the young, of the young college educated are actually diverging from the preferences of the other types of households, so older cohorts and the high school educated, particularly for, for amenities. So here we're thinking about um, the services and retail locations you have access to. And that these changing preferences matter a lot for explaining why the young and college educated are increasingly moving downtown relative to other types of households. We then test additional hypotheses that we have for perhaps why these preferences are changing. And uh, the results so far in this analysis indicate that national trends in household formation and um, mortgage markets, so here we're thinking about credit constraints driven by the boom and the bust, um, uh, that these really don't explain this urban revival that we're, um, that we're looking at. So our, kind of, our takeaway at the moment is that there's something actually changing in the composition of the young college educated, particularly that their incomes are increasing, their disposable incomes are increasing, so they have more yes. to spend on these urban amenities downtown, right? and that that's why they're moving um, into these downtown neighbourhoods. Okay, so the stylized facts, quickly just to fix ideas, we've seen a lot of these types of things before. The specific question we're going to ask is, is the population in a given C um, CBSA of a given household type or person type, is it growing faster in the urban areas or in the suburban areas? So we're going to be using data from the census and ACS tables, looking by census tract. We're going to define the urban area of a CBSA by looking at the set of, set of tracts that are the closest to the CBD but account for 5% of the population of the CBD, right? So we look out um, and once we've accounted for 5% of the, um, the CBSA population, right, that's where we draw our, um, draw our circle of what's, what's urban or not, okay? So here we see looking just at the aggregate population generally, right? And what you see here is you, we're focusing on the 100 largest CBSAs and we're looking decile by decile. All right, so we're looking here, when you see all of the green, what you're seeing is you're seeing that the suburban population is growing, has been growing faster for, from 1970 to 2010, right, in pretty much all, um, in all CBSAs in all deciles, right? Those few blue, blue bars indicate a few CBSAs where you had faster urban growth. Right? So the nation as a whole has been and continues to suburbanise, not surprisingly. When we hone in and think about the changing composition right, of urban areas, we, we're thinking about the increase in the college educated downtown. And here, what you see is you see there was some indication right, that the college educated um, households were urbanizing, right, perhaps in the 70s a little bit in some CBSAs, in the 80s and maybe in the 90s a little in larger CBSAs, but it really took off as a big trend in the 2000s 
and particularly in these larger CBSAs, right? So here we have nine of the largest 10 CBSAs. We see that the college educated population is growing faster in urban areas than it is in suburban areas. And finally, we hone in, it's not just a recent phenomenon, but it's a phenomenon that's really focused um, and happening with younger cohorts. Okay, so here we have 18 to 24 year olds. Where we really see it is in this 25 to 34 year old and perhaps this 35 to 44 year olds in the larger CBSAs. It's not happening, you might have heard some anecdotal evidence of the urbanization right, of the baby boomers. This isn't a baby boomer story, right? This is a millennial story as opposed to a baby boomer story. So what we're going to be trying to look at is why are the younger and college educated moving downtown? So this is the fact that we're going to try to nail. Okay, so I um, uh, said that we looked briefly at Philadelphia. So how um, are these college educated um, uh, households, where are they moving? Where are the changes occurring? Here you see Philadelphia and what we have is we have a, um, a blue represents that you have a large share of college educated, um, young college educated individuals in a given tract. Red indicates that you have a low share. Okay, so this is Philadelphia in 2000, tract by tract. Um, uh, what you see is you see this, um, uh, this black circle tells us what's our 5% sort of downtown or urban definition. What you see is you see that Philadelphia looked a lot like a donut, right? So you had a lot of uh, um, young and college educated individuals um, clustered in Center City. Um, and then you had a decent number of them kind of in the suburban areas, right? When we go move from 2000 to 2010, what we see is we see that these young, this young college educated <coughs> clustering in the CBD is kind of moving out a bit, right? They're munching around on the edges of the donut hole, right? And uh, these are areas around Santa City are those areas that, that are gentrifying or seeing increases in their, um, or changes in their composition of households. Okay, so uh, this is, I've told you a lot of qualitative facts. Now quickly just to prove that this is quantitatively relevant as well. For example, we have uh, that the 25 to 34 um, year old college educated group grew for, by 44% downtown relative to 14% in the suburbs in the 50 largest CBSAs. Right, so um, these differences um, uh, in the changes between the college and the non-college um, are large quantitatively as well as qualitatively. Okay, so just briefly, we wanted to think about first off some of these explanations that we've heard about already, um, which relate to job location. Right, and the way that we thought of, that we thought about approaching this question was thinking about well, uh, where do people live and where do people work? Right? So these matrices show you the change in uh, the population share, where we're looking at the population share right, that is uh, living a given distance from the CBD and working a given distance from the CBD. So along the diagonal, what you're looking at is you're looking at what's the change in the population share that's living and working a similar distance from the CBD. Below the diagonal in this area here, you're looking at the change in the population that are living further from the CBD than they work, right? So they're commuting in. And above the diagonal, we're seeing an increase or, um, in reverse commuting. So the share of households that are living further from, living closer to the CBD and working further from the CBD. And uh, so what we see is we see on the whole, um, uh, workplaces are suburbanizing and particular um, residences, um, residences are suburb, sub, suburbanizing, right? So we're seeing an increase of longer commutes on the whole for all workers in all CBSAs. If we focus in on high income workers in the largest CPA, CBSA, so we're thinking high income here as our proxy for our college educated, higher skilled workers. What's interesting is you see above the diagonal, these, uh, um, these cells start to light up in red, right? Which is indicating to us that we're seeing higher increases or we're seeing increases in reverse commuting. There are large increases in the number of households that are living within a one mile from the CBD, but they're working one, two, four, eight, 16, et cetera, miles from the CBD. So here we're thinking about these reverse commuters living in San Francisco and commuting out to Silicon Valley, right? So it's not necessarily that I don't like commuting, right? It's I really want to live downtown, and I'm, in order to live downtown, I'm willing to give up my commuting time, is what we're saying there. So why do these households or these reverse commuters want to live downtown, right? So to think about this, we're going to think about 
um, why do these um, do different households want to live in any location? Right? So we're going to look at a residential location choice model where households are trading off when they're deciding where to live, um, the amenities available to those in, um, to them in those locations, the proximity to jobs in those locations. So you might think that I want to be close to jobs because I'm now in a dual um, earner household. Right, so I want to make sure that my partner is also close to their, um, their workplace or I'm nervous about the fact that I might lose my job and I want to have a job opportunity nearby. And then they're also trading off house prices as well. We make this model pretty flexible to allow these features of the environment changing over time to impact um, why my um, taste for locations might change over time, as well as uh, households of different um, types, their preferences to change over time. Okay, so I'm going to skip over the math. Um, just briefly, we're going to be looking at house price indexes um, from Zillow. We're going to have these jobs location variables for, th for three different wage groups. So we're thinking about the proximity to low, middle and higher income um, jobs. And then we're going to have different types of amenities, a range of different types of consumption amenities. So here we're thinking about the proximity to restaurants, apparel stores, food stores, etc. And we're also going to have uh, be thinking about um, controls, not in these results, but in the paper, controls for school quality, um, a proximity to high quality schools, and uh, the crime in uh, the vicinity of a neighbourhood. Okay, so the parameter estimates, I'm just going <laughs> to briefly just say that in terms of interpreting, interpreting the coefficients, right, we're seeing that preferences are diverging and um, are diverging in ways that we expect. The young um, and the college educated are more attracted to the amenities to job opportunities and less sensitive to high house prices, and increasingly so. Right? And we also see differences that make sense um, across age groups. So now our goal is to figure out, well, can this model of location choice predict um, the movement downtown of the young and college educated, <laughs> and which variables, which factors in the model are actually buying us this fit? So hopefully you'll trust me that we get a good fit. And so let's get forward to think about which, thinking about which factors are really buying us the fit. Okay, so in order for a factor to um, be driving the young college educated downtown, well, what we need is that we need, first of all, that the, for example, the college educated like that factor or that characteristic, and that that characteristic is increasing in downtowns relative to the suburbs. Right. All we need are um, the college educated to increasingly like a, like a characteristic and for that characteristic to always be larger downtown versus the suburbs. Okay, when we start thinking about what can we, how do we explain the urbanisation of the college versus non-college, we we're thinking about relative tastes. And then when we start thinking about can we predict the urbanisation of the college versus the non-college more in large cities versus small, we have even more stringent requirements on these variables where we need a relatively larger urban-suburban differential for these variables um, in large versus small cities. So uh, um, uh, just to give you a, a colour map for what our results are, um, uh, here what we're seeing is we're seeing at the top the, those variables that seem to be pushing in the right direction, that are driving the young and college-educated downtown. The, um, the variables where you see them in levels, what that means is that means that it's actually a change in preferences, right, for theatres, for bars, for restaurants, for certain types of food stores that is driving on um, the young college educated downtown. Um, uh, okay, so summary of the results. Um, the, let me just skip forward to conclu the conclusion. The bottom line is that we find that changes in preferences seem to matter more than the changes in the environment, and it's particularly preference for, preferences for amenities, not something to do with um, locations of jobs or um, house prices. And uh, sort of future work we're trying to get at sort of what explains this. Is it the composition, the types of amenities are changing um, downtown perhaps, or is it perhaps that the incomes are increasing of the young college educated? Right, so as you have uh, um, uh, um, returns to skill increasing over time, the, your college educated have higher disposable incomes, more to spend, they're moving downtown. Why we think this is particularly important right, is that you're going to have businesses springing up in downtowns that cater to the tastes of the young and college educated, right, that don't cater to the tastes of uh, um, uh, your sort of incumbent households, sort of building on sort of some of those potential negative impacts of gentrification um, uh, where the benefits aren't equally shared. So thank you very much, sorry, for going over.
So good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to see if I can do mine now in 12 minutes. This is not easy. So, um, but um, so I appreciate uh, all these my my uh, fellow panelists trying to squeeze in very complicated, rich papers into 12 minutes. So you should all read the papers, and, <laughs> and um, there's a lot more there. So, so I am um, very happy to be here this morning to talk about some research on one possible cause of urban revival or gentrification um, that, that's come up a little bit, and, and that's um, the reduction in crime, in particular violent crime, which I think is the kind of crime that's most salient. Um, this is co-authored work with Karen Horn and Davin Reed, who's in the audience, and he's going to answer all the hard questions. <laughs> so we are, um, we really wanted to focus, as Lena said, we want to, we, we're going to focus on the the choices that um, sort of gentrifier, that high-income college-educated households uh, make to move into to um, central city neighborhoods, and uh, and, and because the other research shows that those are really the decisions that are the drivers of, of gentrification or neighborhood change. In order to do so, we need data on um, that has rich data about individual household characteristics and also the neighborhoods where those, identifies the neighborhoods where those households move. So we need internal census data. We were lucky to, to work at the New York City, uh, the New York um, Census Research Data Center. That means also that uh, they're very careful about the data. We aren't able to show you too many numbers today. As Lena said, not everything has been disclosed yet. Um, there. Um, so just to give a little bit of motivation, so I think you all know we've seen really dramatic reductions in violent crime in, in U.S. cities over the last uh, 20 years, between 1990 and 2010. We saw declines of over 25% uh, of violent crime, of over like th a third really in in, uh, in homicides, and those are actually significantly larger if, if, I, if I just showed you the, the reductions in the large cities. Okay. At the same time that this was happening, between 1990 and 2010, we saw that a greater proportion of high-income households, white households, and college-educated households, when they chose to move, were choosing to move into central cities rather than suburbs. Similarly, they were choosing to move into low-income neighborhoods in those, in those central cities. And I will say that's a little bit of a distinction with, with our paper relative to the other papers on the panel. We're going to focus a little bit more on the uh, moves into low-income central city neighborhoods. Um, and our key interest in really is sort of trying to find out whether these phenomena are related. Was the reduction in crime related to the, the moves, uh, the greater um, movement into uh, uh, central city and low-income central city neighborhoods? And so as crime falls, are gentrifier households more likely to choose um, to move when they move into central city neighborhoods and to low-income central city neighborhoods? We are um, defining gentrifier households as high-income households, as college-educated households, and as white households. Those are really three different ways that we operationalize this, this vague, this uh, sort of abstract term, gentrifier households. Um, and are real, what we're really interested in, whether or not their decisions, the decisions of these gentrifier households are more sensitive to crime than, than other households, um, which can lead then to a, to a change in the mix of households that are choosing to move into cities and they're choosing to move into uh, to low income. Um, central city neighborhoods? And the answer is yes, just in case I don't get through. Um, but I'm gonna give, that's a brief story, but let me give you a slightly longer story. I'm going to try using my New York voice. Um, we have household data from 1990, 2000, and 2010, as I said. Um, we focus on households that moved in the last year, and we, we have lots of information, data about those, uh, information about those households, and importantly, we know the census tract into which they chose to move. Okay? Our sample is over 4 million mover households in 244 um, metropolitan areas. Um, again, we define gentrifier households in these three different ways. A high income, which is an income higher than this, the metro area median. College educated, white. Um, we, we focus on, um, we study uh, two types of moves by those households. Um, first, moves into the central city, which is we define as moves into the, the largest principal city in the, in the metropolitan area. And secondly, moves into central city low-income neighborhoods, which are moves into central city census tracts that are the incomes below the, the, the um, median income of the, of the metropolitan area. So essentially, we have six different moves that we're, we're modeling. Um, 
and and um, we get data on we have data on violent crime in the of the largest principal city in that um, metropolitan area, and we lag that several years before the move occurs, a couple years, in order to um, rule out reverse causality. Um, we have lots of other data on those central city neighborhoods, lots of other data on those metropolitan areas that, that we control for. Um, and, and so our first um, question is really our first set of analyses um, study whether or not, look at whether or not mover households are more likely to choose central city neighborhoods. Um, um, when violent crime in that city was um, lower over the past three years, okay? We, we, we include metropolitan area um, and uh, year fixed effects we're looking over time. And so essentially what this means is we're modeling, we're looking really within a metropolitan area to see whether as crime falls in the central city of that metropolitan area, are more households choosing to move into um, that that city um, and our and we separately look for three pairs of, of household types so we're looking at those changes for how sensitive those uh, moves into the central city are for high income versus low income households college educated versus not college educated and white versus non white what do we find we find that high income consistent with the other papers high income college educated um, households are more likely to choose central city neighborhoods when crime city crime was um, was lower in those over the last over the last three years. We um, see very little sensitivity to crime um, among the low income households and the, uh, and the households without college degrees. And we don't see um, we don't see much action for that sort of third type of gentrifier households, the white households. Um, the, in terms of the magnitudes, we think they're fairly sensible, um, but but significant. That a 26% a decline in um, central city crime from 1990 to 2010, which is about the average in our in our sample, lead, uh, is associated with a one percentage point um, increase in the share of of movers in that metropolitan area who are um, a share of high income movers in that central in that metropolitan area that are choosing a central city location a 43% decline in crime which is the average of the largest metropolitan areas is associated with a 1.6 percentage point increase in the share of high income movers that are choosing to move into a central city which amounts to say about half of the overall um, uh, shift that we actually see over this time period so the results are robust to lots of alternative models and specifications, which we can't tell you, we can't show you the results of, we haven't, um, but, um, but let me just point out one in particular underscore this sort of when we, when we hone in on the 100 largest metropolitan areas, which is again where all of these patterns were kind of where the crime declines were the largest, we see that um, the crime coefficients are, are larger and in fact in that case we actually find that the crime coefficient becomes negative and significant for white households as well, um, though um, not more, still not more negative for non-white households. So our second in, um, research question of interest is, is to explore not only whether we sort of learned, we, we see that falling crime is associated with more high income or more gentrifier households moving into central cities, but what we're really interested in is which neighborhoods are they choosing within those central cities? And in particular, are they just going into the high income neighborhoods in those central cities, or are they also moving into low income neighborhoods in those central cities? And we, we run a, an estimated multinomial logit. I, I'm not gonna go into the details, but but, but the, our key is that we're, again, testing if the associations between crime and these choosing to move into low-income central city neighborhoods and, and high-income central city neighborhoods are different for high-income versus low-income, college versus non-college, and white versus non-white households. What do we find? We find that high-income and college-educated households are both more likely to move into both low-income central city neighborhoods and high-income central city neighborhoods when crime in that city falls. Um, and their choices are substantively and significantly more sensitive to, to um, cent reductions in central city crime um, as compared to households with lower incomes and less education. There little e we find little evidence that the um, choices of white households are more sensitive to crime than non-white households. I mean, the choices are, of white households are sensitive to crime, but, but not don't appear to be more so. There. And then our final model is we actually um, we, 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 uh, hone in on one large metropolitan area in 2010, and, and we look at whether the, um, the moves uh, into, we, we uh, test whether the moves into specific neighborhoods in that uh, metropolitan area are, are sensitive to, to um, crime rate, in particular whether as the, as the homicide rate falls in a particular neighborhood, 
in an urban neighborhood, are households more likely to move there than, than other neighborhoods? And, and, um, and the answer is yes, households are, not surprisingly, perhaps households of, uh, are more likely, of all types, are more likely to choose to move into a neighborhood when the um, violent crime there and the homicide rate there is lower. And, um, but importantly, high-income, college-educated, and white households are two to three times more sensitive to uh, reductions in violent crime than, um, than, than other households. Um, so in brief, then, we find, and we find evidence of a link between um, lower crime and an increase in the probability that high-income and college-educated households, are, um, when they move, will choose to move to central city uh, neighborhoods and to low-income central city neighborhoods in particular. We find that these evidence, these um, associations are stronger for um, high-income households and, and for college-educated households than for, than for other households. We find weaker differences, um, weaker evidence of, of racial differences in sensitivity to crime. And, um, but, but all of this adds up. We think that falling crime could be, could be one explanation. Not, we're not claiming that it is the only explanation, um, but we are claiming we, we are um, asserting that it is, it is likely a um, contributor to the change in the, the, the composition of movers that we're seeing um, choosing, uh, choosing cities. And, and we are in the midst of further work to bolster the case that, um, that these relationships are causal, that the, the reductions in crime have actually caused these shifts. So thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Jeff Flint. Um, I, uh, I want to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to discuss um, these four papers and to thank the um, presenters also for, I think, really focusing our attention on the causes of gentrification um, and uh, I think making some significant advances um, in what we understand. Um, so we've just seen a lot of evidence that gentrification in U.S. downtowns has strengthened um, and expanded to more cities and more neighborhoods, especially since 2000. Um, and so that's one reason why there's been renewed interest from researchers, um, from policymakers and the public at, at large in the causes and consequences of gentrification. Um, so I think um, there's many salient questions um, that people have, uh, including who benefits and who loses from rapid neighborhood change? What are the likely consequences of policy responses intending to slow gentrification or mitigate um, what negative consequences might accompany gentrification? And um, are recent changes in the structure of U.S. cities likely to revert, persist, uh, or expand even further until we see a complete inversion of the dominant 20th century pattern of poor central cities and uh, rich suburbs? So one reason to care about the causes of gentrification uh, might be that such an understanding can help us to um, answer some of these questions. Uh, so, for example, um, the relative importance of supply factors or demand factors in explaining recent gentrification may help us to understand the likely consequences of policy responses to gentrification. So, for example, if supply factors related to housing or amenities are more important, then policies restricting such supplies um, may uh, have their intended effects. Uh, but if demand factors are relatively more important, then um, you know, restrictions on supplies might actually uh, perversely uh, amplify uh, some of the negative consequences of gentrification. Uh, understanding the changes in the geography of jobs and changes in the geography of amenities, um, this might, for example, help us to gauge whether or not gentrification is pricing out low-income households from uh, accessible neighborhoods. Uh, and whether the causal factors are more durable, such as investments in housing and infrastructure, or whether they're more ephemeral, like certain kinds of retail agglomerations or temporary policies. Um, these kinds of characteristics of causal factors will help us to um, forecast um, future uh, changes in neighborhoods and cities in the US. So I think this has been hinted at um, in the presentations, but I just wanted to highlight it here, is that a central challenge in identifying causal factors is the possibly or probably important role of endogenous factors in reinforcing uh, neighborhood changes. 
So for example, an influx of new residents of high socioeconomic status may lead to entry of new kinds of retail stores, which may induce new housing developments, which may further uh, cause more new residents to move into a certain neighborhood. And what I want to say here is that if these endogenous responses are relatively weak, um, then I actually I feel pretty confident that we can uh, identify a relatively complete set of causal factors in explaining recent neighborhood change. But if these endogenous responses are very strong, um, I'm a little bit less sanguine about that project. I think that we can make a lot of progress in understanding the proximate causes of recent neighborhood change. For example, the last link or the last few links in this causal chain. Uh, but it may be more difficult to identify small differences in initial causal factors um, that, um, uh, that kicked off uh, this chain of events. Um, and as a corollary to that statement, I think that you know, if these endogenous responses are very strong, then those small initial differences can have a lot of explanatory power. So I want to review some of the findings with an eye, uh, of the papers just presented with an eye towards identifying some open questions and opportunities for um, future research. So we've seen that downtown revival is not necessarily about population growth. The declines in downtown areas have abated, but instead large composition shifts towards prime age college educated households. And we've seen changes in the geography of jobs. So high skilled jobs are no longer declining or even increasing in downtown. Traditional downtowns, while lower skilled jobs or jobs requiring less education, continue to suburbanize. I want to turn to some findings that are in the literature or uh, some findings that I'm about to show you that I think are a little bit less commonly emphasized in um, uh, popular accounts of um, recent neighborhood change. So in the US, downtowns actually used to be uh, of high socioeconomic status or high income and then declined for 100 years or more. And uh, Nate, in his paper, highlighted this fact that, on average, downtowns are still of relatively low socioeconomic status. So I think that's important to emphasize. In addition, the spatial scope of recent gentrification is still pretty limited. So on data that I'm just about to show you, um, we find that for tracks that are three kilometers or more from the centers of cities, um, tracks are actually no better off in a number of dimensions of socioeconomic status in 2010 compared with 1960. And this is consistent with some recent findings uh, by a paper in a paper uh, by Guerreri, Hartley, and Hearst showing strong spatial dependence in um, recent gentrification on historical patterns. I also wanted to flag uh, a, a result that um, uh, Jesse uh, presented, which was that in their analysis of census commuting tables, they find that high-income workers with jobs in the sub suburbs are increasingly moving downtown uh, between 2000 and uh, 2011. And I think that kind of um, reverse commuting is going to circumscribe the explanatory power of purely job-based explanations uh, about recent gentrification. So this figure illustrates uh, some of the findings that I've just discussed. So these are uh, based on uh, consistent track data that I've assembled with uh, Sanku Lee in a related project. So these are tracks from 168 metropolitan areas. To give you the idea of the representativeness of the sample, that's about two thirds of the US population today. And what I've done here is, uh, and the, the, the sort of pattern of this chart should be familiar based on um, the presentations that we've just seen. So on the vertical axis, I've charted a measure of socioeconomic status, which has two inputs, the average household income and uh, the share of uh, adults with a college degree. Um, and I've scaled this so that this uh, index has a range between zero and one. Uh, and it represents a ranking within each city uh, or metropolitan area of, uh, of a neighborhood's um, relative position uh, uh, compared with all other neighborhoods in that city. On the horizontal axis, I have a measure of distance to the city center um, that's flexible depending on how big the metropolitan area is uh, and how dense the city center is. Uh, so this is kind of more similar to um, what uh, Jessie has done in her paper uh, in defining proximity to the city center. Uh, so, uh, you know, quantitatively, this is going to change depending on what measures you use, but I think the general patterns are going to hold. So you see that uh, in 1960, downtowns were of relatively low socioeconomic status. You see increasing downtown socioeconomic status uh, since 1960, but especially since 2000. 
You see the limited extent of the recovery in socioeconomic status uh, for downtown tracks. And so you see um, at about this 9% rate, uh, sorry, I have it. At, this nine, at the 9% ring, which corresponds to about an average of three kilometers from city centers across cities, uh, tracks are no better off in terms of SC, this SES index in 2010 compared with 1960. And you see, also see uh, in a, in a spe separate subsample of about 30 cities in 1880, you see the historical affluence of um, downtown areas. A final uh, feature of the data that I want to highlight is the wide degree of heterogeneity in neighborhood change. So let me just um, uh, use this figure to uh, uh, explain some of that heterogeneity. So what this figure shows are distributions of neighborhood change in the SES index that I just showed you. According to metropolitan area size, the downtown or peripheral status of neighborhoods, and the initial socioeconomic status of neighborhoods in 1960. Okay, So on the left, you see the bottom quartile of neighborhoods in 1960 by the SES index. And those neighborhoods can increase by one quartile, two quartiles, or three quartiles, but they can't, they can't go any worse in terms of relative rankings. And on the right, you see the top quartile of neighborhoods by SES, uh, the SES index in 1960, and those can decline in SES index by one, two, or three quartiles. And each box represents a distribution. So the, the horizontal lines represent the 25th percentile in change, the median change, and the 75th percentile of change. So I want to highlight three things in the graph. So let's look at just the bottom quartile of neighborhoods by SES in 1960. And you see that indeed, big city downtowns, the dark blue box, have had the largest increases in SES since 1960. But you see the median neighborhood actually has increased less than one quartile by this, by this measure. And about 25% of neighborhoods in that category, big city downtowns, have seen no change or worse. The second feature I want to look at is the middle quartile of neighborhoods by SES in 1960. And you see that actually downtowns in blue are faring really no differently from middle SES neighborhoods and peripheral or suburban areas. Uh, over this period. So to me, that suggests something special about the particularly low SES neighborhoods in downtowns compared with middle SES neighborhoods in downtowns and recent gentrification. The final thing I want to flag uh, in this figure is the remarkable persistence of neighborhoods that were already rich or already high SES in 1960. So you see on that on average, those neighborhoods in other places tend to decline some kind of like mean reversion feature. But if you were a high income neighborhood or a, a high SES neighborhood in 1960, you're almost uh, 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 decidedly also a high, high income neighborhood in 2010. Uh, sorry, I, I want to back up a little bit. And the other, the other feature of heterogeneity that I want to highlight is that uh, recent gentrification is not just about big city downtowns, but we see some of this happening in small city downtowns and even in peripheral areas. Okay, so let me just review some of the, um, a few comments on the evidence that we've seen in the session. So I think on balance, I, I would say that the changes in the geography of jobs seem relatively important. And just to highlight the identification problem a little bit, how do we know that jobs just aren't responding to worker movements? And I think that what, what these papers have in common, uh, at least the first three papers that we saw, is the use of these BARTIC instruments. So these are predicted job locations based on initial job locations and national industry-specific employment growth. So this are, these are workhorses in urban and labor economics, standard tool. Um, I think it's useful to think about and to specify what kinds of changes in technology and changes in household demands have centralized high-skilled jobs, i.e., what is the source of the variation that we're getting from these Arctic instruments. So I have two concerns here, one specific and one more general. So one is, I, I'm sort of interested in how much of the, how much of this variation, this identifying variation, is coming from persistent central city institutions like universities, hospitals, other kinds of institutions, where we've seen increasing household demand over time, but have also had a changing role in supplying amenities 
in downtown areas. So I think that's that's a little bit uh, uh, of a concern for me. And a sort of a more general point is that um, this finding is sort of a result of highly correlated research strategies. Um, and it would be nice to have some complementary evidence uh, using um, some alternative identification. Um, a final point I want to make is that uh, the decline in leisure time that Lena highlighted in her paper uh, might make access to uh, consumption amenities as well as jobs um, an additional uh, force for recent gentrification. I'm relatively convinced that changes in the neighborhood choice of gentrifiers is important. Nate left open in his paper whether these sort of shifts due to diverging amenities or tastes. Um, I think the identification in uh, Jesse's paper is uh, quite innovative and quite interesting. Um, I do have some concerns to what extent changes in retail or industry strategies on where to close and open stores might be correlated with um, changes in consumer location. But overall, I think, I think the evidence is fairly convincing. Uh, and I think uh, with Ingrid's paper, you know, I think a lot um, hinges on timing. And one feature that was um, highlighted in Jesse's paper was um, that most of the decline in crime uh, predates um, sort of the most intense period of gentrification that we've seen. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about, I think a reasonable case has been made for the identification of some causal factors, but there's still a lot of heterogeneity to um, account for. Um, I want to discuss a little bit about how can we, how might we expand the scope of the causal factors that we consider. Uh, more uh, sort of broadly, I think that we are still a ways away from a complete accounting of, the, of a broad uh, number of causal factors in explaining recent gentrification. And I think um, you know, some of the counterfactual exercises suggested by Jesse um, are helpful. And to the extent that we can broaden the scopes of the causal factors that we're considering, I think that adds credibility to those kinds of exercises. Um, so let me just say a couple of things, and I know I'm almost out of time, or out of time. <laughs> but uh, I think the wide dispersion of outcomes suggests other factors, and I think there's some features suggested by the data of those other factors. So I think that historical downtown affluence and the persistence of high SES downtowns suggest very durable fix or historical factors at work, like natural amenities, transportation networks, or institutions. The strong spatial dependence suggests extremely local factors. And again, I think the similar outcomes of middle SES neighborhoods and downtowns compared to other neighborhoods suggest factors that are specific to low SES downtown neighborhoods in particular, uh, costs. So I think we should be considering things that are related to access beyond jobs, um, and more, most generally, like a decline in accessibility gaps in downtown locations. Uh, for example, from new technologies or new business practices, telecommuting, flexible scheduling, reducing access disamenities from in downtown areas. I think there's not quite enough attention being paid to big shifts in urban policies towards amenities away from things like public housing and towards vouchers. Um, and more generally, you know, if we come down to changes in taste as a major factor in explaining recent gentrification, uh, I think we have less, as economists, I think we have less to say about where those changes in taste come from. I know that there are other disciplines who think about this more often, uh, but I, I'm still wondering about whether these ch changes in taste are likely to persist beyond the current cohort of gentrifiers. Mm -hmm. Finally, I think that um, some of these urban costs have been changing over time, too, in a way that might be favoring, um, uh, favoring uh, downtown locations. Uh, and I'll just note that there's a, very, there's, there's a suggestive relationship between depopulation um, in downtown neighborhoods in an earlier period and recent uh, gentrification. So I think, to sum up, ch the changing geography of jobs and changing amenity value of um, downtown amenities, the downtown neighborhoods appear to have uh, caused gentrification, but we're far from a complete explanation accounting for the relative contributions of a broad range of factors. And I think we have some partial answers to the motivating questions uh, that I started with. Demand factors seem pretty important. Amenities and jobs both seem to be changing in a way that's reinforcing the inversion of cities. Um, and I'm not uh, 
I'm not yet clear on the durability of the causal factors and um, recent neighborhood change. So, thanks. So we've thrown a lot of information at you, and I, I, I appreciate your patience. So I, I'm actually going to open it up to the audience. We've got, about, got a little, about 10 minutes before we need to break for our next panel. And if there's a question from the audience, we'll be happy to take that. If not, we will go to our panelists and see if they have any response to Jeff's uh, comments. Jeff Hornstein. Hi, thanks. Can you? Yep. Hi, thanks. Jeff Hornstein from... You have to put it, push and hold, push it, hold it. Okay. Is that working? Keep talking. <laughs> Hi, my name is Jeff Hornstein. I'm with the City Controller's Officer in Philadelphia. Really fascinating set of panels, uh, stuff we've been giving a lot of thought to. We read the work of the Fed. Great stuff. Thanks, Teresa and her team. A um, couple things that seem interesting to me that they weren't mentioned at all. Maybe this is because you're economists. Um, no, mention, <laughs> no mention of schools. Um, very interesting patterns here in Philadelphia, especially in the central, uh, sort of what's now called Greater Center, center City, about middle class folks sending their kids to neighborhood public schools and the changes that portends. Um, second, also related to the non-economist question, when you are there surveys that exist or asking people why they move, when they move, why are they moving? There seems to be kind of some possibility to actually get some, if we're assuming that people are making these moves for rational reasons, we should probably listen to why they say they are making those moves. And finally, what about the role of, cent of social networks? Because people who have choices often follow the herd, and the herd now is created in a way that's different than it was created 30 or 40 years ago from social networks. So I'm wondering if you have any response to any of those questions. So, Jesse, I thought I saw a schools indicator in your model. So do you want to start, and then, Lena, you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, so I need to close that. If, if it's not green, I would get There you go. Okay. Um, thanks for, for those comments. We do have um, a, a robustness check. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, school quality um, data for nationwide. So we only have it for about a third of uh, um, the tracks in our sample. So we do, school quality is sort of one of the factors we account for, um, where we're, we're using sort of within CBSA rankings of school districts. Um, so we do have some work there um, that we're sort of developing a bit more. Definitely I, I see schools as being an amenity that when households have more disposable incomes, as I said, the idea that you know, returns to, the, to college are increasing, <laughs> disposable incomes increasing, one amenity that you spend, you can spend that disposable income on is now private schooling, for example. So that's something we're looking um, into more. And then on the social networks question, um, uh, that's tricky to get at. We now sort of it, new data sources, particularly uh, um, looking tracking individuals and and where they're moving around that Victor and I are working with. Um, uh, that's going to provide us with some uh, some ability to think about sort of how people how people use their space more generally, and we can track individuals and sort of see the groupings of individuals and how that you know pretends where people are going to move. So they're sort of great things that we're working on moving forward. Lena, did you have a remark? Um, yes. Uh, so let me just add to that. We're economists, but we also only had 12 minutes. So, uh, <laughs> in our paper, we actually do look at schools, um, and and uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things about it. We the census has whether uh, the child is in public or private school. Um, so there's some interesting findings there. But one thing I would like to emphasize is that. Um, the central city does not have kids. We see more kids now because we see richer kids and they consume more stuff and they are in the parks. But the, the, uh, the fraction, young children, or zero to 18 has been decreasing monotonically through this period. Um, I, uh, and let me just uh, mention about social networks. You know, I think these are, these are things that clearly uh, matter. This is how people learn about neighborhoods and where to live and where they want to live. But we, we, we view those as amplifiers. Is that? Just quickly. Sure. Just one quick thing. I'll mean, just add to that. And sort of earlier work that I've done with, with Kathy O'Regan, um, you know, we did Look, I mean, the households that are sort of the gentrifier households, the high-income households that are choosing to move into low-income city neighborhoods tend to be those without kids, right? They tend to be young. They tend to be millennials. They tend to – and and if you look just sort of um, 
you know, school integration tends to lag behind neighborhood integration. So we have seen much more of an increase in, in integration, racial integration, economic integration in schools, in, in neighborhoods than we have in, than we have in schools. Uh, Lee? Hi, Lee Wong with uh, Council of Solutions. Uh, a lot of the uh, geographic data that you looked at was uh, distance or census tract. Um, a lot of times neighborhoods are defined by things that don't respect those things. Uh, Jeff mentioned school catchment areas, train tracks, um, things like that. How do you account for, for that in separating when one neighborhood starts and when one neighborhood ends? Anyone on the panel? I, I can I can say something I guess so so yeah so kind of the goal uh, that I think all of us had was to try to measure neighborhoods in a consistent way across different metropolitan areas and so kind of the anchor that the natural anchor that comes out is this where the central business district is and kind of just looking uh, at neighborhoods within some radius or some different radii of the central business district I think those specific attributes of neighborhoods can be important in particular uh, instances, but to try to paint a picture that's kind of consistent across lots of metros, it's hard to incorporate that. And kind of the causes that we look at, uh, we're gonna, you know, all of us I think are trying to find ways to piece out variation in those causes that are not correlated with any of these sorts of specific neighborhood attributes. Um, I didn't get a lot of time to talk about the data work that was done, but the, the way that we deal with that is with a lot of data work. Um, so, say for school districts, we've uh, mapped school districts onto tracks, right? So we're respecting those boundaries. With respect to all of our amenity, you know, pretty much any variable we have, amenities or drug proximity, where these are, it's telling you about the, it's a weighted average, it's, it's a density that's weighted by, um, the, the driving time to each of these locations. Um, so it's accounting not just for what's in your track, but it's what's near your track, what's ac accessible from your track. And then we also have access to transit as one of our controls. So we're, 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 it's a lot of data work. Great. So we're gonna take these two last questions and then go here and then back over here. Hi, um, thank you. My question is for Ingrid. I thought um, your paper was really interesting, particularly the conclusion. Um, and I was wondering what you think of it in terms of implications for prior research that suggests that people are really terrible at telling um, whether there's high crime or low crime in the area, um, does that suggest that maybe that's wrong, or is it more that maybe if people are terrible at it and if people were better at it, there would be even more of those? Hmm. Do you want to take one more question? Do you want me to answer? I, I, um, so that's a good question. I mean, one of the I think two things to that. One is that one of the reasons that um, one of the reasons that we focus on sort of city crime rather than specific neighborhood crime is because we think city crime and city violent crime is going to be the most salient. Um, another reason we focus on city crime is because the data is more available, right? But but that's my argument that I actually think people people did know, and I think there's been a lot of attention to the declining crime in in um, major cities. Um, I also think it's one of the reasons that we may be seeing something of a lag in this effect. So yeah, the the, the more dramatic declines in crime and violent crime happened in the in the 90s, but it may have taken a while for those to become salient to people. And Vicky, does, does any of the evidence? suggest the persistence of the preference change. So let's say a 25-year-old moves downtown because of preference changes, but when they hit a natural life cycle change, like having children where they might move back out, are they more likely to stay? Or So how persistent is it over those life cycle changes? Victor's shaking his head, and I'm not sure what he means by that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to take this question in more of a more positive light. Um, so, I mean, what we, what, we, what we see, I mean, what we're seeing is we're seeing, for the first, you know, first thing is that we're not just seeing your 18 to, you know, 25 year olds moving downtown. It's, you know, we see it in the 25 to 34 year olds and the 35 to 44 year olds. So, um, that sort of gives some evidence that this is, a, um, you know, once you know, couples have, have children. We also did, you know, some work thinking about changes in ho household formation rates, um, national trends, and how that might drive um, these, um, these effects. And, and we're not seeing sort of those changes in household form formation rates being, being really important. Um, uh, we think that, you know, it could be a, sort of a shift, something sort of orthogonal to that, um, uh, that that's driving the sort of reorganisation. 
Um, so well, to that extent, we think it's sort of perhaps, um, you know, it's, it, it's not reliant on sort of how those rates will change over time. And the permanence depends on, you know, more, you know, whether the preference changes are permanent or not. And we, and we can't tell, right? There's sort of no way of telling in our data. Lena, did you want to add to that? Um, uh, will there be time to respond to uh, the excellent uh, comments by uh, Jocelyn? <laughs> if you want to add your comment now, I think we, go ahead, you can go ahead and do that. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, and uh, I just wanted to um, sort of this question of will this persist and is Bartik a good instrument? Um, I, I, I failed to, to mention that. I think Bartik is actually, for this time period, is a really good instrument because I view um, the uh, increasing labor supply of skilled workers and the increase in skilled workers uh, as coming out of this IT revolution, which starts in 1970. And I think we, uh, many researchers have pointed to us still being in that revolution. You know, we don't think of the machine tool industry, you know, having ground zero. It has ground zero historically in Manchester, but we don't think of Manchester having a particular hold on, on that industry. But we still think of the IT industry having, uh, you know, the fact that it starts in, in, in Silicon Valley or, you know, it has its home there, that still uh, actually impacts uh, job creation in that industry. So we are still in that transition phase where history matters um, so that places that were strong in, say, IT or in, in skilled industries that grew uh, still um, still are strong in those industries. Now. The, the one thing that I didn't have time to, I think, mention was that, you know, we view this, uh, as I said, these long hours as being part of that. And we can think of, you know, long hours is a way to build skill. Now, they're punishing. And, you know, I, I think the reason we see skilled workers putting in those long hours despite high incomes is because they're very high returns. Now, in future, that may not be the case. In future, high income workers might, uh, you know, be more of the, English gentry type of model where you know, taking a painting is, is, is the in thing. So, but, but at this point in history, I think we, we are at a, at a point where, where um, uh, working long hours is really part of this higher returns to skill. And, you know, I totally agree, this, this may not last. You know, I'm not saying this is going to continue forever. Uh, with that, I think we're going to uh, stop the panel, stop the questions right now. I want to ask you to please join me in thanking our panel and thanking our presentations. We're going to transition to our second panel, so I just ask folks, don't, if you uh, take a step out, please come back shortly. We'll be assembling the next panel quickly. That was excellent. Thank you. It was really good. All of you, thank you so much. Yeah, would turn green. Okay, well, when you said that, exactly. Okay, I will share that. People are very excited Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm teaching intensively in September. September is not so good. Uh, yeah, so but then October and November. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Sure. 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 Sure.
If we can take about two more minutes and then we'll bring everyone back together for the next panel, please. So if everyone could take your seats, we're going to start with the next panel. Please be reminded to use the microphones on your table if you do have a question during the question and answer portion. So could I have everyone please take your seats? Yes, so what we'll do is go ahead and click here. And that's left or when do I start? When, whenever? Are you going to say something else? Uh, no. All right, are we, uh, we're about to get started, so everyone just uh, get your coffee and get, get to your seats. I think we're 10 minutes over already, so uh, so you thought you had 12 minutes, guys? Uh, you only have 10. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but welcome back, everybody. Uh, my name is Derek Hyra. I'm a professor at American University. Uh, I've been studying gentrification um, ethnographically uh, for about a decade, and uh, I've looked at uh, New York City and Washington, D.C., um, and Chicago. And it's a real treat for me to be here at this conference. I don't think I've ever been to a conference where it was solely on gentrification. And I really want to thank uh, the Federal Reserve Board. Um, I worked for one of the bank regulators for a time being, and, and they're pretty risk averse, right? So to take on the charge topic of gentrification in the way that we're doing it today, I, I really uh, commend them and, and all the other co-sponsors uh, as well. So. We have a superb panel, um, just like the one in the morning, uh, which really focus on the causes. We are going to go to the consequences, right? And the consequences tend to be even a more controversial topic. Uh, and the panel, what is great about this panel is that it's going to look at residential displacement, but also, as Eric mentioned, there isn't much research typically on commercial displacement and looking at the small mom and pops that's, you know, basically feel the same uh, property value pressures in neighborhoods that, that go through the gentrification process. So uh, let me just briefly introduce the panel. We'll first have Lance Freeman, uh, who's a professor of planning at Columbia University, followed by Lei Ding, uh, who's a community development um, economic advisor at the Federal Reserve of Philadelphia. Uh, next, we'll have Jeffrey Parker, who's an urban doctoral fellow at the University of Chicago. Uh, and then we'll have Rachel Metzger, Met, I'm going to say it, Melt, Meltzer, uh, yes, I've got to get it right, uh, who's an assistant professor of urban policy uh, at the New School. And our discussant is Saite. Saidi, I, 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 uh, Dinding uh, Flores, and she's an associate professor of sociology at Rutgers. Uh, and so after the presentations and the discussant, we will hopefully have a little bit more time for questions, because I'm sure there are many of you who had questions from the last panel, uh, and I'm sure there's going to be even more after this panel. So Lance, why don't you uh, kick us off? Thanks. Okay, good morning. Um, 
I want to thank uh, Ingrid and Lee Ding for inviting me. I'm really happy to have an opportunity to come here and talk about some research that I've done <laughs> on this topic. Um, broadly speaking, the research I'm going to share with you today looks at the question of uh, displacement, which, as probably most of you know, when you think about gentrification, particularly the negative impacts of gentrification, one quickly comes to think about displacement, and that is specifically neighborhoods that were for formerly relatively poor with affordable housing, they experience an influx of more affluent residents, housing prices go up, and then the, the poor people that were living there previously are displaced or pushed out. Um, so the research I'm going to share with you today tries to look at that question specifically, you know, neighborhoods that start out relatively disadvantaged or poor, um, they experienced gentrification, and then what happened to the individuals that were living there were they displaced. Now, as was alluded to in the introductory marks by Mr. Belsky, um, there has been some research in the United States that tried to answer this specific question. In other words, what happens when neighborhoods gentrify? What happens in terms of the amount of displacement that occurs? Um, as he suggested, the results have been somewhat mixed, or it's, it's been difficult to detect a large spread displacement as a result of gentrification. Um, at the end of my presentation, I'll comment on why some of that might be. Um, but just to give you a sense, um, here are some of the studies that have been done in the United States that look at this question. Uh, some of it by some of the authors here in the audience or on the panel with me. Uh, some research that I've done myself, in other words, where we looked at neighborhoods that have been experiencing gentrification, you don't necessarily see uh, direct displacement. In other words, poor households or non-white households leaving these neighborhoods more quickly than they leave other neighborhoods, right? So that, and that seems somewhat counterintuitive, right? Because when we think about, as I said, when we think about gentrification, what we're expecting to see is low income and poor people being displaced, meaning they have to leave these neighborhoods. But when you look at the empirical evidence, it's much more mixed. Some studies don't find any evidence of it or the impact seems to be small. So this research, I'm going to go um, kind of outside the box or outside the United States anyway. Um, it looks at data somewhere else. I, I was motivated by this. I was working with a graduate student from England, um, and we were using some data that's available there. There are some different contexts um, between the U.S. and England that I thought would be interesting for trying to see why in the U.S. you don't see this relationship. Why, why are we not seeing high rates of displacement when we look at the empirical evidence using data in the U.S.? One possibility we know in the United States, it was mentioned earlier this morning, poor people in the U.S. tend to move um, very frequently. And in general, people in the U.S. move more frequently than in many other advanced industrialized question, um, countries. So, for example, the compared to the United Kingdom to the United States, the residential mobility rate is about twice as high in the United States as it is there. Um, also, those of you who may have followed the research on gentrification, you might know that's actually where the term was initially coined in, in England in the 1960s. And there's probably been more written about gentrification in Europe and United Kingdom specifically than in the United States. Although, interestingly, the methodological approaches, at least until recently, um, have tended to be less empirical. So I thought that was another reason to look at this question outside of the U.S. and see what can we learn about this relationship between gentrification and the direct displacement of low-income households in uh, gentrifying neighborhoods. So to answer that question, and one of the challenges about studying gentrification and particularly what happens to people is that if you're talking about displacement, by definition, the people are no longer there. So some of the usual data sets that we use, like the census data and the like, um, don't necessarily help us. Um, we really need something that allows us to follow the same people over time. So it, ha it so happens that in the UK, they have a data set that's modeled largely on the panel study of income dynamics, which many of you may be familiar with, that follows people over time. Right? So you can see where someone is living from year to year. And if you're willing to jump through a few hoops, they'll even tell you where the person is living, what specific neighborhood are they living in. Um, and so that's what allows you to make a distinction as to whether or not the neighborhood is gentrifying or not. So I use that data set, uh, the British Household Panel Survey. 
I connect it with their decennial census, which occurs in the first year of the decade as opposed to the last decade, year of the decade here in the U.S. So I connect this panel data that allows me to identify what specific neighborhood the person is living in and follow that person over time. So how do I define neighborhoods? Um, they have something called a lower layer super output area, which is a mouthful, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's analogous to our census tracts, although maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, and so that's what I use as my proxy for uh, a neighborhood. Um, you know, you could think of it as a, some, a block group, probably a census block group in terms of size. And uh, how do I identify if gentrification is occurring? So I use a, a, a sort of a class-based definition, and the UK is, you know, the census is much more conscious of class than we are here in the US. So you can actually pick out um, different professions that they identify by class. These are the ones that I use to identify gentrification. Um, basically, it's, it's people working in higher uh, professional, managerial, and administrative occupations, or these would be occupations that require some type of post, what would be the equivalent of post-secondary education here in the U.S., okay? And, and it's, you know, consistent with other definitions that have been used in U.K.-based research on gentrification, okay? So then I needed to identify whether or not the neighborhood was gentrifying or not. So in, in contrast to some of the studies that were presented on the first panel, in this one, I tried to look at neighborhoods that not so much based on their proximity to the central business district, but in based on their socioeconomic status at the beginning of the decade and how that changed over the ensuing decade. In this case, was there an influx of gentrifies, people, people of this higher socioeconomic status? Um, I didn't focus so much on race here because um, the UK, although it's diversifying rapidly, it's still relatively, at least con in contrast to the US, much more racially hom homogenous. And I think the questions of gentrification there are much less bound up in race and much more tied to class. Okay, so. We have, I have my data, I have individuals. I know what neighborhoods they're living in. Um, I know, I have information about the person, you know, how old they are, if they're married, if they're a citizen, uh, do they live in social housing or not, uh, what the conditions of the local housing market are. Um, and I also am able to stratify the analyses for the Lend London metropolitan area and then the rest of the country, because London in, in many ways is a distinctive part of the country. Um, and the estimation approach, I simply use uh, what's called a hazard model, um, borrowing a term from epidemiology where they study how quickly people die. Um, this is not as uh, morbid a study, but it's looking at, you know, how quickly do people move in a given year over time, okay? So, I have, so basically, the, the basic logic, following someone over time, I know what neighborhood they're living in. I look at people living in gentrifying neighborhoods, contrast them to people living in neighborhoods that also started out relatively poor, but they don't gentrify. And then I want to see, well, do the people living in the gentrifying neighborhoods, do they move more quickly than the people living in the other neighborhoods that did not undergo gentrification? So interestingly, someone asked in the previous panel about asking about why people moved. This survey actually does ask people that, but, but the questions don't really get at the types of answers you might expect to associate with gentrification, such as my housing costs increase or something like that. They're more about questions like, well, I moved because I was married or, or to take a new job. So for that reason, I didn't think the, the actual direct question would be that useful in this particular case. Okay, so that's the setup. I'll, I'll jump to the... Um, punchline right away. So these, this chart, the way they're interpreted, I have uh, there are four subgroups here. Um, one, I looked at low-income persons and working-class persons, right? So these are the people that I think are most susceptible or sensitive to displacement, okay? Um, and then I have in the first two, first two sets of columns is for the entire country, the last two sets specifically focus on London, um, and then I have three types of neighborhoods. You know, the first two types, these neighborhoods started decade relatively disadvantaged. This one experienced gentrification. This one in the middle did not. 
and then the last one started out more advantaged. Um, and so the takeaway is that if you look across the country as a whole, you don't really see much difference in terms of the probability of moving from neighborhood type to neighborhood type. Um, you know, it's pretty much roughly around 8% or 7.5%, and it doesn't really differ depending on whether or not the neighborhood is gentrifying or not. If you look specifically at London, you do see some evidence that low-income households are more likely to move if they're in the gentrifying neighborhoods, although the result is not statistically significant, okay? So in a nutshell, across the entire country and focusing on London, looking at low-income persons and working-class persons, we don't see much difference in terms of their probability of moving, which is, is again, counterintuitive, and it's actually consistent with some of the research that we've seen here in the United States that have used a similar approach. <clears throat> so I wanted to try some different ways of measuring this. So I'm just going to share with you a few other um, charts. You can consider these robustness tests or if you like. So the way to interpret this chart across the um, horizontal axis is how long the person has been living in their house. And across the vertical axis is their probability of moving. And the different lines represent people, different types of people living in different types of neighborhoods. Okay, so what we want to see is, you know, if if the gentrifying neighborhoods were pushing out working class individuals more quickly, we would expect to see a higher probability of moving across the chart. Um, these error bars overlap, and the lines are relatively close. Takeaway is that we don't really see much difference and the probability of moving across these different types of individuals living in different types of neighborhoods. Here's another way I looked at this question. So here, the horizontal axis measures the change in the number of gentrifiers. So now I'm looking at the individual's neighborhood and how many people with professional degrees, for example, moved into the neighborhood in the, over the uh, entire decade. So as this number increases, as we move to the right on the x-axis, we can say the neighborhood is experiencing more gentrification. Um, and then the y-axis or the vertical axis is just the probability of moving. And again, these are the error bars. And again, what you see actually is a decline in the probability of moving, both for individuals who were poor and those that are not poor. Um, technically, they don't classify the poor the same way in the UK. I could get into the details during the question and answer, but just for the purpose of illustration, we don't see a higher rate as the number of gentrifiers moving into the neighborhood increases, okay? which again is somewhat counterintuitive to what you might expect. Uh, same thing here. Still, I'm looking at working class versus non-working class individuals as the number of gentrifiers increases in the neighborhood. Again, you do not see an increase in the probability of moving. And this one separates out uh, people who own their homes versus people who do not own their homes. As you might expect, homeowners much less likely to move than renters. But in either case, you don't see an increase in the probability of moving as the number of gentrifiers in the neighborhoods increases, which is what you might expect if you, would, if you see gentrification triggering higher mobility, particularly among renters in a na given neighborhood. And the last set of slides just repeats what I uh, went through, but just focusing specifically on London. This is the one place in the first chart that I showed you where there was a difference between uh, London, um, uh, poor people moving and non-poor people moving, depending on what type of neighborhood they were living in. You see that a little bit here. This gold bar or gold line is for uh, <clears throat> poor people living in disadvantaged neighborhoods that did not go <clears throat> undergo gentrification. And if you compare it to, uh, if you can make it out, this sort of like burgundy line, you can see it is lower, right? So this is the one chart that does seem to suggest that 
poorer people are moving more quickly in London in the neighborhoods that gentrify compared to the other neighborhoods. Um, this repeats the exercise. Instead of looking at the poor, it's looking at the working class. Here again, if you take consideration the overlapping error bars, there's no distinctive difference between the probability of moving if you're a working class, whether you're living in a gentrifying neighborhood or you live in a neighborhood that did not undergo gentrification. And finally, uh, this, is, this is looking at the change in the number of gentrifiers. Again, we're focusing on London. Again, as the number of gentrifiers increases, you don't see the increase in the probability of moving. And I think this, the last slide does the same for working class. And again, the error bars overlap, so the estimates are not that precise. But the general pattern, again, is not one where you see an increase in the probability of moving as the number of gentrifiers move into the neighborhood, whether or not the person is working class or not working class, right? Okay, so what do, how, do, how do we make sense of that? Again, I think, you know, the results do seem counterintuitive to the way we interpret uh, gentrification and the fear of displacement that is real. Um, well, I think to keep in mind is that in general, low-income households move more frequently. So, and this was even the case in the UK, right? Even though mobility rates are generally lower there, you know, there was a recent uh, book come out, came out by Matthew Desmond that really highlighted the amount of residential instability in low-income neighborhoods. And I think that speaks to a need to concern ourselves with displacement beyond just worrying about displacement due to gentrification. And I think that kind of sometimes gets lost in the, in the sauce, so to speak, right? That the displacement issue is real, but it's not necessarily tightly linked just to gentrification. I think that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, it's also the case that people tend to, <clears throat> in the U.S. At, at least, people tend to move more out of poorer neighborhoods more quickly. Um, but what I think what you see that happens, and I didn't get a chance to go into that for this presentation, the people that are coming into the neighborhood are of higher socioeconomic status. So it seems to be more of a, a process of replacement. There's a lot of churn in these neighborhoods, a lot of turnover. Poor people are moving. Um, all the time due to loss of job or to seek out better opportunities. A neighborhood starts to gentrify. What happens is that the people who start coming in have more money, right? So when you look at the data, you don't really see the elevated rates of mobility or displacement that you would expect when you link gentrification and displacement in that way. Um, and, and there are other ways to think about displacement besides direct displacement. Um, we could talk about that in question and answering, you know, people not being able to move into these neighborhoods or people feeling like they're being pushed out of the neighborhood uh, even if they're not actually physically being displaced. So just to wrap up, you know, the, the relationship between gentrification and displacement based on the research that I shared with you here, it's not that robust, right? There was one set of results that did seem to suggest that that was the case in London, uh, but, you know, it wasn't across the board. And if you combine it with other studies that have been done here in the U.S., you, again, you generally find sort of mixed results. The relationship is not that tightly linked. And I think the, that's for the reasons I just uh, mentioned. And so I think from a policy perspective, we sh shouldn't just ignore displacement, but I think the, some of the negatives issues related to gentrification go beyond just people being directly displaced. And um, the fact that our knowledge of that, I think, gives us an opportunity to think about how we can limit those disruptions and amplify any benefits associated with gentrification. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Li Ding from Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. Uh, it's uh, my great pleasure to discuss our recent work on gentrification and resident financial health. This is joint work with uh, Jacqueline Huang at Princeton University. Uh, I also want to thank my colleague Eileen Yuanzi for her excellent research support. Uh, here's the standard disclaimer. Uh, the views here just uh, the authors 
and do not necessarily represent the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia and the Federal Reserve System. Uh, why we are interested in this topic? Because I think we want to uh, take a broader look uh, of the consequences of gentrification. Uh, we conducted a study last year on gentrification and uh, residential mobility. We realized that uh, most of the concerns about the gentrification, as Lynn just uh, discussed, focuses on those who cannot stay. I think uh, residential business displacement and it is the mostly, uh, most studied topic. Uh, but the financial and economic consequences of gentrification have not received much attention. And uh, for example, I think uh, some questions I think we, answer, we tried to answer in our study was uh, do one of our residents in gentrified neighborhoods face a high risk of moving out? The second question in our uh, previous study was uh, do one of our residents who move out of gentrified neighborhoods have a high risk of ending up in lower income neighborhoods? And the answer to these two questions, the first one is generally no, uh, generally consistent with uh, what uh, Lynn's found and there are some early studies. The answer I think to the second one is uh, yes. Uh, the focus of this study is, uh, um, we ask I think a little bit different question we focus on how does gentrification affect the financial health of residents. Uh, yeah, if we use, in this case, I think we use Cresco as a measure of uh, residents' financial health, uh, we need to uh, make sure, I think, what, kind, what are the mechanisms that gentrification could impact uh, residents' I think, financial health. And, but in fact, I think we know credit scoring models do not use very fine geographical information. So gentrification, there's no direct link between these two. But we know, I think gentrification could affect residential financial health by influencing factors uh, that are used in computing credit scores, like uh, credit history, like access to credit, like credit performance. And also some factors may have a strong association with the credit scores, like uh, resident income, job opportunities, and also I think the, the living cost, and also maybe I think if they are forced to move out, the cost related I think to moving. In terms of the data, uh, this data I think primarily relies on a unique data set, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York Consumer Credit Panel. The CCP data, we use the acronym of CCP, the CP data includes a 5% nationally representative random sample of individuals in the U.S. with a source credit number and a credit report. The CP data follows the same individual over time. It reports the updated geographical uh, census geography identifier, the census track, census block, <laughs> and also I think the credit use, the credit scores for sample members since 1999. So it allows us to track the residential location as well as the financial health or random sample of adult residents over time. Unfortunately, it does not include information on race, ethnicity, and income attainment. Uh, we use, I think, Equifax risk score provided in CCP data as the outcome measure of financial health. Chris score, I think, as you, uh, you, you're familiar, it played a central role in consumers' access to credit, housing, and economic opportunities. Here's our measure of uh, gentrification. Uh, in this study, I think a neighborhood uh, in Philadelphia is considered gentrifying if they meet the following three criteria. The first one is they need to be gentrifiable, right? They need to be considered as low income at the <coughs> beginning of the study period. Their income should be below the citywide median in 2000. At the same time, I think the percent change in medium rent or home value during 2000 to 2013 should be above the city medium as well. And also I think the percent change in college educated residents during that period should also be above the city medium. In short, I think I just want to say we define gentrified neighborhoods as those who saw significant increases in rents and home values as well as uh, growth in the proportion of residents who are college educated during the study period. Uh, in terms of methodology, I just want to say, uh, generally, I think it's uh, descriptive. 
uh, but we do, we did I think use uh, regression models to uh, make a comparison between the improvement in Equifax risk scores between steers in gentrified neighborhoods and steers in non gentrified neighborhoods, and also mowers and uh, steers I think in gentrified neighborhoods. Uh, I may use I think the term less advantaged uh, uh, residents because we care more about these pe these people. And when I say that, that just means uh, you really represent low credit score residents, older residents, uh, long-term residents, or those I think without mortgages. That's our proxy for renters, uh, although I think it's not a perfect measure. Uh, this study focuses on the financial health of steers and movers. So I just want to uh, uh, discuss, I think, selected results, I think, uh, from our uh, mobility study. Uh, in that study, I think we focus on the mobility rates of residents in gentrified neighborhoods in Philadelphia during the 2002 to 2014 period. And this chart shows the predicted annual mobility rates for different subpopulations. Generally, as you can see, uh, we found that the more vulnerable subgroups, those I think with the lower credit score, those with uh, those are a little bit older. Uh, generally no more likely to move compared, I think, to those residents, similar residents, I think, in non gentrified neighborhoods. Uh, but of course, as you can see, those, I think, without mortgages, uh, they are slightly more likely to move. Generally, I would say uh, one of the residents are no more likely to move. Uh, that's, I think, the first finding. Uh, the second finding is uh, for the movers, I think, we care about, I think, the quality of the move and the destination of their move. And whether they move to neighborhoods that are more economically distressed or they move to a neighborhood, I think, with similar or a better, I think, socioeconomic status. And uh, we've generally found that uh, one of our residents, I think, who are unable to stay in the gentrified neighborhood face a high risk of moving to a lower income neighborhood. For example, I think lower score movers in, in gentrified neighborhoods are more likely to move to a lower income neighborhoods. And that's, uh, I think, for comparison, it's about 20% versus, I think, about less than 18% for those, I think, in non gentrified neighborhoods. Similar pattern we can find for uh, long term residents and also for uh, those without mortgages. It's, I think, uh, I, was, I think the, the results from this study uh, with the relation between gentrification and uh, the measure, credit score, I think, as a measure of uh, residents' financial health. Uh, gentrification is found to be positively associated with uh, residents' uh, risk scores in general. Staying in a gentrified neighborhood is associated with an 11.3 point increase in risk scores in three years relative to those, I think, in non gentrified neighborhoods. And also we found that the magnitude of the improvement in risk scores <coughs> is sensitive to the types and the stages of gentrification. Uh, Steers, I think, in neighborhoods with the more advanced stages of gentrification experienced a much higher increase in their risk scores. That's about uh, two times of the average increase. And uh, for those, I think, living in uh, neighborhoods experiencing weak uh, gentrification, I think the magnitude of the change is much smaller. As you can see, only 3.1 point, uh, 3 .1 points in three years, much lower than the average increase of about 11.3 points. And uh, we also found that improvement in risk scores was uh, quite uneven across individuals. This chart has things so the improvement in risk scores in three years for different subpopulations who stay in their neighborhoods. We found that less advantaged uh, stairs all experience positive changes in their risk scores, but the improvement is generally lower for the one of our, for the less advantaged uh, residents than those I think more advantaged uh, counterparts in the same gentrified neighborhoods. For example, that for the low income, for these low score residents, uh, those below uh, 580, they only experienced uh, an improvement of about uh, three points higher than those in non fine neighborhoods. But for those with higher credit scores, those in, for example, in the category of 650 to 749, 
they experienced uh, improvement about uh, 13 point to a point higher than those I think in larger finding holes. Uh, this is consistent with uh, what we would expect since less advantaged uh, residents had to assume additional costs and given their limited, I think, uh, financial cushion, I would say. Uh, we also know, I think, not all residents in gentrified neighborhoods are able to stay. For those, I think, who cannot stay, the improvement in risk scores was uh, also, I think, quite uneven across mowers. Those mowers generally experience a lower improvement in their risk, risk scores than stairs, than those people who can stay. But one of our mowers, I think they experienced an even lower, a much lower, I would say, improvement than those uh, more advantaged uh, counterparts from, I think, gentrified neighborhoods. And for example, the low score mowers, I think they experienced uh, an improvement about seven points lower than stairs. And, but for those high score uh, mowers, I think they could, I think, experience an improvement. Yeah, that's, I think, um, it's uh, consistent with our expectation. And because mowing is uh, quite expensive and could significantly hurt one of our mowers' financial health. Just you consider the mowing cost, the housing searching cost, and uh, if you want to buy a house, you need to put down a significant down payment, and you need to go through additional credit checks and mortgage for mortgage and the rental applications that will also hurt, I think, your uh, financial health. And this would hurt, I think, these uh, less advantaged movers even harder because of the lack of financial cushion, I would say. And also the improvement in risk scores is also associated with the types of uh, destination neighborhoods. And uh, these movers, I think, from gentrified neighborhoods to a lower income neighborhood or neighborhood within the city instead of moving outside of the city, experienced a significant lower improvement in their risk scores relative to stairs. Uh, this demonstrates, I think, the differential effect for mowers who mow due to, I think, affordability issues and those who mow, I think, by choice to maybe, I think, better neighborhoods or better a neighborhood with a higher social security, a social economic status. But uh, we, we need to see that absorbed heterogeneity here that might be associated with their mow may also, I think, impact their financial health as well. Uh, so here's some, I think, uh, takeaways. I would say in our previous study, we found, I think, there was no significant evidence of direct displacement of one of our residents in Philadelphia. Uh, but we did find, I think, there was an unequal pol uh, quality of moves from g neighborhoods, and one of our residents are more likely to move uh, mowers, I think, are more likely to move to a lower income neighborhoods. And in terms of financial health, we found uh, that uh, residents experience, generally experience an improvement in their financial health if they're able to stay. But uh, these less advantaged residents, they gained less in the gentrification process, and they could be hurt even, I think, if they were unable to stay. Uh, I'm out of time. I just want to say, uh, there might be, I think, some, uh, I just discussed, I think, some mechanism that gentrification could impact, I think, financial health, could be positive, could be negative. And in general, we found a, a generally a positive effect, I think, between these two. And there might be still some selection issue, I think, that uh, prevent us from drawing causal, I think, relationship here. Uh, finally, I just want to say thank you. And if you want to learn more about our previous study, it's on the web, and uh, there is a there's, there are some hard copies of the, the report outside of the conference room. Thank you. Okay, 
Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm Jeffrey Parker. I'm from the Department of Sociology at the University of Chicago, and I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different today. I'm going to be talking about um, businesses and commercial gentrification um, using the case of Wicker Park in Chicago. Um, so the motivating question here is, under what circumstances do business owners and managers um, in gentrifying neighborhoods come to either embrace or repudiate the changes that are going on in their neighborhood. Um, I came to this question because I was interested in gentrification. I was reading the literature. And to my surprise, there wasn't a lot about the business owners. There wasn't a lot about the merchants. Um, that, you know, there was a lot about the um, people, um, pe the renters um, or homeowners either being displaced or doing the displacement. There was a lot about the developers sort of pushing this sort of thing, the growth machine ideology. But there wasn't a whole lot about um, the actual stores um, that are in the neighborhood, which are oftentimes the representative, the visual representative of gentrification for folks. So I, um, again, started sort of looking at the literature on you know what causes gentrification, culture, or economics. Um, here you have the hipster handbook, so that's sort of the, the, the hipster is the boogeyman of urban gentrification in a lot of cities um, for explanations based on consumption patterns. Um, and then you have this chart, which I think is going to be the last chart on this slide. I do qualitative research, um, <laughs> representing um, the rent gap hypothesis. Um, and of course, there's a lot of great work that has demonstrated that, of course, it's both things. Um, Sharon Zukin. Um, was one of the first to talk about this, but also Richard Lloyd, Monica Brown Saracino, and Andrew Diener. Um, so I just want to give you a little bit of background on Wicker Park. Um, so Wicker Park is in the northwest, um, northwest of the Central Business District in Chicago. Um, it's bounded by, let's see, does this work? Yeah. Um, so Division Street on the south, um, roughly the river on the east, uh, Western Avenue on the west, and um, Bloomingdale Avenue right around here. Um, as you can see, there's also North Avenue there. Um, there's North Avenue here and Western Avenue there because it used to be the northwest corner of the city. Um, it's been a really important commercial neighborhood for a really long time. It was one of the neighborhoods that didn't burn down during the 1871 fire, so they provided a lot of the um, commercial resources to help rebuild the city. Uh, importantly, it's also been a site of um, first move for a lot of immigrant groups. At the turn of the 20th century, these groups were mostly Polish, Ukrainian, German. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, it was predominantly Puerto Rican, um, Mexican. Um, and then in the 80s um, and 90s, a different group started moving in, which were the artists and musicians. Richard Lloyd talks about this in Neo-Bohemia. Um, and after that happened, the gentrification ramped up. The percentage Latino has gone way down. The percentage white has gone way up. Um, but my research is basically looking at this stretch of Milwaukee Avenue between North Avenue and Division Street. It's the major commercial corridor in the neighborhood. And it's sort of like the most visible representation of gentrification for people in the neighborhood. Um, so um, Wicker Park, um, a Forbes-approved America's Best Hipster Neighborhood. <laughs> Uh, a few years ago, it was named number four after, I think, maybe The Mission and Silver Lake and Williamsburg, maybe. Um, and, you know, if the folks at Forbes say something is hip, then it has to be hip. <laughs> um, so um, my methods, I was um, doing in-depth interviews with business owners and managers, as well as participant observation at focus gatherings in the neighborhood. So I went to festivals. I went to um, municipal meetings. Um, the target population was the merchants along Milwaukee Avenue. I did 29 interviews, and I sampled for range within the population. I'm happy to talk about that in the Q&A if anyone has any questions. Um, so this is my major argument, just to get to it, is um, the circumstances in which merchants come to either embrace or repudiate gentrification emerge as a combination of key characteristics which can differ significantly among businesses and common understandings of a neighborhood which can be shared. In order to understand how businesses respond to neighborhood change, it's crucial to consider both the heterogeneity within the business community and common cultural context in which that heterogeneity may exist. Specifically, business owners and managers support gentrification when they understand it primarily as an alternative to financial instability and repudiate gentrification when they understand it primarily as a disruptor of aesthetic stability. So what I'm going to do for the rest of this presentation is I'm going to talk a little bit about the things um, that the key characteristics are where these folks differ, uh, the heterogeneity. But I want to spend the back end of my presentation talking about um, 
the common cultural context that they all recognized um, because that I think was the most interesting finding and that's what's contributed to my research going forward which I'm going to talk a little bit about at the end. So um, the relevant circumstances for um, that, that people differed on were um, position in the neighborhood which could be in terms of tenure in the neighborhood, how long they had been there. It could also be in terms of geographic location and finally probably most importantly there is perceived customer base. Um, so tenure, um, it's really a story about safety. That Wicker Park, um, when you talk to people who had been there a long time, they, they tell you war stories. Um, lots of stories about herd bullets. Um, I talked to one guy who owned a bar, um, had been in the neighborhood 20 years before, and told me this story about how someone had been shot or stabbed and left in the street over the weekend and nobody got to him until later. He was like pushed into the gutter. And he told this story as a way to talk about how he didn't like the yuppies coming into the neighborhood now, but he liked it better than it was then. He said that like, you know, now he has to worry about dodging strollers. Um, and before he had to worry about bullets going overhead. Um, this is a picture of one of the festivals um, I went to in the neighborhood. Um, I don't know if you can read it, but it says, um, punk rock hairdos, uh, it's for kids that, you know, the parents would go and they would, you know, drink craft beer and listen to a 90s indie band and their kids could go get a free mohawk um, at this booth. Um, so the location matters in terms of um, this stretch of Milwaukee Avenue is about a mile long, but it's really, um, at least in the time that I was studying it, um, two different places. So this upper end right here is where... Um, you know, there are the boutiques, the bars, the cafes, um, and this lower end is where the, um, you know, there's a grocery store, there's a lot of furniture stores that have been there forever, there's a lot of shoe stores, and there are especially um, a lot of empty lots. Um, that's improved a little bit in the last few years as there's been more investment in the neighborhood, but I was, I went to the neighborhood right after the recession and the stuff that was supposed to be developing here had stopped because the money just dried up. Um, so you talk to people who can afford rent up here and they talk about it, it's like, well, why wouldn't anyone want to move to this neighborhood? This neighborhood is amazing. Um, and they generally had an aesthetic that matched the aesthetic of the neighborhood, which was sort of hip and edgy. Um, and we're worried about, um, you know, gentrification happening. These people down here, on the other hand, are selling shoes or selling furniture, don't really care whether they're selling to hipsters or yuppies, um, and just want there to be more foot traffic. So very different commitments based on where in the neighborhood they were. Um, customer base, again, and I'm using these words because these are the words that my informants used. Um, you need to look at people who were appealing to hipsters, people that were appealing to tourists, people that were appealing to yuppies, and people that were appealing to displaced residents. Um, in terms of hipsters, um, the, um, so all these people, what I wanted to talk about is that even though they're appealing to different people, they're all working within the larger cultural context, which is that this is a neighborhood that has a reputation for being hip, and that matters a lot. Um, so for hipsters, um, I'm talking to somebody at a clothing store, says we're getting a camera store over here, and that's kind of a lot of hipsters that are really into that. I think this is kind of more and more of a hipster neighborhood, and I think that's a good thing that businesses are opening around here that will really try to gear towards the aesthetic of the neighborhood. So this is somebody who's the aesthetic of the development really matters. Um, same thing with tourists. There's somebody who talks about how um, you know people come to the neighborhood because they've been told to come to the neighborhood. We have people who stay downtown, and when people ask what neighborhood should I check out, Wicker Park is always on the top of the list. Um, a different person that I talked to referred to the neighborhood as a zoo of cool that you know people come in and sort of voyeuristically um, consume the neighborhood. Um, on the other hand, there are people who feel like um, that hip reputation in the neighborhood is bad for their customers. Um, I just went to the manager of a clothing resale shop and it says, um, people see a store like mine and they think immediately, oh, I'm going to bring my stuff in there and they're going to treat me like crap and they're going to tell me I'm not cool enough and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, it's kind of that whole, like, have you heard this band? Of course not. I, only I know about it thing. Um, and she says later on, um, she wants this neighborhood to be more open to more different types of people, um, not just hipsters. And she says at the end, frankly, they don't have that much, um, that much money. Um, and displaced residents, these are the folks that I was talking about at the lower end. Um, they don't really care who they're selling to. They're 
a lot of their customers are people that used to live in the neighborhood and they come in to the neighborhood from outside. Um, so they refer to the people at the upper end of the um, street as the gentrification people. And they're just interested in the overall economic viability of the neighborhood. They're not really interested in the aesthetic issues. Um, so the big point here is that regardless of personal commitment to hipness, everybody realized it was the dominant reputation of the neighborhood and often the reason they were all getting paid. Uh, this often led to anxiety about the potential decline of the neighborhood's hipness. And this is where I'm moving into my research now, which is all about neighborhood reputation. Um, I'm framing this in terms of Gerald Settle's idea of the defended neighborhood, the defended neighborhood reputation. He says perhaps the most important of these structural elements is the identity of the neighborhood itself. A neighborhood may be known as snobbish, trashy, tough, exclusive, dangerous, mixed, or any number of other things. Um, and I'm just interested in different types of reputation here. So what do reputations look like? I'm going to illustrate this by using somebody created a website um, of basically fake posters for Chicago neighborhoods. I think it's called Slightly Insulting Neighborhood Posters or Slightly Insulting Chicago Neighborhood Posters. So you have hipness in Wicker Park where even the rats wear skinny jeans and drink PBR. Um, there can be a reputation for danger and disorder. Um, Inglewood, which is on the south side, um, on opposite day, it's a welcoming neighborhood with lots of activities for families and no history of having a murder castle. Um, if you've read Devil in the White City, that's where the murder castle was. Um, ethnicity, Beverly, congrats, you're Irish, so is the rest of America. Um, yuppiness, uh, Lincoln Park, watch the yuppies in their natural habitat, or even worse than yuppiness, which is suburbs where the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of your 20s go to die. Um, and this matters because there are potential negative outcomes and potential positive outcomes for this, right? So a couple years ago, um, this company called um, Sketch Factor started to get a lot of really bad press on this is one of them smiling young white people make app for avoiding black neighborhoods, that it was an app where users could basically talk about what neighborhoods to go to and what neighbors to avoid and talk about, oh, this neighborhood is sketchy. And a lot of times people don't necessarily have a good idea of what a neighborhood is sketchy and there's been research that has shown that people without a lot of information basically use race as um, a way to um, figure out sketchiness if they don't actually have the full information. Um, it can also have positive implications, positive um, outcomes, at least economically. Uh, Wicker Park, as I said, best hipster neighborhood. It's been paid off that for a long time, even though the people I talked to in the neighborhood were like, this place isn't cool anymore. It used to be. Um, so my proposed study that I'm working on right now for my dissertation is about the importance of neighborhood reputation, uh, multiple kinds of reputation for hipness, non-hipness, violence, racism, sexuality, and ethnicity, how merchants deliberately manage neighborhood reputations. I'm thinking of merchants largely as sort of, um, you know, managers of reputation, holders of reputation. They have to be concerned about the reputation uh, because that's how they make their money. Um, and I'm interested in the concerns over multiple sets of audiences, old timers, newcomers, and tourists. Uh, so yeah, that, that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I want to apologize, especially to my panelists, for stepping out for a minute. There was something that ended up to be a mini emergency that's being handled right now. So I'm very happy to be back here up here presenting right now and not on the train back home dealing with something. So um, we're OK. Uh, but um, so uh, this, I think my, my paper follows really nicely off of Jeffrey's um, I rely on a lot of data, uh, so the opposite of kind of, of his approach, but I think we're addressing um, similar issues and questions about business and, um, and how it relates to gentrification. So um, small local businesses are really important for neighborhoods, especially in urban mixed-use settings, right? These are places where transactions take place. Uh, they create um, 
uh, livelihood and and means of wealth building for the for the business owners for the people that live there these are places where they can consume goods and services um, and uh, in a lot of places they, these are locations of just social gatherings right they con contribute to the overall cultural identity of the of the community so it's important to understand how they um, behave and what happens to them in the context of neighborhood change in very simple um, terms uh, when um, a, a business is going to make a decision to go into a location or stay there, really dependent on the, the characteristics of the local consumer pool, right, and the cost of opening up or operating in that location. And under gentrification, not surprisingly, probably both of these things change and pretty dramatically. So it's not surprising that businesses are going to respond um, when these conditions change. And these have implications for the business owners, right? So it could be a boon. There could be a shift in the local uh, demographics and maybe the, the buying power in the area that uh, allows the businesses to benefit from that if they can adjust, right, if they, whether it means changing their prices or the goods and services they're providing, this could be a benefit to them. On the other hand, if they can't acclimate, right, to these shifts, um, they could get pushed out and have to, have to leave the area, especially in the face of rising rents. Um, Residents, too, could see benefits from this. Areas could get services that they didn't have before. On the other hand, and there's some evidence to support this, um, if those services come in and they don't necessarily serve those incumbent residents, then it's not clear how much of a benefit they're, they're providing. And I think it also is important just for the overall feel of a neighborhood and a community, the, the street activity and vitality. So if you have businesses leaving and stores are left vacant, that has implications for the feel of an area. Businesses might not come in right away, even in areas that are um, economically, quote, upgrading, but uh, because these are markets in flux. These are often markets that were not really well understood before um, in terms for businesses. So we, we could see um, um, kind of vacant spaces that really leave the streets um, inactive. So what I ask here is whether specifically business and retention and displacement rates differ um, uh, under conditions of gentrification, um, and if so, what the implications are for local services and the commercial stability. So really just trying to understand what's going on. As Jeffrey said, we don't really know a lot about what happens with businesses under gentrification, and so I'm just trying to kind of get the lay of the land a little here. Uh, so what am I going to do? I'm going to focus on small establishments, and literally these are businesses that are less than 70 employees. Uh, this is a scale, and I think it was mentioned before, that we are probably more concerned about, that these are you know, less capitalized businesses that might be more vulnerable to shocks to the local market, um, and specifically businesses that provide services and goods to the local community. right? Um, I'm going to observe establishment retention and displacement rates over time, and I'm going to test, as I said, for differences across gentrifying and non-gentrifying neighborhoods. Uh, and I'm going to focus only on mixed-use neighborhoods. So these are neighborhoods that have both residential and commercial components. Again, trying to understand the interaction between the two, right? What happens to the businesses as the residential community around them is shifting? Uh, and, I, and within that, I'm going to look really within uh, mixed-use properties and non-office commercial properties. So again, I'm not really interested in what happens to like, commercial space as the neighborhood changes. Again, more so businesses that are providing goods and services uh, to the community. And I'm literally looking within buildings and looking at kind of the life cycle of businesses within those buildings. I look at changes over five years to calculate these displacement um, and retention rates. And I look separately at buildings with single establishments and multiple establishments Mostly because, I mean, they're very different physically, but also we can imagine that businesses would have different reasons to locate in those different kinds of locations, um, whether they're among other businesses or not. I'm looking at New York City over a couple of decades. Um, business data comes from the National Establishment Time Series data set, a data set, bunch of property characteristics from New York City administrative data sets, uh, neighborhood characteristics from the census, um, and... Um, and in total, on average, depends on the interval I'm looking at, I'm, I'm working with about 30,000 businesses. It's more or less depending on the interval, but it's a good, good set of businesses, of establishments. 
Um, okay, so this is the first cut, and just to orient you, that's the solid lines on the top, those are retention rates. The very finely dotted lines are displacement rates without replacement. So these are businesses, these are establishments that leave, and business and establishments don't come in right away to replace those spaces. And then the more thickly dotted lines are displacement with replacement. So right away we see a new a new business come in and the big takeaway is right displacement is an exception this is overall the more often than not businesses stay in place um, and this kind of hierarchy stays the same over time um, there's a little dip it, there's there's some dip in retention rates in the late 2000s the opposite happens in the late 90s so there's some variation over time that we want to pay attention to um, but this is so this is just kind of the cut overall right so now to think about how we're going to divide it up over gentrifying and non-gentrifying neighborhoods, it's a define gentrification or identify that first. So I'm going to be um, equating the neighborhood with the census tract, as has been done before. And one reason is because that data is easily accessible at that level. But I think conceptually it makes sense because, especially in New York City, on average, this is a walkable area. Again, trying to get at the idea of, of, of how these businesses change, um, uh, you know, kind of within the context of residential change, and we want the two to be kind of accessible to one another. So I think that happens in the census tract. Um, to gentrify, you kind of you have to be eligible in a sense to gentrify. So those would be the low income tracks, and um, there you, we have the income at the track level. Set it up against the average income for the MSA overall, and that ratio. After we I array it, I, I'm going to take the bottom 40th percentiles of uh, a percentile of of that distribution as low income, and then you're gentrifying if the the essentially the change in the the income over the 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 time period, either the 90s or the 2000s, exceeds the 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 change that's happening um, at, for the MSA overall. Okay, so this is the same chart I showed before, but now stratified by gentrifying and non-gentrifying neighborhoods. The purple is gentrifying, and the green is non-gentrifying, and then the the kind of the um, the the type of line is the same as before. So I, I think the, the general takeaway is there's not a big difference. Now this is overall, right, across all the neighborhoods in the sample. Um, the retention rates in gentrifying neighbors are slightly higher later in the 2000s and slightly lower later in the 1990s. Those are significant differences, but substantively it's small. It's like one or two percentage points in the rates. Um, and then also one of the differences that that comes out is um, the 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 displacement rate without replacement, so leaving with the with the vacant spaces left afterwards is slightly higher in the gentrifying tracks. But again, not substantively big differences. Some other things to point out that are not up here are that um, in gentrifying neighborhoods we tend to see a bigger kind of shift in the types of services. So there's services that are more likely to come in that weren't there before. Um, and we also see more chains coming into the gentrifying neighborhoods, kind of as this counterpoint to the small business frame, we do see an increase in change in the gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, and just to note that the, the businesses that are leaving are not necessarily the older ones. Those often get to stay in place. So this is not a story of longstanding businesses necessarily getting getting pushed out. Okay, so that was across the whole the whole city, um, and uh, rightly so, there's probably a lot of variation happening at finer levels that we're not picking up there. So to try to get a sense of that, I've drilled down to a bunch of neighborhoods in the city, and I'm going to show you a couple here. So first, we're going to travel to East Harlem, which is in the northeast part of Manhattan. Um, it's been, uh, it's a predominantly Latino community, um, moderately transit accessible, and um, it's a poor, it's a poor community, uh, even among, uh, as of 2000, even among like the, the sample of low income tracks I'm looking at, it's, it's on the, the bottom of those. Um, and just under half of them were gentrifying during the, the 2000s, based on my definition. And the other thing to note that during this time, there were dramatic demographic shifts. So not only was income rising relative to the MSA overall, but um, the share of white households went up, college educated um, residents moving into the gentrifying areas, rents going up, um, population surges. So there was a lot of other, of other changes happening at, at that time. 
And so what do we see in terms of the businesses? Here we actually see a, a, a meaningful reduction in retention among businesses in the gentrifying tracks compared to the non-gentrifying ones in this micro neighborhood. Displacement without replacement goes down, but displacement with replacement goes up. So those that are getting moving out, th those spaces are being more are more often being filled. Um, number of chain businesses is going up relatively more in the gentrifying tracks than the non-gentrifying ones. And the largest gains in the types of services really are in kind of personal services, drugstores, laundromats, educational services, and health services. And just to give you a little more concrete example, so drugstores are going up more, Purple's gentrifying tracks, doctor's offices, grocery stores, and even restaurants. So in a neighborhood that's experienced dramatic economic and demographic shifts during this time period, there is seems to be a response in the kinds of services and amenities, both the necessity, like the grocery drug stores, but also the more discretionary ones, the you know, the, the luxury ones like like sit in full service restaurants shown here. Okay, so now Sunset Park. Now this is in Brooklyn. This is in the southwest part of Brooklyn. Uh, again, big Latino and Asian populations there. Um, pretty transit accessible, probably more so even than East Harlem. A little more affluent as of 2000, but fewer tracks were, um, fewer share of track, lower share of tracks were gentrifying during the, the 2000s. This is a neighborhood that uh, probably in general experienced more modest demographic shifts during that time. So poverty rates did go down, but a lower increase in the share of college educated households. Uh, rents didn't go up as starkly. Population growth was a little slower, so, so a bit more modest. Um, but we still see, so there's a loss in business retention, same thing loss, uh, decrease in displacement without replacement, and then among displacement, again, a higher likelihood of, of those moving out getting replaced right away. Um, more chain businesses are going into the gentrifying tracks than the non-gentrifying ones. And the biggest difference here, though, is the types of services that went in there and the businesses that, that opened up in the, in the gentrifying areas. And it was mostly seen in kind of food and entertainment type establishments. Um, and so showing uh, again that here, so like dr drugstores went down even marginally in the gentrifying tracks. Um, doctor's office went up very little. So did grocery stores and the restaurants. So these is the full service sit, kind of sit in restaurants actually went down. So any gain in the food and entertainment establishments was, was in other kinds of, um, other kinds of, uh, of, of establishments or businesses there. So this, this is an example of an area that was gentrifying, you know, based on kind of the definition laid out, did see some, some meaningful, although more modest demographic shifts, but the response in parts of, in, on the, in terms of services and amenities was different, right? And you could say that not only were they not seeing as much of an influx in these necessity services like groceries, but, um, but even in some, some of the, the discretionary ones as well. Okay, so what does this all mean? So I think one of the big things that um, I, I think is probably a theme today in general is that you know, gentrification is on a continuum, both temporally and spatially, right? These are, we have to look at this over probably long periods of time, but also understand the, the granularity spatially. And I think that's important when we research it and also think about how to, how to address it. Um, so what I find here is the norm is really retention and, and often among the many longstanding businesses, uh, displacement is more of an exception, although, and, and it does not seem to be elevated in the typical gentrifying neighborhood, right? But that doesn't mean it's not happening. The drill downs show that there is displacement, it's real for certain areas um, under certain conditions. And um, what that means is we could see, and the data shows it, you know, that we have displacement without replacement, meaning storefronts can sit vacant. And um, while some areas are gaining services, some are not. So I, I think the assumption that this change is going to automatically bring in services is, is probably not um, uh, the right one in all contexts. In there. So great, it's great to be here um, and comment on a great set of papers. Um, 
and there's a lot more in there than they presented and had time to present. So I encourage everyone to look at the papers. Um, most of the popular and scholarly discussion around the consequences of gentrification have revolved around a very simple but politically charged question, which was um, uh, stated very early on by Teresa Singleton in her welcome remarks. Is gentrification good <laughs> or is it bad? Um, and there's a slightly more sophisticated version of this question, and that is for whom and under what circumstances is gentrification good or bad? The simplicity of both of these questions, however, belies just how complex the answers are. So in exploring some of the consequences and issues revolving around gentrification, these, this set of papers consider the varied ways in which gentrification affects people, their lives, their worlds. Two of the papers, uh, Lance Freeman's and Lee Dean's papers, focus on what has been the predominant focus on gentrification, scholarship, residential segregation. The other two papers engage a less are studied, but generally assume aspect of gentrification. Um, uh, Jeffrey Parker's and Rachel Meltzer's paper, the commercial and business aspects of gentrification. So seen together, they underscore how these aspects, residential and commercial, are firmly intertwined in community life. And they also offer uh, a more nuanced account of how gentrification is experienced. So while the desire may be to skim the papers quickly and find a quick answer as to whether gentrification is good or bad, <laughs> the qualifiers they offer here are, in my view, where the story really lies. So um, uh, Lee Ding's uh, uh, paper focuses on credit scores and how they shift in gentrifying neighborhoods in Philadelphia. While um, he finds a positive relationship between gentrification and, and residents' financial well, health, <laughs> weight, the relationship between gentrification and credit score varies significantly across different subpopulations. So the qualifiers are important here. While residents who do not move from gentrifying neighborhoods experience an increase in their credit scores, the increase varies by levels of gentrification. And those who stay in neighborhoods undergoing intense gentrification experience an above average increase double actually, in their credit score, while those in neighborhoods with weaker gentrification experience minimal increases. In movers and out movers in gentrifying neighborhoods have increasingly higher risk scores over time, with in movers have, having um, higher scores on average. And they're careful not to claim causality here. Um, they find that the uh, financial health of less advantaged residents in gentrifying neighborhoods improves if they are able to stay. Again, there's a lot of if here. And these less advantaged residents in gentrifying neighborhoods who are more vulnerable to the financial instability resulting from gentrification generally experience less improvement than other more advantaged residents in gentrifying neighborhoods. So for vulnerable residents who are unable to stay, they experience significantly lower improvements in their uh, risk scores. So um, the qualifiers are the story here. Uh, and because, uh, and Lee, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we still see increases in scores across both gentrifying and non-gentrifying neighborhoods, although the bigger gains are for gentrifying stayers. So my question is really wh whether these scores are uniformly rising across the board just overall. And if so, what do gentrifying neighborhoods offer to boost those scores? And what are the characteristics of non-gentrifying neighborhoods? Are they, um, uh, are they high income too? We, we tend to collapse in the high income and the low income. And so I have questions about that. But beyond these questions, this paper tells us that there are benefits to staving off displacement, displacement in gentrifying areas. Generally, the takeaway could be that gentrification is good. We can run away and go with that. Um, done, simple question answer. But no, they show us instead that the benefits of gentrification are not evenly distributed. Those most vulnerable experience an increase, but those who have to leave do not. So the policy suggestion here is that the benefits of gentrification, if they exist, are for those who are able to stay, 
which enhance the need to build in strategies to keep these most vulnerable in these communities if they want to stay. So maintaining and even increasing affordable housing in these sites of integration is paramount in order to think of gentrification as potentially positive and even uh, and even and evenly and and I don't say that lightly equally is very important here um, beneficial for all um, Lance Freeman's uh, paper uh, tackles the question of displacement head-on looking at England and Wales uh, a place that is less mobile um, to better track the propensity to move uh, they examine whether gentrifying neighborhoods experience significantly elevated rates of direct displacement. The results are um, mixed, uh, only to a degree. Um, in Wales and England, there is no evidence that direct displacement is associated with gentrification. So simple answer, no displacement. But in London, there is evidence that the, uh, of some uh, that the lowest income individuals are being displaced. Um, what becomes clear in this analysis is that it's unclear how best to capture and measure the relationship between gentrification and movement, or that there are many ways to do that and um, with possibly potentially different results. What I find most interesting in this analysis is the discussion of the, towards the end, of the preponderance of anecdotal reports of direct displacement and uh, the present question being how can we reconcile the these studies with first hands accounts of gentrification uh, induced displacement and with the evidence that gentrification stresses low income and the most vulnerable and this is where I see a very important question raised by Lance um, that merits more attention and I love to hear more on this um, uh, on whether is moving necessarily displacement? Um, and I think this has been insinuated already. Um, how do we distinguish between turnover, movement, and displacement and its relationship to a changing neighborhood? Um, so, which lands I think um, already referenced. So these, uh, so he reminds us that, um, that that movement should not be interpreted as meaning that displacement does not occur in gentrifying neighborhoods, the results. They tell us that the findings do not give us a complete picture of the people, places, and processes involved, and that there is a continuing need for more in-depth studies of places to understand how neighborhood change occur occurs in its experience. <clears throat> On the ground, the challenge for those concerned about equitable outcomes, these are his words, in the face of gentrification is to identify the circumstances under which displacement occurs and to take steps to prevent it. Policy-wise, the authors highlight the need to focus on exclusionary displacement or the loss of affordable units in gentrifying uh, neighborhoods and opportunities to, that are provided to stay. Jeffrey Parker does just this that Freeman encourages. He takes us on a qualitative examination of how gentrification is experienced in death. But now, however, he examines the question of the effects of gentrification in the business side. Here, the, chance, the changes to Wicker Park in Chicago are described from the perspective of business owners. And he centers the question, the question of, is gentrification good according to whom? He asks, under what circumstances do business owners and managers come to embrace or repudiate gentrification in their neighborhood. So in this rich account of businesses along a street in Chicago, Parker argues that gentrification is not only an economic endeavor, but an aesthetic and cultural one as well. That how people feel about gentrification is not simply a rational act, but an experiential and a cultural one. So measuring gentrification's benefits and penalties are not simply about dollar signs, even among the most rational actors, businesses in this case. Parker finds that there are differences in attitudes toward gentrification and development based on the position in the neighborhood in, in terms of both length and tenure and who they perceive their customers to be. In highlighting the time space aspects of who gentrification benefits and the business customer relationship, Parker highlights that gentrification is not a fake, a complete, that neighborhoods continue to change and that it is not fully realized for every location of a neighborhood with varying benefits and penalties distributed across space and time. 
So gentrification varies according to uh, different uh, conditions. So we have to think of different scales and locations and relationships to gentrification, and they are uneven, even if wider general patterns suggest a general benefit. One thing I found interesting in um, Jeffrey's paper is that businesses in this area of Chicago, especially the long-term ones, cater to people who had been displaced, um, which challenges the locality of gentrification, that these businesses cater to other consumers and other views uh, of what the neighborhood speaks to the power of perception and ideology in defining place and pushes us to think about the connections of gentrifying neighborhoods to other locales, community places, and how they're tethered um, to other places. Uh, for your paper, Jeffrey, I wanted to hear more about the changing demographics of the neighborhood and how it matches up to the perception. For example, saying that it has always been a cool, cool neighborhood and now needs to move to cater to families, or that it was a crime-ridden and now it's not, or that now you have families and not, and, and not only hipsters, or that now you have strollers and you didn't before. Perhaps you have strollers now, but before there were children. And, and as... Um, uh, 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 so, um, as Lena Edlunds in the earlier panel suggested that um, uh, children are declining in central cities. So whose account is that and what are the facts? And why it matters is that there's a distance between fact and perception um, and how stories or half fictions, half truths are told that present competing accounts of the neighborhood and create ideas of what services and needs um, are uh, for the neighborhood. Uh, for example, in, you have an example of a park that becomes too small, but whose perception was it that there weren't families there um, and that strollers represent children, but not the Latino children that were there. They didn't represent children, right? So, uh, and the perception that now we have children here. Rachel Mulzer's paper examines how the picture of business changes by looking in different time periods and across scales, New York City as a whole, and more focus on three neighborhoods. The results are mixed. She shows gentrification is associated with both business retention and disruption, but retention tends to be higher than displacement rates in both gentrifying and non-gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, Rachel Meltzer's study is rich with findings that help us understand the general patterns around business openings and closures that Jeffrey finds, Jeffrey Parker, and what might be called movement displacement when considering households in the first two papers. As Jeffrey Parker highlights location, Meltzer finds that generally location matters, whether you're in a corner par parcel and uh, uh, building with more street frontage, have a higher likelihood of getting a replacement business after the prior one leaves. Um, uh, and she finds that gentrifying neighborhoods are more likely to bring in new types of services than non-gentrifying and higher income neighborhoods, and they more often bring in cha chains to replace displaced businesses. However, she reminds us that there are still cases where neighborhoods undergoing gentrification lose businesses without the upside of new amenities. And that displace displacement accompanied gentrification but manifested itself in different ways across neighborhoods. Oh my God. So there's a useful dialogue between Rachel and Jeffrey's papers. Don't we have 15 minutes? Um, <laughs> businesses meet different needs, like, uh, and uh, it can be positive as new consumers. B businesses need, meet different needs, um, and demographic changes challenge local businesses. It can be a positive as new consumers come in, or disruptive as new consumers based with new tastes that incumbent businesses may not be able to meet. Uh, and similarly, as Jeffrey puts it, the aesthetic identity interests are negotiated with the economic interests by both business owners and residents. Simply put, in answer to the question, is gentrification, is gentrification good or bad, Rachel's work reminds us that there are threats and opportunities, and it depends who and where you ask. Okay, so I'm gonna, so now I want to summarize quickly, um, uh, highlighting three axes along which the question of the consequences of gentrification circulate in these papers. The first is displacement. Uh, are people, businesses forced out and forced to move? Um, and uh, so I, I propose that we have to question the assumptions of a model of succession that always deems neighborhoods that are increasing in value as uniformly desirable, that we have to 
learn more about what pushes people to move. Um, and we need to uh, uh, examine, uh, open up the, that black box of, of how low people make decisions of moving um, and the desire of what is a good neighborhood, what is considered a good neighborhood by different people and the conditions that promote that um, in gentrifying neighborhoods. So more about the neighborhood and context and that influence different sets of actors in, in moving. Um, and the second uh, way is whether gentrification means progress, generally speaking, whether things are better in a general sense, objectively, um, uh, and how different actors see um, different neighborhoods and whether they see them as subjectively, you know, better or worse, um, especially when gentrification is uneven, where there are different stages um, in what people demand. So that influenced the question of whether it's good or bad. And thirdly, um, uh, for whom, let's ask for whom and what they think about it. So these are all interrelated. And I just want to throw in uh, one thing regarding this, uh, and that is in my research on Brooklyn, um, I've noticed very different accounts of whether the neighborhood is good or better and what um, incites people to move. And some of it is it's, uh, it's contradictory. Um, so I, and it falls along racial lines and there's a timidity to talk about race. Um, and I am curious, and I had questions for each of you individually that I cannot pose, but I'm curious to how if we measure, if we introduce this category, right, in, in, in how it shifts the accounts in each um, case. Uh, because we know that race, the, the, you know, informs life chances dramatically. Um, and, and so how does it shift that? So I'll stop there. And... All right, we went over uh, by, by only five minutes. So how much time do we have? 15 more minutes? Okay. So everybody is very impatient. I see the hands going up. So let's just get uh, right to the, uh, to the questions. So, let's go, John. I think you can hear me. Yeah, yeah good. Um, so you talked about overall not a whole lot of strong evidence of displacement uh, from gentrifying neighborhoods. But the, I think there was something in Lee's paper, actually, I happened to have it on my Amtrak ride up this morning, um, about renters versus owners. Uh, I think it's worse for renters. So if people could just talk a little bit about that, because you see, you know, I'm from Washington, D.C., and every once in a while there's an article in a newspaper about a slumlord going in and, you know, evicting people, and then it's a luxury condominium. So we know it happens, you know, even if it can't be measured by census data in a rigorous way. Um, and then also for people who stay, um, have a, any of you done um, analysis of housing cost burdens, you know, percent of income spent on housing for both owners and renters in gentrifying, particularly for, for low and moderate income people in gentrifying neighborhoods? Uh, there was a study I wrote. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there was a study I wrote. Um, I guess it's kind of dated now, but at the time it did show that uh, poor individuals paid a much, had a much higher rent burden if they lived in a gentrifying neighborhood. Um, their rent burdens were high to begin with, uh, probably roughly, I think, um, 50%, but in gentrifying neighborhoods, they were like 60%. So um, that was based on data from New York City in the 1990s. I'm not sure how pervasive that is, uh, but it's consistent with what you would expect, right? But people who stay in the neighborhood as housing prices are going up, end up paying more for rent. Uh, yeah, you mentioned, I think, our study on uh, mobility. Uh, yeah, we did find, I think, those uh, residents without mortgages, uh, they are slightly more likely to move out. Uh, but I think we are a little bit cautious about drawing that kind of conclusion about renters because uh, uh, it's a proxy. It's uh, imperfect, so there might even be a mix of renters and also those people who already paid off their mortgages. So that's, I think, why we uh, are a little bit cautious about that uh, conclusion. Uh, in terms of the renter the affordability one, I think it's consistent with our results on credit scores, I would say, because we found that uh, 
for these I think less advantage the residents if they stay they are improvement in their risk score I think credit score is uh, much lower I would say if I think they face some affordability issue because of the increase in rent and other costs I think that costs I think uh, some, some some burden for them I'll just say something in reference to the ownership renter status I mean on the business side of things I don't I don't have evidence for this but a hypothesis that I think a lot of businesses that can stay in place uh, not a lot but a good share I mean might often own the building that they're in so um, and that would be a great thing you could right find because that's it's very hard to get you know kind of data points on that and figure out who owns the building and the businesses in there but I think that's an interesting you know question to ask um, uh, so I, I, I mean that there's lots of implications for that. So if they opt out of the neighborhood, you know, they're not only selling the property and their business. I mean, there's been talk about in terms of policy solutions, you know, is one approach to help businesses purchase the space they're in or purchase a building, right? Or can the city purchase a building and then lease it, right, at kind of affordable rates to businesses? So I think the ownership renter dichotomy has implications for, for the businesses too. Yeah, I just wanted to mention one thing in terms of methodology that, you know, Lance and his studies and Ingrid's studies and Kathy, I mean, they're looking at mobility, right? And um, it is not looking at displacement per se. It is looking at what are the rates of people moving or businesses moving out of a gentrified area versus a non-gentrifying area. But what are the, so they're moving at the same rates, but what are those reasons? We don't have the methodology of the studies to tell us that. So Josh, your question, you, you know, anecdotal that people are getting displaced. Um, yes, that, that's happening. We know landlords are forcing people out in these gentrified areas. We have tons of case studies on that. Um, and it's just, we, we don't know in the other non-gentrified area why people are moving. It might be for different reasons, right? So that's, it's important. We are looking at mobility, not necessarily displacements in all these studies. Uh, Jeff, I think you had the, the next question. of gentrification is kind of driving these results to some extent, particularly the idea of a binary definition where you're either gentrifying or not. I mean, I would imagine that, that neighborhoods on either side of that artificial line would be more or less the same, right? But by including half of them in your gentrification result, you, you may be obscuring what's happening at the extremes of the gentrification continuum. So I'm just interested in the extent to which you all have looked at sort of alternative specifications that, that looked at the greater intensity of income changes and looked at the extent to which there might be some evidence of displacement there. I have, and I'll say it doesn't change the overall. So, because that was kind of my thought when from the drill downs that a lot of this was happening in these places like East Harlem, right, that had these really dramatic on the economic spectrum, but also in these other these other dimensions um but I, I looking overall again kind of for some kind of average effect that it wasn't again it, it wasn't shifting the big takeaway um in terms of like when i find not huge differences between gentrifying and non-gentrifying in terms of the displacement retention um if you div divide it up into kind of ends of the spectrum or anything you're not um i wasn't finding anything substantively different uh, yeah, I just want to add, I think my co-author is also here, Jackie, I think she in fact developed uh, maybe a dozen of different gentrification measures for us, and uh, we tried all of them, and generally I think if we just use the binary one, generally it's uh, generally consistent, uh, but I think if we, as I think I discussed I think, in the presentation, if we use the categorical one, uh, we, I think, classify them into different stages, different uh, in, uh, intensity, then we did find some, some, some differences, yeah. Uh, I just want to add one thing more about the rhetoric of gentrification, which is I think that you see a lot in both um, talking to people just on the street, but also in the academic literature, that people treat gentrification more like an event than a process. And what this allows you to do is, um, rhetorically, is to say, okay, well, gentrification hadn't happened here, but it's happened here. And it's almost always, when talking to somebody, when I came in, it wasn't gentrified. <laughs> and now the other people, so like, I mean, you know, if you, I feel like, you know, every party I went to during my 20s, the main topic of conversation was like, 
this neighborhood was great when it was me and my friends gentrifying it, but now that there are other people gentrifying it, the neighborhood's gotten ruined. And I think that it would be really good for us to all think about gentrification as a process that goes on across a great distance of time, not just that, you know, like Starbucks moved in and that's when gentrification happens. Lance, do you want to comment or do you want to get other questions? Thank you. I think um, the definition of displacement, perhaps um, another way of looking at it is what are the barriers of entry for the res types of residents and types of businesses who left? Because it, what I'm hearing, it seems like, is that there's not a great change in who's moving across all kinds of neighborhoods or the rate at which it's happening. The difference is, are similar people able to move in? And one other quick piece. Um, I appreciate Lance. Oh, yeah, we're no, just speak up. I, I was going to say, I appreciate that's my first studies of gentrification when I, was, when I was studying in London in the late 70s and looking at the first range of that. And I'm wondering about the impact of global cities versus smaller places. You know, if we look at here, New York being and San Francisco being so different from, you know, other smaller cities where it's happening on a much smaller scale and maybe not the same levels of impact. Uh, so, uh, so the question specifically about the global cities is your question? Yeah. So Second half, yeah. Right, so that, that was part of the reason why I did do this separate analysis from London, and, and that was one place where it did seem like you did see some evidence of people moving more quickly. Um, it wasn't, you know, I, I'm not sure how reliable it was. It was the only result. So, you know, so, and um, I think here in the U.S., you know, it's been studies that have looked at New York as well in, um, in comparison to other places. So I think definitely the, the pressures of gentrification are greater in the global cities. Um, and to get to your first question, I think, you know, what is happening, it is difficult for people for low income and poor people to move into some of these neighborhoods if they were not already living there because right. they can't afford to live there. And I think it raises the question to what extent would they want to continue to move into those neighborhoods? You know, I think the some of the presentations in the first panel this morning talked about different tastes. I know when I was doing more qualitative research in New York, I think, you know, a lot for a lot of people, the high housing prices in a place like New York um, don't necessarily seem worth it if, unless you have the type of employment opportunities that would justify it. And I think a lot of people see places like, you know, Atlanta or Charlotte. Um, you know, I grew up in New York anyway, and thinking about my, my cohort, they saw uh, other places as places of opportunity and the housing costs in New York is just totally unjustified and not worth it. And so that would be an interesting question, you know, because in order for people to continue to be moving in, you have to have a pool of people who want to see, move in and see that as a place of opportunity for them. And you know, I think we need to do more research on that question. Did you want to jump, you want to jump in? No. Okay. Well, I've been told that is the last uh, question, so I apologize for a short discussion. But uh, I think we should all thank our panelists for some really good presentations. <laughs> and next up, we have lunch, and then Kathy O'Regan is going to be our keynote, so looking forward to that. So everyone, before we break for lunch, lunch is set up on the credenzas outside. There should be one on your left and one on your right, so feel free to go to either credenza. We'll return around 105 and begin with our keynote speaker. Thank you. I'm good, I'm good. Oh, oh my gosh, it's, a, it's definitely good. Yeah, take one for me. Uh, <laughs> it's not like the other one. In the new days. In the new days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't know, I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going 
I guess everybody's leaving now, right? So. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask them. Okay. 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 Yeah, I thought it had it, but it doesn't have it. 
carved out Section 8, or is that San Francisco? There's some place that carved out Section 8. There's some place that carved out Section 8. Isn't that kind of the very right? Right, right. And there was a lot of But I mean, yeah, you still see the I mean, New York has sort of the Earth coverage, but it's kind of And and other sort of rules that are subtly or not so subtly designed to exclude the families, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, because I'm the one Yeah. Also, they plug into what's going on here. I hope to see you again. Yes, definitely, definitely. Yeah, here you guys are now on the list again for the ASH. The um, the um, uh, the AFFH the assessment of fair housing Philadelphia is supposed to be doing. It. <laughs> Are you guys working on that at all? Well, uh, fair housing rights and. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, okay. 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 Um, but it wasn't <laughs> I know. I know. Not a lot of people. So Jeffrey May took over. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, over for the organization. Yeah. So Jeffrey and I connected on April 28th. I gave the intro to the Office of Housing and Community Development. He went to the technical organization about AFH. So Philly knows what he's doing. So, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, it was great to see you. Likewise. <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't bring any cards with me. I don't, I, I left them at home. And I have beat up cards that I just had kind of stuck in here thinking this because my actual cards, they're in my other <laughs> I know, I left mine all at work. <laughs> you know, you switch handbags and you leave your life. I know, on. I know, yes, I just, that's exactly what I
Um, the only thing I'm going to I'm going to show you how to do this because okay. we, we, we that's really, that's yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. Um, so right now you know how to get to the screen. Now you go to presentation and just click. So you're going to, go to I'm going to room controls. I'm going. Done. On the mute the west microphone. Yeah, so we're going to, that's it. Yeah, so that's the slide right there for her. Mm -hmm. So you're going to mute the west. Like, such a good group.
you, you actually have a short amount of time because we have 30 minutes for coverage. We need to work with friends. We don't know that. And so, because we have a series of us paying out for capital in order to give you some time, that's just as much as we need to just cut the capital. And it's really all about the love. Yeah. And this, yeah, that's important. That would be awesome. Right. That, that's why, and we have about 12 minutes. Teresa did the same for the second We started at the second half. We started at the second half. So that's why it, that's why you have more time. And we have this gap on Well, for those that are my final panel, uh, because we're going to be very tight on time, everyone has to be very tight on All the And so do you need me to do a voice? I'd need out there because I was sitting in the back bench.
Okay. Okay. I think we're going to get started. I know we didn't give you a very a very long break, but you know, we're just we're, we're we're keeping things going and I am truly truly delighted to um have the opportunity to introduce my friend, my colleague, my co-author and maybe most important, my teaching partner, um, who I really miss. Um, she is uh, on leave as a faculty member at NYU Wagner, and she is currently serving as the um, Assistant Secretary of Policy Development and Research at, at HUD. Um, and this is Kathy O'Regan. I'm not sure I said your name. Um, and um, she is when, when Lee and Teresa and I started talking about this conference back um, last summer, we, um, we all immediately thought of Kathy as she would be the perfect keynote. And um, not only because um, she has done a lot of research in this area and she's tremendously thoughtful, but she also is somebody who, more than anybody I know, believes in the value of research um, in helping us understand complex social and economic phenomenon and the value of research in um, informing, informing policy. And of course, that's now her job. That um, so we're really delighted that she's um, here today to to listen to this research and to um, to reflect upon it um, and to tell us a little bit about um, what f how federal policy tools can can address it. So thank you, right. Kathy. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. Uh, sort of on two fronts, I want to thank the Federal Reserve Bank for this and uh, Furman Center and Ingrid for thinking of not only kind of nudging HUD to join in on partnering on this, but also for it to give me a chance to speak. Um, I have a long-standing interest in this area, as many of you know, um, but I get to speak here from the HUD hat. And HUD itself has a big interest, and specifically uh, Secretary Castro. Um, and so many of you will not know that for the past three months, Secretary Castor has been going around the country and joining um, in something that HUD is calling the Prosperity Playbook, which is joining local leaders in cities and regions who are having conversations and convenings about grappling with the issue of affordable housing from a regional lens and how to push in that area in a way with, for inclusive and equitable growth. Uh, so those have been lively conversations, a different tone than the conversation here in the room with research. And on the ground there, you're hearing a lot about gentrification. Every one of these places we go is grappling with rising housing costs and specifically the issue of gentrification. And to go back to Teresa's question this morning on whether gentrification is good or bad, um, mainly what you're hearing on the ground is they're not sure and not, they don't know if they care. They know it's happening. It's ha happening widely and they want to deal with it. Right? They want to deal with uh, finding a collection of policies and levers that they can employ that might capture the potential upside. Right? So as you see this movement into an increased demand for downtown living, where you see the increased investments, how do you gather that and garner those benefits while decreasing the potential downsides? And the downside that's talked about, there are really three. The first two we've talked a lot about, right? It's the potential for displacement and the increasing costs and cost burdens for the impacted households. But the third is their concern, their great concern, that in these patterns of change, the long-term prediction is we're resegregating our neighborhoods and that that's what we're seeing. And so those are the things that I want to be able to uh, talk about. And so this is a timely, lovely day. And spending a whole day on this topic is perfect for me. Um, so the way I want to go through this is I'm going to start by connecting three 
national trends that we've been seeing, much already documented this morning. I want to draw them together because I think we want to talk about all of them um, when we think about policies, which is the current gentrification trends, the rental affordability crisis, and thinking about what we should be seeing on supply responses. And then for the second part of my talk, I'm going to move into the policy hat. So with that as the background, how is HUD talking about this as a federal agency? What levers and things can we do from the federal level? Um, so in some sense, this is the bridging from this morning's conversation on the empirical to thinking about the policy side. So I'm going to start off with some additional uh, evidence and trends using some forthcoming work from the Furman Center. And in this case, in terms of what the slide means on gentrification is looking at the share of central cities tracts that start the decade as low income that then experience a large gain in income relative to the metro area. So this is about relative income gains. And if we look at the last three decades plus, we see that in the 1990s there was a real uptick that has been maintained in the 2000s. We saw some of this in the earlier research that some of this stuff started before the 2000s. What is really different now is the compo composition of the change. So if you look at here the share of low-income city tracts that are gaining large amounts of share that are white, this last decade looks very, very different, right? So the inner city tracks that were gaining earlier in the 90s were not going through this type of racial change that we're seeing now. And it's true also on educational changes. So the share of a population that's college educated wasn't going up so much in these gaining tracks in the 1990s, but it is in the 2000s. So much bigger demographic changes. And then something very striking also is much, much bigger changes on the rent front. So if you look here at the 1990s to 2000s, even though we saw gains in low-income neighborhoods, in city neighborhoods, they were not seeing large increases on the rent side. If you look at this most recent time period, low-income tracks in central city areas experienced large gains in relative rents. So this is relative to the metro area. This is not just about the affordability crisis. This is over and above that. So what this is pointing to, really this morning's panel showed big changes in the demand for downtown. It's showing up on two fronts. It's showing up in compositional changes, and it's showing up in rents. And I want to focus a lot on that second part to think about affordability. <laughs> If rents are going up a lot in these low-income neighborhoods, I want to go back to a point that Eric made earlier. The, the loss of affordability in these neighborhoods is the biggest concern, probably as a starting point for thinking about gentrification, for those who stay on a cost-burden basis and for those who may be displaced. I'm not going to go into the earlier conversation we had about how much evidence we have on these. But if we're seeing this, if we're seeing this big increase in rents, we're likely to see more of both, right? We should have reasons to be concerned about it. Why aren't we seeing these, why aren't we seeing a supply response on this? Why aren't we seeing changes in affordability over time, right? So the demographic changes we have good understandings for. Why aren't we, see aren't we seeing changes on rents over time? So I want to talk about the affordability crisis, because I think that's a big part of the broader context that isn't talked enough about when we talk about current issues of gentrification. Everybody in this room knows about the rental affordability crisis. I used a lot of my facts from the Joint Center report. Thank you. Um, and these are some numbers just from the American Housing Survey. I only want to make three points from this. One is that the affordability crisis that we're seeing now, and here on the graph we're looking at all households, owners and renters, and we're looking at any type of cost burden, that's in the top graph, or severe cost burden, spending more than 50% of your income on, on rent or your mortgage, your housing cost. The current affordability crisis has long legs. It has been going on, we've been building to where we are since the late 1970s. It is worse for renters. Right now, about half of renters experience some type of cost burden. Uh, that's about 20, more than 21 million households. 
But it is not just confined to our lowest income households. So the affordability crisis that we're seeing now is much broader than hot markets. It's not just the coast, and it's not just the lowest income households who've always suffered from high rent burdens. We're seeing it among moderate income households. So it's very broad, it has long legs, and if what we're concerned about in areas that we call gentrifying areas, if one of our concerns is that the increase in the cost of housing, increased rent burdens, increases dis displacement, we should be worrying about many more places than just neighborhoods that we classify as gentrifying because we have these same forces broadly around the country. Okay, and so we're going to want to think about this. And in fact, many of the places that we're talking to around the country are talking about it throughout their regions. They're not just talking about a limited number of neighborhoods that they consider to be gentrifying. So why aren't we seeing a supply response? If the affordability crisis is not a, a blip now um, that we're going to, you know, it occurred now, but things were sort of kind of doing fine before then, if it's been increasing, increasing for decades, why aren't we seeing responsiveness? There's been a bunch of research done on the role of local barriers, regulatory impediments, things that impede the ability for the housing production to occur so that you might actually see a response to the increase in costs such that we actually kind of build our way out of it. This is a graph I, I like that uh, Glazer and Goko did that takes a look at this over a time period, looking at the relationship between the cost of housing and what should be some undermining fundamental cost, which is the creation of housing, and found that about the, light, the late 1980s, there's a real divergence here, right? So the cost of housing is going up. We've got the bubble there, but going up. But the real construction costs are not. And the gap in between, in essence, is the cost of the land and the access and the process of being able to do this. There have been a number of researchers who've gone down below this level and looked at specific regulations and the connection between those regulations and the cost of housing in specific areas, kind of documenting now, I think, a pretty good body of evidence suggesting that the we've got increasing barriers over time and housing supply is getting less responsive. So as demand increases in areas, we're not responding enough to meet that need. So what does that mean? Three things from this I want to connect as we go into thinking about policy. One of the things it means is I think we want to connect, see the connection between the affordability crisis overall and the gentrification conversation today, right? So as affordability uh, decreases in this country, and you're looking at downtown, if we have a uh, new demand for downtown, as Andrew was talking about, you're going to be looking much more broadly than just neighborhoods you might have looked at in the past because of the cost of housing. So that overall affordability issue can be a driver in the gentrification conversation. And the second part is thinking about that lack of affordability um, and the in inadequate supply itself may be one of the reasons that the gentrification we're seeing in this decade is coming with much, much greater consequences on rent spikes and housing cost spikes in those neighborhoods. And so I think we want to be talking about both of them related to supply and supply response, right? Beyond, we need to think about increasing supply overall. I'm going to say this, I think, five times. I'm more than five times saying this. We need to increase the supply overall and supply responsiveness in gentrifying areas and outside of gentrifying areas. And I say that here, knowing that if I said that in any of the five places we had had these convenings around the country, um, boy, I, we were already not liked in those, in those communities in talking about this. This is not something local elected officials can say in the forefront of communities that are facing this pressure where the current residents fear that if you build in my neighborhood, the only way to accommodate this demand is you're building in a way that looks very different than my current neighborhood. So you're going to transform my neighborhood, and it's not going to feel like the place. It's not going to feel like my home. And the second thing is if you build in my neighborhood, I am certain my neighborhood's going to gentrify, and I'm going to be displaced. So the biggest, what the residents want is almost nothing. Don't, don't build here, and then maybe it'll be safe. And the elected officials have to listen to their constituents. And so the, the place where the levers are the best to increase supply may have the least political will 
and ability to do it, and we're in a, a quite a, a conflict here. And that's where I think the third part comes in, which is to recognize the connection between all of these neighborhoods and jurisdictions. So in the conversation on displacement, the paper that Lay and others did that looked at not just turnover, but where do you go when you leave a neighborhood? When gentrification is occurring, they have indicators that, in fact, you're going to see that vulnerable populations go to even higher poverty neighborhoods. In the conversations we're having around the country, the former residents where places are gentrifying are going very far flung, maybe to other jurisdictions. And their conversations, they are engaging in regional conversations. Think about all of these neighborhoods as being embedded in larger housing markets and across regions. That's where you're going to want to have conversations about policy if you're going to break through some of the political will um, barriers for just thinking about my house in my neighborhood. Uh, so I would say the conversations are fraught as you're having and thinking about this because these are people's communities. So what do you do about that if you're at the federal level? There are three main things that we need to do at the federal level, that we can do from the federal level. We want to push as much as possible to increase on the overall supply of rental housing, and including affordable rental housing, but I said it this way for a reason. We also just need to inc increase rental housing and all housing and doing this, not just affordable, because part of what you're seeing is you're seeing upward filtering of housing in these areas, right? So the majority of affordable housing in this country is not subsidized. And we lose that housing in hot markets very quickly because that's what goes up. And if so, if we're not building across the spectrum of rental housing, we're going to lose more of our naturally occurring affordable housing. The second is preserving affordable housing and here even thinking about the subsidized stock, which is much at risk. And the third is most of the levers really are at the state and local level. And it's very interesting to have a federal stance on trying to move something where we don't have the biggest levers. And so what are the things that we can do that would incentivize and support local efforts? So those are kind of the three buckets. I will only have time to talk about three, but I kind of put the things that are in our mind that we think are most useful for this conversation. So let me go through one in each. So on the increasing supply side, HUD has a collection of our largest main programs that support affordable housing. Our ability to increase any of these also depends on cooperation from Congress. Um, and so I want to actually talk about something a little different that I'm not sure everybody in the room knows that we did um, this year, which is to look at the ability of using some of our other levers to increase the preservation or creation of affordable housing. So in January, we announced, but in April 1st, implemented a reduction in the uh, uh, multifamily insurance premium from FHA for three types of housing, multifamily rental housing, one that's on the green side, and two that's related to affordability and mixed income. So the two criteria are up here. Um, one is where at least 90% of the units are, have our Section 8 contracts um, or are covered by LIHTC type eligibility. And the second is the mixed income, uh, where you have units that are set aside based on affordability through a variety of programs. Um, our estimates are that this will spur the rehabilitation of an additional 12,000 units per year. But I think one of the most important things about this is the, the bullet here on what qualifies for mixed income, right? So for the mixed income, you can have set-asides based on LIHTC, Section 8, or a whole variety of other types of mixed development and affordable things that are happening at the state and local level. So this is our way of saying, okay, if you're making that effort to increase affordable housing in your area, we're going to join you with one of the levers that we have. And that's something for us to be thinking about more creatively um, as we try to think about ways to expand supply. Okay, on preservation. Um, I think we lose several hundred thousand units of affordable housing uh, in this country a year. 10,000 of those units are public housing units. Uh, and the primary reason for the loss of public housing units is an existing nearly $26 billion backlog of capital needs. And the current structure of the way that public housing is financed, the structure and the annual appropriations process, 
basically prohibits us from solving that problem uh, with federal funding. And so the rental assistance uh, demonstration, RAD, which HUD created in 2013, is specifically focused on trying to get around the issue of losing these affordable units by disrepair and tapping private markets. And the, basically the core uh, innovation in this, and I would call it an innovation, is that the structure of financing public housing units is annual appropriations from Congress. You cannot leverage debt or equity off the promise that maybe next year Congress is actually going to appropriate another bucket of money. Um, but the other types of contracts that we use that are long term, 15, 20 year contracts, you can actually leverage private capital. And so at the core, what RAD is meant to do, and it has other layers and complications, but at its core, what it does is move those units from one type of a contract the annual contract to long-term contracts, such as a project-based Section 8, so that you have a long-term contract that you can then take and leverage debt and equity. That's the main part of it. It comes with a collection of requirements on it. Um, the, the first long-term contract, which is either 15 or 20 years, um, has to be renewed, and then there are some other requirements on renewal to try to secure long-term affordability. The rent payments from the tenants don't change. It's still capped at 30% of income. There are a collection of tenant protections. There are things on the ownership side. Uh, the experience we've had so far is we've had 30,000 of these deals go through, and they have leveraged more than $2 billion of private capital infused into the stock. Currently, there's a, Congress has a cap. We can't do more than 185,000 of these units. If you sort of estimate out based on the ones that are in the queue, that's about $6 billion of leveraged capital on infusion. Um, there are other things that you could do with this kind of vehicle. So the critical piece on this is to find ways to think differently about how we preserve the existing stock. RAD can be used for other legacy, and is used for other legacy programs. I don't know if it's going to be the right vehicle for other ways of preserving the very large subsidized stock that is at risk for loss of affordability in this country, but that's one of the big areas, I think, um, collectively to think about. And then the last, on encouraging local action. Um, most of the levers we want to push and that we're talking about are not owned at the federal level, and so thinking about how you might encourage and uh, partner is pretty important. And I actually think there's very promising hope for this in HUD's final rule on affirmatively furthering fair housing. So to talk about that, let me give you a little bit of background on the rule and more importantly, the process that we're going through. We are now in the implementation process. So the key component of the final rule is that jurisdictions are now required to complete an assessment of fair housing identifying fair housing issues within their area. So since the Fair Housing Act of 1968, HUD and other federal agencies have all been required to, to affirmatively further fair housing. This is not a new requirement, and those we fund have the similar obligation. If you have our money, that you have to spend it in ways that affirmatively furthers fair housing. This rule has now helped clarify what those obligations are, standardize the assessment. So there's actually a series of questions you need to ask and analysis you need to go through for your jurisdiction. We provide some data and some maps. You can use your own also in an area in assessing issues. And a key thing to assess here is racial and ethnic concentration and segregation and how that relates to neighborhood amenities, so things, opportunity that you might get geographically. The uh, grantees have to then pick some priority goals, set those forth, and they actually then have to follow up on those in their follow-up planning with HUD. Two things that I think are most important about this are, first is the requirement that as you do this assessment and set forth your area's priority goals, you need to have a meaningful engagement with the community. The data you have and the plans that you're doing are available to the community as you engage, um, and that's a place in which you can have conversations about what's going on in which neighborhoods, in which there's lots of input on what's the experience on the ground. The second thing is that HUD is strongly encouraging regional and joint submissions. Right? So part of getting around some of the issues would be having a broad group of players 
jurisdictions and stakeholders involved in setting this. So how does that play in with gentrification? Okay, so the way that I see this as being um, particularly useful for adopting policies and strategies that may be most effective in areas of gentrification is to think about how the conversations have been playing out already. In most of our discussions on AFH, um, they really sort of, there tend to be, there's discussion of two strategies, emphasis of two different strategies, sometimes conflict between two strategies. One is increasing access to areas of existing higher opportunity for minorities in particular. And the other is increasing and investing in areas of existing minority concentration. Now we clearly need to do both. You're not going to make much progress on increasing access to opportunity if you only do one. But there are some of those conversations are fraught and both have challenges, right? We have been for decades challenged on getting access to those higher opportunity areas and sustaining access to those areas for disadvantaged populations. And on investing, we also struggle to identify the best strategies and garner enough resources that it takes to invest in those communities such that you see meaningful change, right? So both have some issues, um, both struggle. I think the gentrifying areas provide a sort of a middle strategy or a third strategy where many of these communities already have a stronghold of minority communities, right? So already have access now and you're already seeing the beginning of investments. So you've got an engine of investment that's coming from a variety of areas, whether it's public investments or private. And if you are to seize that moment in time, securing the affordable housing, securing and anchoring the diversity that you see now, you may be able to stop resegregation in the future. My hope is that to the extent as jurisdictions are seeing this as an either or, or strategy, and to be clear, HUD does not see this as an either or, or strategy. Those groups can see this middle area as a win for both sides. You can already see that you have access for these for, for minority households, and you can already see some investment, possibly some changes happening on the ground. We're going to hear this afternoon about the strategies that you might want to be employing. These are not easy either. So there's never one, two, and three on this slide all are hard. Uh, but this may be one where you can align stakeholders a little bit easier. I would say it's one, if we missed that opportunity in the next five years of not securing those places, we're going to be lamenting their loss for decades afterwards, and we're going to see resegregation. And so I see AFFH as, as potentially aligning a broader, a broader group of stakeholders to sort of get the political will to maybe employ some of the strategies that would be effective in those places. So the last thing I want to say, no idea how much overtime I'm on, um, is something that we haven't talked enough about yet, but I'm sure we'll talk more in the afternoon. Um, we have two major trends that we're seeing um, in this past decade, along with gentrification, that are really large. Very large increases in rents and costs in these areas, and very large socioeconomic demographic changes. And that second part is fraught. Right. So on the ground, the fact that there is larger differences means that what you're experiencing in the conversation with people in their communities is um, fear, hostility, us versus them along charged lines. When it's along race and class, these are charged lines that we have decades of history in this country that come up. Um, as you have conversations with community uh, groups, uh, there's a lot of distrust. You can talk about things you might want to be doing now, but we have enough history that that's not a simple conversation. And a lot of conversation about how it is that we can have meaningful integration such that the longtime residents who do get to stay actually experience this as a win. And so I think we'll hear more about that this afternoon. And with that, I think I'll stop. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have time? Yes. Okay, great. Okay. I think we have we have about ten minutes or so oh, great. for for questions. It's five minutes, so you don't really need me up here, but no, it's always nice to have you around though. I like that. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, love it. great. I miss getting to teach with you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Melora Hill with Grounded Solutions Network. And um, given your comments about the loss of affordable housing and the need to preserve some long term affordability, mm -hmm. um, has HUD thought about uh, requiring or prioritizing funding for permanent, permanently affordable housing, either through community land trust or other 
strategies? Um, so those strategies are actually not a, wouldn't so much be HUD strategies as state and local generally, or do you mean as a new program? I mean, if you said that home dollars used for ownership must be permanently affordable, that would be a Yeah. Um, so within uh, each of the, the, the big streams, like we've got, say, home, CDBG, um, and, and thinking about things that we do even in RAD and public housing um, and our Section 8-based uh, unit base. When we think about those, we have conversations about how you might want to change priorities and give points going forward. And so specifically within home, uh, Harriet Tregoning is our uh, principal deputy assistant secretary in that area, and she's been holding brown bag lunches of thinking forward. What are the things that you could imagine doing so that we could use our home dollars more effectively for these pieces? So in just in terms of timeline and ho how those things work out, you know, you have those conversations internally, then we have to actually propose something, and then it needs to be adopted. Adopted. And so uh, one way that you might want to think about this, and I'm sure almost everybody in the room is thinking about, what do you tee up for the next administration for make, doing on these changes? So we are having internal conversations on imagining the changes that could make it more effective. And also just thinking about other funding streams that can prioritize. Uh, a funding stream we have more access to quickly um, was thinking about how we would prioritize the RAD developments if, if we can go past the 185,000 that was currently capped with Congress, right? So we have noted in the RAD deals post the 185,000 that we would prioritize particular types of RAD deals, including RAD deals that bring greater amounts of investment into the neighborhood, right? So you go to the front of the next queue if you're bringing more capital to the neighborhood, because we know it takes more than just reinvesting in housing, it takes more than that, and we're more likely gonna be an engine of growth if you do something like that. So within things that we can change in the shorter term on prioritizing, we are thinking about levers in this area. Um, but there would be more, right? Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, I, I just have a quick question uh, about for thinking about affordable housing, and I didn't hear anything about uh, mass transportation. If that is that part of the strategy, or right, um, another thing we don't own. You know, the one, I think this is you spend an awful lot of time. The first question you ask, uh, you know, I think, in a federal agent, what are we allowed to do, and what do we touch? Um, so, I, uh, in this area, actually, the Department of Transportation has already started to move. Um, they've incorporated some. Uh, smaller points in a grant structure this this fiscal year that prioritize that gives extra points if you're doing certain things locally that are useful for affordable housing. They have very large funding streams in transportation. So I'm thinking on the incentivizing side, not just where you land. Both conversations going on with the Department of Transit. But you could imagine for any large funding stream, if one of the things that we're interested in doing is increasing either the supply of affordable housing or the connection between affordable housing and the other things that matter for opportunity, let me place transit and education as the two big levers. Um, then you can embed that into, and one of the powerful ways to embed it is large funding streams at the federal level. And transit is a big one on this. And so thinking about whether or not some of those funding streams could have points, very concrete points, if you make certain local decisions. If it's tied to affordable housing, I don't know, maybe if you make certain changes in your local zoning, that's likely to lead to more production of housing. Um, and that's a way to think about tying. And so we are in conversations with Department of Transit and Department of Ed on many of these conversations, both in the AFFH front and the Prosperity Playbook, because transit and education are the, the two big levers that we think of as going together with housing. Um, so one suggestion has been made, um, 
which is that the CDBG funds, which are very flexible, can be used in a variety of ways. And this could be a really useful way of adding some CDBG funds in an area so that after you've actually, if you've done something on the housing front that secures some diversity, you have a way of making sure that it actually works on the ground and you get the kind of interactions uh, that are hoped for out of this, or that you grapple with uh, some of the frictions that may exist and that may threaten the long-term viability of that. Um, the prosperity playbook that I talked about is has a component to it, and this is uh, a no money initiative uh, that HUD is doing this year. Just join us uh, on this endeavor. Yes, and, and the thing that is fantastic, I have to say it's amazing, communities are, are remarkably willing and interested to join, even when what you're bringing is energy and attention and no funding. But one of the things that should come, we, it will come out of the prosperity playbook as we go around and talk to communities is learning best practices and cases and things that are going on that we then place online in something called a playbook that would be, uh, we should have by the uh, late fall. And the hope behind this is that these are useful strategies that some, fo some locality has employed that is, um, and had some success with in finding early success so that you can identify others who are doing things in, in an area that you're looking at. And so my hope is the communities that have been grappling with this, we can do some cases on so they would be sitting there. This playbook then sits online and lives past this administration. AFFH rolls out, it takes five years for us to get all through all of the jurisdictions that have an AFFH due as they come up and are thinking and grappling. And as the stakeholders in those communities are considering these issues, our resources, which are this playbook, is very much going to link to existing resources and work that's done. I've talked with a couple of you already about interesting things you're doing. Um, and so the hope is that that's a, an avenue in for those who are trying to do something in addition on the ground. So one of the tensions that this illustrates in terms of the AFFH approach and, and the gentrification issue is that a set of actions in a neighborhood might seem like they pose affirmatively furthering fair housing problems if you think of that neighborhood as right now deeply racially concentrated. But if you think about it as trying to protect against uh, reintegration and then resegregation in a different direction, it might look very different. Yeah. But anticipating and justifying that you've got it right that that neighborhood is going to be gentrifying is very difficult because we can't define gentrification. It's often retroactive, yeah. et cetera. So yeah. how is HUD thinking about that tension? Yeah. Um, so this is one of the things that I would say uh, is very good about the rollout of, of AFFH is in this very first year, we have about 22, <clears throat> 23 jurisdictions that are actually going through the implementation process. And you can think of that as being uh, an, a good size number. There's diversity without being overwhelming in which you, we are going to actually, we have a bunch of TA that we're providing for all of the heirs, so tech, technical assistance with the areas on the work that they're doing. And Jeff is actually, his group is, is leading some of the technical assistance. So we're going to learn a lot during that time period. Um, and one of that's going to be one of the things that is going to come up, I think, in the public engagement process. So what do you, what do you expect to hear when you're looking at the maps? And people say, well, sure, I'm looking at these two areas with very high concentration of minorities. But we can see, we already know this area on the ground is facing certain pressures that the data that we have from HUD is not showing. And that's where the comments from the engagement part come in to articulate a strategy and goals that make sense. And I completely agree. We're going to hear this afternoon about what early indicators and the hopes of finding early indicators. It's not an easy one. Although we do know some things about the patterns and the spatial patterns of flow and where you've already experienced gentrification and the nearby neighborhoods and some real-time information, rents that are different than what we would see in the ACS, for example, that presumably communities would then provide us back with in describing their strategies. 
Um, but I think it is, you know, we're in the new, we're, is it a completely new stage of analysis? And I appreciate that for the jurisdictions going through this, it's fraught with the unknowns because you don't have two years of groups doing it before you and you can see how it's been laid out. And that's one of the reasons and I want to do a shout out to philanthropy on this because some of the big technical assistance and resources on the ground to help each of these 23 jurisdictions are coming from our partners. They're not coming from HUD. They're coming from those who are very vested in seeing these communities be able to put forth good plans um, that would make sense for the future. That's half an answer. So I think we need to, we need to stop, um, but um, please join me in thanking Kathy. <laughs>
was built in the 50s and 60s in what were at the time low-income areas. In the interim, um, from then till now, we find one of our key takeaways is that about two-thirds of developments, of public housing developments in New York City, now are surrounded with neighborhoods where the average income in that neighborhood is in the upper half of the New York City income distribution. So we take this as something of a gentrification experiment. We have otherwise similar low-income populations in public housing in New York City, and now some are surrounded by high-income neighborhoods, and others are not. Others uh, remain in low-income neighborhoods. And our big question then is, do public housing residents benefit from living in gentrified neighborhoods? So is gentrification good for public housing residents? Um, our overview, um, I'll walk through here, is our findings of, of, of how the neighborhoods have changed around public housing, what that means in terms of access to neighborhood amenities for public housing residents, and then resident level outcomes, comparing across surrounding neighborhood types. We conducted some, what I thought was, fa as a quantitative researcher, what I thought was fascinating qualitative research, uh, a member of our team at APT, Anna Jefferson led that, and, and we'll, I'll touch on that briefly, but there's companion uh, publications in process that, that you'll be able to see more detail there. And finally, a, a brief sum of our thoughts on what the policy implications are from our findings. So it's, what's great about New York City here is our analysis is, is centers around these NYCHA areas, these, these core areas, the dark blue. And if you're not familiar with maps of New York City, there's a lot of Furman folks here, so you are familiar with maps of New York City. But for, for other folks, these dark squiggles are large 8 to 10 story public housing developments. And in the blue area is a census block group. And that's, in this case, in, composed entirely of public housing. And then it's surrounded here by some private housing and some uh, and some other public housing in adjacent block groups. So we defined a core area, and then we defined a surrounding neighborhood of all of the adjacent block groups uh, surrounding what was at least 70% or more, uh, based on, again, this, this detailed property maps from New York City, what was at least 70% public housing units. And we classified these core areas into three groups. The first were high surrounding neighborhood income areas. And this is where the average income in these surrounding adjacent block groups has been above this arbitrary benchmark of the New York City median in each of the past three censuses. Okay, So these are historically, in the last 20 years, high income neighborhoods, although again, most of them were not when they were constructed. Then we have an increasing income group, wherein either the 1990 or 2000 period that surrounding neighborhood average income was below the, the city median. And now, in 2010, we observe that it's, it's risen above the city median. So these are more changing neighborhoods in terms of the surrounding neighbors' incomes. And finally, we have low-income neighborhoods where uh, the average in surrounding neighborhoods has remained below the city median across the three decades. Um, there's a couple more possibilities, but interestingly, this really did capture almost all of the developments uh, in, our, in our sample. These are spread throughout the city. So for those of you that know New York, there is a concentration in the Bronx of, of low-income surrounding neighborhoods. But we really see these different types of neighborhoods across the city. And we have a great sample here of, of 40,000 New Aicha units in low-income areas. 33,000 in increasing uh, units in development surrounded by increasing neighborhoods, and over 50,000 units surrounded by high-income neighborhoods. So just to pause again here that this New York City public housing and changing neighborhoods in New York City has kind of left us with this pattern of, of permanent, relatively permanent, albeit there's lots of news stories about difficulties with public housing, but it's located in a variety of neighborhood types in many areas of New York City. We looked at a variety of, of surrounding neighborhood characteristics that, as you would expect, are correlated with neighborhood income. So, for example, in the surrounding neighborhoods, 
with, that have high incomes uh, over, uh, sorry, let me pause. 36% of neighbors have at least a bachelor's degree, and, and there's 30% home ownership rate, which is uh, close to the New York City wide average there. The housing code violations are much higher at a higher rate in the surrounding neighborhood here uh, for, in, in the surrounding neighborhoods around public housing in low in, uh, with low in, income surrounding neighbors. And we see uh, some of the, the racial differences in, in the minority share, higher again, higher concentration uh, of low income, uh, of, of minorities in the low income areas in New York it, it persists. What does this mean for neighborhood amenities? Um, we see public school access differences. So our measure here is how many of the schools, uh, 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 how many, so the schools that the, the units are zoned to, what are their math scores? Are they in the bottom quartile? And 72% of units surrounded by low income neighborhoods access schools with math scores in the bottom quartile uh, as, a, as opposed to uh, the lowest point here is for units in development surrounded by increasing income neighborhoods. In terms of exposure to crime, we see uh, again a pattern here where developments, uh, residents living in NYCHA campuses that are surrounded by higher income neighborhoods are exposed to less violent crime uh, per thousand units each year than our residents in, in uh, development surrounded by low income or increasing income neighborhoods. So that's a little bit of amenities and, and uh, more in, in the paper, obviously. Then it's fantastic to look, okay, in terms of the experience and this big question of what, what, what are resident outcomes and how do they differ, um, we're able to look at these annual recertifications from the NYCHA administrative data where they yearly talk to these households and ask them what are their incomes across all the different sources that they have. And, and we see uh, differences, uh, about 5% of income uh, on a base of around 19,500 between, uh, these are again the residents now living in developments surrounded by low income neighborhoods versus uh, increasing income neighborhoods and then another 5% 5, 5 up to the high income neighborhoods. There's higher employment. It's, it's a little bit striking uh, to see the, the, the lack of labor force participation relative to what you might expect. So these are still, as, as we show you these numbers, we'll see that residents living in developments surrounded by high income neighborhoods have better economic outcomes, but they're still very low when you think about a household in New York City um, with, with $30,000 or, or less of median household earnings and a, and a lot of unemployment challenges. So we have regressions where we take this rich individual data from the NYCHA ad administrative records and we, um, we uh, have as our outcome variable this example of household earned incomes among households that have positive in earned income. And the base here is $30,000 of earned income for residents, on average for residents living in uh, developments surrounded by low income neighborhoods. And there's a, a Unconditional mean, uh, uh, that's $2,200 higher for in increasing uh, income areas and $3,700 higher in, uh, for, for residents living uh, in development surrounded by high income neighborhoods. And when we, our finding is that this is really robust to this rich, consent, rich set of controls that, that we add to our model. And we see that you know, these differences remain uh, at about five percent for increasing income neighborhoods over low income and about 10 percent for high income over low income. And I, I talked to some of my colleagues at APT that work in kind of labor, for, labor force programs training and asked, you know, how big of a deal is this in terms of an income gap? Back gap? And they said, this is, this is really big. Um, although, again, thinking about living in New York City on an income of $33,000 uh, a year is, is still a challenge. For those of you that think, wait, there's probably a lot going on, then maybe this isn't causal, this is sorting. Yes, <laughs> as an economist, that's true. Although we have a rich set of household level characteristics and we don't see differences that would lead us to predict these, these differences in outcomes in terms of, of sorting and, and observable characteristics. So we think that a sizable portion of this 
has something to do with the context, the neighborhood context in which folks find themselves. The paper also goes into some of our findings on, on uh, adult uh, education uh, outcomes and, and references some child education differences that we see as well. So briefly, I mentioned this great qualitative piece because you know, we can look at incomes, we can measure numbers, but, but it's great to go and, and talk to people and see what's going on in the neighborhoods as well. So um, our, our staff helped actually train some NYCHA residents and, and uh, it, uh, through community organization in uh, Morris Heights, a, a, a development surrounded by a low-income neighborhood in Long Island City, which is, falls in our increasing category, and in Chelsea, which is a... Uh, uh, gentrified from high income to globally high income neighborhood. Um, and <coughs> conducted a, a variety of public observations and focus groups and interviews. And it was interesting that the public housing residents noted differences in their neighborhoods in, in Chelsea and in Long Island City. But they had this sense of, you know, the high line in Chelsea, it's, it's not for us. It's great. There was some employment opportunities that they specifically outreached to hire NYCHA residents. But we don't see that as our space. That's, a, that's tourists and, and the folks that live there that, that, that isn't us. And there was this continual fear um, that was sometimes expressed of getting pushed out of, of public housing with, with neighborhood changes. And they talked about uh, difficulties across all three neighborhood types in employment and opportunities for youth and, and noted the potential challenges of cost of increase of living. Um, I, I think I'm out of time, but the policy implications we see here really echo what what uh, Kathy O'Regan was talking about, that public housing in New York City has maintained some income mix, uh, and, and that perhaps these some place-based policies that preserve existing affordable housing and promote affordable housing in the context of gentrification can bring some uh, increased economic opportunities uh, for the lower income households that remained, um, again, with this difficulty that we found in the qualitative research of, of mixing, fo mixing folks of different income categories can, can be um, difficult as well. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. And now we'll have Gerard Torres Espinosa, who is a second year uh, uh, PhD student in sociology at NYU. And a doctoral fellow at the Furman Center. So, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so my name is Gerard, as Vicky said. Um, I'll be presenting, I'm very excited to present uh, preliminary findings from work that's co-authored with Ingrid Wold Ellen. Um, and in this paper, in particular, we look at uh, how participants in the largest uh, federal rental housing uh, program respond to and are affected by gentrification. Uh, before I go on, I'll read the disclaimer and I'll thank the, the, the funders. So the, uh, the work that uh, provided the basis for this study was supported by funding under a grant with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, Office of Police, uh, Policy Development and, and Research. Uh, the research has also been supported by the Annie Casse Foundation, um, and the substance of, and findings of the work uh, are dedicated to the public. The authors are solely responsible for the accuracy of the statements and interpretations contained in this study, and such interpretations do not necessarily reflect the views of the government. Okay. I was, I was told to do so, so, you know, <laughs> still learning. Um, so, one of the... One of the ways in which, or at least how we measure gentrification is uh, by measuring increases, increases in rents. Um, if we look at trends nationally, we've seen that for the last 15 years, rents have been going up by 7% on average, uh, adjusting by inflation. And in some cities, these rents increases have been much larger, uh, raising above 20% in cities like Washington, D.C. So one group that's one population group that's particularly vulnerable to these uh, rent increases are low income low income uh, households uh, to ensure that uh, these low income households uh, are somehow protected from these rent increases uh, tenant based uh, subsidy programs become a tool that can potentially uh, protect them from being displaced or uh, make sure that they don't face very high burdens one program, which is the one that we're going to be looking at here, is the Housing Choice uh, Voucher Program. It was created in 1974 um, 
It's the largest federal uh, rental housing program. We spend $19 billion, and there are 20.1 million uh, participants uh, in the program uh, currently. I'm not going to get into details about the eligibility requirements, but I'll highlight the key feature of the program that's relevant to our question, which is that the, uh, the public housing authorities locally set the payment standard uh, that ensures that the households are able to rent um, moderate, moderately priced uh, uh, housing units uh, in the local market. Given this, then they, uh, the voucher household pays uh, 30, roughly 30% of their income uh, in rent. Um, so given this context and given this, 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 this rule and feature of the program, we can think that uh, the program might or might not protect uh, voucher households from uh, rent increases. So as long as the, they might be protected if the rent unit, uh, the, of the rent of the unit remains below the voucher payment standard, and so then the voucher, holds, ha, voucher holder living there uh, will continue to pay 30%, uh, even though uh, the rent might, might increase. As long as it doesn't increase, above this uh, payment standard, they should be able to, to, to stay. Uh, conversely, uh, if the local rents raise above the voucher payment standards, landlords might find market uh, rate tenants more attractive and then uh, rent, rent to them. This might lead to displacement of voucher households uh, to lower rent uh, neighborhoods or for those who stay, they might face uh, higher, higher rents. Uh, so given this, Given this context, we'll be asking these four research questions. So are larger increases in median rents in the metropolitan area associated with more frequent residential moves among voucher households, higher rent burdens for voucher households, more spatial, more spatial concentration of voucher households in particular neighborhoods, and changes in access to opportunity neighborhoods for voucher households? Um, so we'll be using data from HUD, administrative data that contains uh, information on the on characteristics of the voucher households, rent payments, uh, in, their income, and other characteristics uh, from 2006 to 2014. We geocode uh, their addresses to census tracts, and we have repeated observations over multiple years for each voucher household, which uh, leads to this huge sample uh, of 10.9 million voucher household year observations. Uh, we supplement these with uh, demographic and rent uh, data from uh, the metropolitan area, the CBSAs, from the American Community Survey, and we also add uh, neighborhood conditions also uh, from the American Community Survey. Uh, this is a snapshot of the data for 2013. Uh, we see that roughly 10% of uh, voucher households move to a different track uh, every year. Uh, this goes from 9 to 12 percent. Uh, 30 percent are white, uh, 50 percent are, uh, are black, uh, 16 percent are Hispanic. Uh, they're predominantly female-headed households, and half of them have any dependents uh, listed. Um, so our empirical strategy, I'm not going to get into details with the models and the equations, but the intuition is that we're going to be exploiting variation in rents and outcomes over time and within CBSAs. And we'll look at these four outcomes that I, that I mentioned. So for mobility, we'll be looking at whether the voucher household moved to a different census tract the previous year, um, whether they face uh, an increase in rent burdens defined as paying more than 35 uh, or 40 percent of the income in gross rent. In gross rent means rent and utilities. Uh, whether they become more concentrated in space. We've, we have various measures. I'm going to highlight just two of them here. The first one is the share of tracks where 50% of voucher, uh, voucher households live. So what we do here is we uh, sort census tracts based on the population of voucher households that live in them, and then we identify the smallest set of tracts in the metropolitan area that contain 50% of voucher households. That's one of our measures of concentration. Uh, the second uh, measure of concentration is a voucher non-voucher dissimilarity index. For those of you who are not familiar with the index, is um, so if in a metropolitan area, 10%, there are 10% of households that are voucher households, in an area with no spatial concentration, you would expect to see 10% of voucher households in each census tract. Uh, the opposite would be that all these 10% voucher households live in one census tract. So our dissimilarity index captures uh, this, this dimension. And our last set of outcomes is, captures um, Opportunity outcomes for the neighborhoods with voucher households live. Uh, we look at two measures. One is what share of voucher households live in high poverty tracks, meaning 
40 tracks, pop, uh, high poverty, okay, census tracks with more than 30% of, of poverty. And then we compute an exposure to uh, poverty for, for, for the average budget household in the metropolitan area. Um, so I'll highlight the findings from each set of results. I'm not going to show any tables or coefficients. Uh, so what we find for mobility is that uh, as uh, a 10% increase in median rents is associated with a one percentage point increase in the probability of moving to, to another track in the, in, the, in the subsequent year. We find some heterogeneity across racial groups in, in this, in this uh, part of the analysis. So compared to white residents, Blacks and Hispanics are less likely to move uh, as, rents, as rents increase. Um, for the rent burden results, we find that as rents in the metropolitan area increase, voucher households experience higher rent burdens. Uh, specifically, a 10% increase in median rents is associated with a 3.3 percentage point increase in the share of voucher households in the metropolitan area that pay more than 35% in rent. Um, Similarly, a 10% increase in median rents is associated with a 2.5 percentage point increase in the share of budget households who pay more than 40% of their income in rent. Uh, in subsequent analysis, we'll examine um, the variation heterogeneity across uh, racial groups for, for, for this outcome. Um, for the concentration results, we find that as rents increase, voucher households become more concentrated in, in, in smaller set of tracks in the metropolitan area. Specifically, a 10% increase in median rents is associated with a 0.4 uh, percentage point decrease in the share of tracks that contain that 50% of voucher households that I was talking about before. Um, again, a uh, 10% increase in median rents leads to a one point percentage increase one point increase in the voucher, non voucher dissimilarity index. This index, the higher, the more concentrated uh, voucher households uh, are. So for the opportunity results, here is where we find uh, the most interesting, uh, the most interesting uh, uh, set of findings. So we find that as rents, as rents in the metropolitan area increase, uh, we find a decrease in the poverty track, in the poverty rate in the census track with voucher households leave. Uh, so looking at the share of tracks, share of voucher households who live in, in high poverty tracks, we find that a 10% increase in median rents is associated with a 2 percentage point decrease in the share of voucher households living in high poverty tracks. Uh, we do some, uh, uh, we dig a little bit deeper into this and try to distinguish between what's going on in central cities versus suburban areas still within the metropolitan area. And we find that these results of decrease in, 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 in census tract poverty seem to be driven by changes happening in, in central cities. Uh, we find that a 10% increase in median rents is associated with a 1.4 percentage point decrease in the exposure to poverty uh, uh, rate uh, for the typical voucher household living in central in central cities, we find no association between rents and exposure to poverty uh, when we look at suburban at suburban areas. Uh, so so far, I've been telling you about just voucher households. So in this set of results, we also look at uh, what how rents what's the association between rents and exposure to poverty for the average poor family in, in the metropolitan area, which might include, which we will include uh, some of the voucher households. And we find that this association goes in the, sa goes in the same direction, but the magnitude is somewhat, somewhat smaller. So for the average poor family in the metropolitan area, we find that living in central city tracks, we find that a 10% increase in median rents is associated with a just 0.7 percentage point decrease in the census tract poverty uh, rate for the typical poor, poor, poor family. Um, yeah, I went too fast? Okay. So uh, just putting everything together uh, and summarizing uh, uh, what I've been discussing here, we find that as rents in the metropolitan area increase, voucher households move more, frequent, more frequently to other neighborhoods, uh, experience higher rent burdens, become more concentrated in space, and live, seem to live in neighborhoods with lower poverty poverty rates. This this is this last finding is the one that's more interesting to us and, and the one that we will explore further. But we attribute this decrease in poverty rates to a potential gentrification effect if higher income households are moving into low income neighborhoods, which is where those voucher households households live. 
So uh, in future work, this is still a, a, a preliminary set of findings. We will try to disentangle what happens to the neighborhoods of voucher households who stay versus the ones who, who move. Uh, we look at rent changes at different points of the rent distribution. We might think that the kind of changes in rent that's relevant here is one happening below the, below the median, for example. Uh, and we will examine uh, heterogeneity, heterogeneity across racial groups for concentration, rent burden, and the opportunity models that, I, that I've been showing you. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vicky, and um, it's great to be here with so many people that are so uh, uh, such experts on this issue, so many smart people in the room. Um, I also always appreciate being invited to something where I have a deadline to actually write a paper, um, so I'm grateful for that. And I just also want to thank my co-author, um, Dr. Miriam Zook, who's back in Berkeley with her twins. Um, Okay, so this, this work um, on early warning systems actually comes out of our own research um, that we uh, publicized online uh, last year, and you can go to the website urbandisplacement.org, um, and as we, we put this up because, um, as I'll talk about in a bit, a demand from the community um, to, to have a tool that they could use online, um, and um, but originally we had no intent to do this, it was a, it was a larger um, study, um, and so I got interested in who else was putting these up online and what was the history of these, and and digging into this, um, I found that it actually goes back about 30 years. And if you remember, actually, I think the, the original term, early warning system, was coined by the Center for Neighborhood Technology in Chicago, which was looking at um, decline and um, abandonment um, and, and, and developed a set of indicators um, to, to see where to warn uh, communities um, and the city that uh, the, the, the change was happening. And there were similar systems in, in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and Minneapolis. Interestingly, none of them exist today. Um, so we can talk about that too. Um, so thinking about this in context, there's been an explosion of literature about uh, GIS and the use of GIS. And the early kind of take on it was that this is a movement to democratize data and uh, going to empower communities through public participation in GIS. Um, and then came a literature on, on critical GIS, uh, pointing out that it's quite easy to lie with maps. Um, and and uh, I think the biggest gap, though, in the literature is that we still don't really understand how people use maps and then how that actually affects policy making and policy decisions on the ground. So that's where I'm trying to contribute here. Um, so the, there is a new generation of neighborhood early warning systems, um, and they, these are mostly focused on gentrification um, and uh, neighborhood change um, that is, is uh, re reflected in, in upgrading, uh, much more than decline. Um, and this is partly because of where we are in the real estate cycle. It's partly uh, because of the affordability crisis. Um, and then we're also, I think, seeing these uh, put online because uh, of a movement towards smart cities. And, and this movement has not really been integrated with the smart cities movement, which is much more focused on operational efficiency of cities. Um, but that's uh, probably or hopefully where the, the movement is headed. So for this uh, paper, we, we surveyed the landscape of these uh, toolkits. We First, we did an assessment online of what was out there. What are all the interfaces you see online that talk about neighborhood change? And, and we came up with three different types, the neighborhood indicator types of sites, um, those that were mapping opportunity. That's the, a lot of the most recent ones are, are doing this, um, led by the Kirwan Institute and HUD, of course. Um, and then those that were looking specifically at racial and economic change um, over uh, over the decades. Um, we found um, 24 of these sites. I don't claim that that is the authentic number uh, because it's actually possible to scan uh, for, for years um, and come up with a lot more. But uh, it's, a, it's a start of an inventory. 
Um, then we looked specifically at the ones uh, that could be characterized as early warning systems for neighborhood change, um, focused specifically on gentrification. And we found 11 um, of these. Um, not all are online, actually. Some are, are done in reports um, that reside online. Some are more interactive uh, maps. So um, I was fortunate to be able to do interviews with the creators of all of these. Um, so much fun talking to a, a set of data geeks, um, some of whom are in the room. Um, and uh, was able to draw some conclusions about what they were uh, trying to do and what their impact was. So let me show you a couple of these, and you may have seen them. This is um, Lisa Bates' work in Portland, uh, which is uh, publicized. It's actually the newspaper, uh, the Oregonian, put it on online. Um, and um, the uh, contribution here, I think, that is it was is most important um, is that Lisa divided gentrification into stages and characterized neighborhoods um, as being in uh, very early stages um, to very late advanced um, um, gentrification. And, and this was the, this allowed um, then people to think about what would be the policy remedy that would be best for the, for the stage of gentrification that I'm in. So it was a great contribution. Here's another one in, in Chicago, which uh, used a gentrification score um, for the neighborhoods. Green is the gentrifying areas. Um, here's another type of site. I didn't actually look at these, but you see these sites, um, actually real estate sites. This one's powered by Zillow and um, in more looking at where can we invest um, kind of thing. And this is for a broad audience, not just of community development folks, but um, obviously real estate investors um, too. Okay, so I found three kinds of uses uh, of these sites. Um, and the first was a strategic kind of use. And so this is the idea that we can use these tools to bring attention to an imminent problem. Um, and we can target our resources um, through them. Um, so here's a, a quote from, from the analysis that went on in Houston. It was a strategically placed piece of analysis, not a distraction, not something that came out of Washington, DC, saying, this is what y'all ought to do because that would have been suicidal. So that, that actually made it work, um, having it uh, be a local analysis um, placed um, in the, for, for community organizations to use. Um, and then others talked about targeting resources. So in Minneapolis, um, they spoke about the housing market uh, index um, and um, basically having to help uh, cities make choices uh, between whether to invest, invest in this neighborhood or that, um, and this was very helpful for that. Now, others uh, are using their sites for more tactical kinds of use, and this is about kind of sparking a conversation or um, pointing to solutions. Um, around a region. So here are some examples. Um, you could see a use of it for validation. In the Portland case, um, they, the Urban League was very grateful for, for Bates's work. Um, what it said to them, uh, what they could do was say that, uh, tell the government, this thing we told you was happening has happened. It's real. It's in the data. <laughs> um, and that, that voice suddenly got heard and legitimized, um, in Portland. Another thing it's doing is is raising awareness of housing out issues outside of the urban core. And we found this particularly in the early warning systems that are regional in scale. So in Seattle, um, this they had a typology exercise characterizing the markets in places. And this helped to persuade um, uh, folks that affordable housing was a need in, in places that didn't think they actually needed it. And um, it sort of countered the, countered the community arguments um, that we should be using the space for for parks um, and showed that affordable housing was a need. Um, in the Twin Cities, um, they talked about how um, the suburbs just had no clue about the new demand for space in the cities, and they were still building like crazy on the urban fringe. Um, and he characterized the, the cities as kind of driving down the road using your rear view mirror and all this demographic change in front of you, you're going to end up in the ditch. Um, and so the, the maps in the, those cases, um, the, the gentrification index um, that they had developed um, is, is helping people see that that um, this change is actually happening right now in the Twin Cities. 
Um, and then finally, there's the use of these for empowerment. And we saw this in quite a few cases. Um, this is the, 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 the idea that, that your idea of gentrification is valid, that you are, uh, that also you can um, organize around it um, and, and you can build capacity in the neighborhood. So in St. Louis, we heard um, when, when they went out and talked about um, the revitalization in different neighborhoods, um, all these groups came out of the woodwork and um, sort of took credit. They were gratified for the work, they, they, uh, being identified as a rebound neighborhood, and, and, and they could organize around that concept. Um, in Chicago, the tools being used for capacity building. So um, the university goes and talks about the toolkit, and um, it shows people how different different types of tools will be right for their neighborhood. In our case, um, again, we were doing a larger study um, for the California Air Resources Board looking at um, methodologies um, to analyze displacement to modify the um, metropolitan planning organizations, the, the regional transportation planning and transportation modeling tools, um, and then uh, uh, decided to do this as a sideline. Um, and one of the things in our case, um, one of the th uh, points we did that I think helped our argument was that we, we made an analytical distinction between gentrification and displacement. And this helped, I think, um, communicate what was going on um, in, in a um, clearer way to the community groups. So we talked about gentrification as being new investment, uh, new capital flows, new residents with higher income and education. This may or may not result in displacement. And then we talked separately about displacement when a household moves, when it uh, was forced out for reasons beyond their control. And um, what we found in our, both in our quantitative and qualitative research is that this kind of displacement was occurring not just in the gentrifying neighborhoods, but in the ones that hadn't gentrified yet, so that you could actually think of displacement as a precursor to gentrification just as much as you could think of gentrification causing displacement. So in any case, we operationalized um, gentrification uh, you know, with the census data and with real estate data um, and displacement with data on household mobility um, and uh, then combined both uh, into our indicators. Um, we used a mixed methods uh, approach. We we, we layered many different types of data into our database, and most importantly, we vetted everything with community-based organizations. Uh, we were actually forced to uh, by MTC, who had a uh, our, our client who had a HUD SCI grant, um, and needed to do this participatory component. So we uh, every classification that we came up with uh, for neighborhoods were actually uh, vetted, which was a really uh, a, a great learning process for us. Um, so our um, you. You can see this on our website, but one of our indicators um, for displacement was change in low-income households. Um, another is the loss of naturally affordable housing. The areas in red and orange are the ones uh, where you're losing that kind of trickle-down affordable stock. It's being disrupted and tripling, trickling up uh, instead to, to higher-income households. Um, and we used the, the displacement and plus uh, the data on gentrification to come up with this typology. Um, the punchline here being that we found displacement happening in both low-income neighborhoods and moderate and high-income neighborhoods, there, which are the areas in orange. Um, and we found that actually half, about half of all households were at risk of gentrification and displacement. So how predictive are these models anyway? So we could take our data, we could compare that what we said uh, in the 90s, using our 90s data, what was going to happen in, in 2000s, um, and to see whether our predictions came true, that if you were at risk for gentrification, did gentrification actually happen in the subsequent decade? So um, the right-hand column there is the ones that actually uh, did experience um, uh, gentrification. So the good news is we predicted about 86% of the ones that gentrified, so we were very happy about that. I'm less happy about the, the column on the left, um, which are the ones that we predicted to gentrify that didn't. Um, so, um, so this is the mystery with these things, and we actually found um, a couple cases where you had this kind of overprediction, like we had, and then we had a, found a couple cases where there was actually underprediction. So that's a, a weakness in these models. Um, but one of my interviewees pointed out that maybe we don't need prediction anyway. Maybe what we actually need is to use these 
as a wake up call. And again, just to have people be aware that they're at a particular stage of gentrification and to think about policy, which is the point I'm going to wrap up with. Um, so when I think about anti-displacement policy and my team has worked on developing a kind of way of thinking about it, um, we start with this very short term legal remedies, saving building by building, tenant by tenant. Um, we go to the mid range policies, um, which are citywide uh, regulations like preserving SROs, uh, condo conversion restrictions, etc. Um, and then we go to the very long term, the planning rem remedies, which is 20 or 30 years out. And there's a lot of different tools that planners can use, including zoning and value capture, um, etc. Um, and um, so this is my laundry list. And um, I use it to say, you know, this problem is kind of like climate change. Um, you, it's a, it's a very large problem. It has, you need to act at, at, at various levels. You need to act in the short term and the long term simultaneously. Um, and, um, you need to actually do everything. You can't just say, Oh, let's do solar energy. I don't think we need wind energy or geothermal. Um, so, uh, you know, we, and we don't have those debates like that. You know, we have production camps and we have preservation camps. Um, and, uh, they tend to be, um, opposed, um, often on what the solution should be. But we probably need to do all of these. Now, the question that I always get asked is, okay, what should we do where? Um, and so then that caused us to, uh, put up a, a policy inventory online, which interestingly, um, set off a kind of a race to the top competition among uh, cities in the Bay Area. So this was our inventory. We took that list of policies. We, we listed who who had what, um, and the cities could kind of look at it and say, oh my gosh, San Mateo has that. Why don't we have that here in Redwood City? Um, and so we've had that kind of policy impact with our site. We did a survey um, of what they were using it for. Um, we found that people were using it to write public policy. We, we it was uh, it, Our study is part now of the San Francisco interim mission controls. Every developer that wants to build in the mission has to read our study first and say whether they're going to displace anybody. Um, <laughs> so then um, there, the policy inventory has been used to pass uh, anti-displacement policies. And the MTC is thinking about doing a more uh, stringent anti-displacement targets in its next long range plan. Okay, so where does this leave us in the future? And here I want to draw from from a terrific uh, paper that's just about to come out from the Urban Institute um, by Kathy Pettit and Solomon Green, um, and they uh, point out that these um, these toolkits, these early warning systems, have terrific potential um, to actually uh, help help city leaders and community groups intervene and um, direct neighborhood changes towards more inclusive outcomes. And so the, the question is, how do we get the smart cities movement to kind of adopt the early warning systems? Um, so there are really two paths that we could take at this point. We could either kind of get the smart cities folks to realize that the, that equity and inclusion is actually part of um, efficiency um, and improve these models so they can actually do a useful prediction. Or perhaps we'll just keep them as a wake-up call. <laughs> and uh, they seem to work pretty well that way, too. So I'll conclude on that. And now we have Jeff Nivelle, who is the Director of Housing and Community Initiatives at Act Associates. So um, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm uh, happy to be on a research panel, but I will confess that this is uh, probably not research uh, in the sense that uh, you all think of it. It's more of a policy analysis. So um, my uh, apologies and caveats in advance. Um, what, what I've tried to do here is, is develop a framework for thinking about what are the policies you want to put in place to try to deal with gentrification in the event that you either have it or are thinking it's coming to a particular neighborhood? And, and really quickly, my, my take on this is, in general, is um, I think we, have, uh, we are at a really critical inflection point. Um, it, we have a once-in-a-generation opportunity to shape the way our cities grow 
in response to these really interesting and important demographic changes. And in this case, policy really matters. If we put the right policy in place, we have the opportunity, as Secretary O'Regan said, to really use this change as a positive force to increase the diversity of our communities um, and, and to, I think, revitalize our cities in, in a way that leads to more equitable and positive outcomes. If we don't have the right policies in place, and I will tell you right now, we don't right now, then what we, what we will end up with is um, resegregation and uh, displacement. And I think a lot of things that both fall short of the potential for good, but also actually lead in, in, to a lot of inequity. Um, so policy matters. Now, what, what is the policy you need to adopt? Um, a couple of key attributes. First of all, uh, and I'm gonna echo, echo some things that Karen just talked about. Uh, it has to be multi-pronged. There's not a single magic bullet of one thing that you need to do tomorrow. Unfortunately, there are 20 things and you need to do most of them or all of them. Secondly, it needs to be interagency. Um, it's, it's not just something the housing department can solve on its own. It's not something the planning commission or the zoning commission can solve on their own. Um, it, it really requires uh, 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 the, the building and permitting departments, a lot of part departments. Um, it is gonna require money. It's gonna require subsidy. But the good news is there are a lot of things that cities can do without subsidy, um, and there are ways they can use existing subsidy effectively. Uh, and there are also ways to raise a, a subsidy that does not necessarily require appropriation of funds. Um, and finally, I would argue that, that you know, if you're dealing with gentrification, as opposed to the broader affordability trends that, that Secretary O'Regan talked about, you really do need to have a, a, a strategy that's targeted on specific neighborhoods, right? Uh, you can't just focus on the overall supply, all that's important. You have to think about what's happening in particular neighborhoods. Lots of headwinds here. I list some of them. Political will. My, my uh, prior hypothesis here is that you don't generate the political will until it's too late to actually do something to solve your problem. So we have to figure out how to get ahead of that curve. Um, lack of interagency cooperation. Uh, not in my backyard. We have state law uh, uh, that backs it head to headwinds too. Um, so I, I have six categories of things. Um, I believe this is not a, a laundry list in the sense that you um, can pick and choose. I think you pretty much need to do something in all six of these buckets. Uh, and I'm going to walk through them. I'm not saying you need to adopt every single policy, and there's certainly some that aren't on here. But, if, but you really do need to be operating on multiple cylinders at the same time. Um, and the first thing you need to do is think about how do you preserve the existing uh, uh, affordable housing that you already have in the community. And I divide that into three categories. There's subsidized rental housing, um, there's unsubsidized but affordable housing, uh, uh, and there's public housing. Uh, the challenges are somewhat different and the opportunities and levers are somewhat different in each of these categories. The big challenges in um, subsidized rental housing are on the one hand that owners may choose to opt out or prepay their mortgages that gets them out of their restrictions, right? Because they can make more money. Uh, on the other hand, uh, their buildings may deteriorate physically. Right? So you have to deal with these two things at the same time. There are a host of uh, interventions that have been developed. Uh, uh, there's been a lot written on it. The MacArthur Foundation had a major uh, initiative focused on that. They involve trying to catalog the existing uh, uh, subsidized stocks and really understanding the circumstances of each building so you can really uh, uh, prioritize and figure out where do you need to start first. It involves the targeting of existing resources to provide subsidy that's needed to uh, deal with the backlog of, uh, of, of physical challenges and to refinance these um, uh, and to resubsidize in some case through the through low income housing tax credits, their tax incentives. Um, in some cases, the owners of these properties are no longer committed to maintaining them as affordable. They're just kind of riding out uh, uh, sort of tax shelters that were entered into many, many years ago. So you need to think about finding mission driven owners that can take over these properties. Um, on the unsubsidized side, um, it's true that this uh, is the bulk of our affordable housing stock. Unfortunately, there are a lot fewer levers for operating here. It's a lot more difficult. doesn't mean you should give up. But uh, in a lot of cases, the th kinds of things you can do are, are tax incentives that might buy you 10 years or 20 years. I think of this as bridge remedies because eventually those, you, know, you can't just keep subsidizing these forever. You, but you can bring some of these that are strategically important into subsidy programs through low-income housing tax credits, 
Uh, there is some interesting work going on now uh, 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 that's led by the Housing Partnership Network to set up a REIT that would actually provide financing to acquire B-class properties in uh, promising neighborhoods and hold them as affordable. I think that's really interesting. Uh, um, and then the third category is public housing. And, uh, and here, RAD is really, you know, an extremely important uh, vehicle. But I think pr public housing tends to get forgotten when we talk about preservation. I think this is a mistake. Here, the big issue is deterior deterioration. We need to find ways to allow public housing to play more effectively with the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. That's a big part of what of, of, about what RAD does. Um, now, protection. Uh, by protection here, I mean um, how do we protect the existing residents from uh, basically having to move before they're ready to do so? Uh, I, I think we have a tendency to say oh, oh, moving is bad. I don't think moving is always bad. There are good moves and there are bad moves. The key is to give people greater choice over whether and under what circumstances to move. It's a little more nuanced than we, and, and unfortunately, it's harder to measure. And this is a plug for we need to figure out how to measure that more effectively so we can separate positive moves from negative moves. Um, some of the strategies that are used to give people increased choice are protections for when they're in rental buildings that turn into condos, rent stabilization, uh, policies that basically say that once you start, uh, uh, your rent can only go up by a certain amount every year. Uh, um, and then when you leave, it can float to market, right? So, but it's at least giving you some stability while you're living there. Good cause eviction policies that prevent landlords from pushing people out uh, uh, just so they can bring in someone at a higher higher rent. It, and this is a very important uh, uh, parallel with rent stabilization. They need to go together. Uh, let's think about owners too. We should remember there are a lot of low income and minority owners in these communities whose property taxes go up at, uh, as property values go up and they may need help affording their property taxes, or there are circuit breakers. And then we can give uh, renters the opportunity to buy into their neighborhood uh, with various shared equity home ownership strategies, with uh, the ability to use housing choice vouchers for home ownership, uh, and a num number of other things. Um, the third um, piece here is inclusion. This is ensuring that a share of new development is affordable to uh, low and moderate income households. Uh, you only need to look to what New York City has done uh, just in the last few months, thank, uh, under Vicky's leadership, to really see a, a, a extremely robust uh, policy that was um, very heavily debated and unfortunately uh, successful. I believe 25 to 30 percent of uh, newly developed units in areas that have experienced upzonings, either pri through private requests or through rezonings, are going to be uh, at affordable levels, which is a very high uh, level. It's mandatory. Um, there are also voluntary policies you can adopt, uh, density bonuses. That they tend to get a bad rap. Uh, people say they're not as effective as, as mandatory. I, I think a lot of the issue is that, that the incentives need to be effective, right? If you put in lousy incentives, they're not going to be effective. You, if you put in really robust incentives where you'd have to be crazy not to do it, I, I think they tend to be more effective. But you have to have zoning that accommodates the incentives. That's one of the things I know New York City had a, had, had a challenge with. Uh, and then there are these policies that you put in place where you say, look, your baseline uh, you know, density is X, but if you uh, come in for a rezoning, if you come in for a variance or a special unit per uh, permit, we're going to require a certain level of affordability. I, I call that quasi-voluntary. Maybe there's no another term for it. Um, so the fourth category is revenue generation. This is um, where uh, it's really important to think about how do you actually um, capture some of the increased value associated with rising property values to generate funding for affordable housing. So um, linkage fees is one where you charge a fee to commercial development. Um, there are also fees that are sometimes charged, impact fees that are charged on new housing development. Um, there are housing trust funds like real estate transfer taxes and recording fees. All of these are ways to essentially capitalize on the increased market activity and the pr increased property values uh, to generate funding for affordable housing. Uh, tax increment financing is sometimes used in this manner. It's a little bit tricky because um, typically uh, tax increment financing is only uh, allowed in, in neighborhoods that start out with a certain level of distress. Um, so it, it partly depends on when the um, TIF was set up relative to the gentrification cycle. It may also depend on the level of state law. But there's some really interesting policies that use TIF-like structures like in Austin where it doesn't actually depend on a baseline level of, of distress, but simply says, look, let's capture a share of the increased market value for affordable housing. Um, 
So uh, very important things. And, and a lot, all of these, by the way, are things that they, you can do without actually having to uh, appropriate funds. Um, so incentives, um, I don't have a lot of time, so you know about incentives. Uh, um, you've got the tax code, tax abatements, tax credits, reduced parking requirements. You can expedite the permitting of affordable units. Um, you can reduce impact fees for affordable developments. Uh, transfer development rights is a complicated uh, strategy, but see, see Seattle for uh, an example of that. Uh, and then you can also take your existing federal, state, and local subsidies and just think about, okay, I'm going to, in allocating my home funds, in allocating my CDBG funds, I'm going to prioritize developments that meet this particular description, right, in order to help preserve and expand affordable housing in neighborhoods that are either gentrifying or subject to, to gentrification. Um, uh, the final category is property acquisition. Uh, this is really just thinking about how do we acquire the right to develop or to rehabilitate property. It can be a big challenge, obviously, particularly in areas that are gentrifying. This is why it's so important to get ahead of the cycle and to, and to, and to figure out how to implement these strategies early before things are really expensive. Of course, that increases risk, right, because you don't know the direction. And as uh, Karen pointed out, sometimes we get it wrong in our predictions. Uh, um, but, you know, you can use... Um, there are, so there are a number of models of acquisition funds. Take a look at what's going on in the Bay Area, in New York City, and in Denver are, are three good examples. Um, but you can also use publicly owned land. You've got surplus land. You have land that, that may be underdeveloped, right? You might have a one-story uh, police station with a big parking lot, and the, the neighborhood is changing. It's more dense. You can redevelop that. You can build your uh, uh, police station and put housing above it, right? Or you can uh, rehabilitate the land next to it. Um, so my final slide, do I have one minute, um, is just to deal with a couple of cross-cutting issues. And these are, I think, really, really important. So the first one is obvious, but it's, I, I can't emphasize it's enough. You have to get ahead of this curve if you want to uh, uh, be able to solve this problem efficiently. That means looking ahead and not looking in the rearview mirror. It's hard to do, but it's extremely important because by the, if you wait until the problem is robust and statistically significant to all specifications, it's going to be twice as expensive to solve at that point. So you have to get ahead of the curve. Second is you have to build in long-term affordability. Too many of our early housing programs focused on creating affordability for 15 years, even 20 years. It sounds like a long time, but you know what? It's not a long time. And if it's in a gentrifying neighborhood, what's going to happen to the property values over time, right? People are going, to, are, you know, are going to cash out and make a lot of money. They're not going to preserve it as affordability. We should be trying to, to, to preserve affordability for the longest possible time, ideally in perpetuity, right? And that means we have to go above and beyond the federal minimums. The home program requires affordability for only 15 or 20 years. You need to go above and beyond that. And the problem is a lot of communities look at the federal requirements and say, well, we're, we're following the law. Why isn't that enough? And the answer is it's not going to solve your problem over the long term. And it's not actually a very cost effective strategy because why not buy 99 years of affordability rather than 15 years for almost the same amount of money? We need to be thinking about increasing density, right? We need to increase supply. We need to reduce barriers to development. These are important strategies for the market as a whole as well as for the neighborhoods that we're talking about. The problem is that you can't rely on simply increasing supply overall in the market to solve your problem in your gentrifying neighborhoods, right? Because we all know that when there's pent up demand, the first part of that demand that's gonna get satisfied is from the highest end, the most profitable to serve. So um, you need to combine market-wide increases in density and, re and reduction in barriers to development so we have more supply, taking some of the pressure off, with very neighborhood-specific strategy focused on, on the neighborhoods uh, that are at risk of gentrification. And the final thing to do, as if you don't have enough to do already, is uh, uh, we, we, you got to bring the public along with you. You know, you can't just sort of uh, legislate this stuff from the top. you got to really be consulting residents, interacting with residents, dr bringing residents together, listening to them, and, and developing a solution that really works for everybody. Um, and, you know, ironically, we have cases where affordable housing is opposed by some of the most liberal people who are moving in who want to create the perfect neighborhood. We also, though, have uh, development that's being opposed by the long-term residents who could, who could actually benefit from the affordable housing. And a lot of this is just caused, I think, caused in part by 
not taking the time to really understand each other and to listen and to kind of bring everybody along. So just a, a, a small menu, uh, sort of menu of things uh, to hopefully make a dent in this challenge. Thank you, Jeff. Now, we're very lucky to have uh, Paul Jargowski, who is a professor of public policy and director of the Center for Urban Research and Education at Rutgers University in Camden, to comment on these four wonderful papers. Great. Uh, first, I, I want to thank uh, the Furman Center and the Philadelphia Fed for organizing this conference. Uh, it's been such a rich day already, and these papers are, are fabulous and uh, chock full of, of interesting information. I feel like I've just taken a graduate class in gentrification. Uh, and I just hope I can pass the final exam. Uh, so uh, the other thing is that uh, I, I started, I wrote up some comments last night, which I've now scribbled on so much that I'm sort of <laughs> have redone them completely. But uh, I, my, I started out with a brilliant idea that I was going to start my remarks by saying, so is gentrification good or bad? <laughs> but apparently, <laughs> uh, uh, Teresa's 15-year-old beat me to that line. Um, but yet I do think it's, it's an excellent question. And... Um, uh, one of the, um, for, you know, I just think about it this way. I mean, Bill Wilson years ago said, uh, talked about the fact that the black middle class moved out of, of poor neighborhoods in Chicago and left the poor behind. And then those neighborhoods had social isolation and concentration effects. And so that was bad for poor people. And now we have poor, uh, middle class moving back into those neighborhoods. And again, somehow it's bad for poor people. So how could it be bad both ways, right? There's got, to, there's some issues there. Well, um, I mean, that's, that's kind of the question. There are, there are the goods and the bads. And some of the earlier papers, uh, on this panel and the earlier ones talked about, you know, the sort of the, obviously the, the displacement possibilities. But then there's the good things like more jobs in the neighborhood and, and maybe better schooling if there's more uh, middle class people advocating for the schools. Maybe the police come a little quicker when they get called in a neighborhood where there are middle class people. There are all kinds of benefits and also costs. And, and so, um, so partly the, the question is, uh, how, how do we, how do we um, uh, sort of fund ways to, to intervene in this process so that we uh, re, um, continue to get the benefits to, to these inner city neighborhoods and yet reduce some of those costs? Uh, I am... Uh, I was thinking earlier about this, this question of how we define um, gentrification. And uh, Lubell's paper, he says um, uh, that it's an increase in rents and house values associated with a significant influx of higher income persons. Uh, so, but I want to go a little bit deeper than that um, and think about it this way. Uh, it, it, and, and Eric Belsky, I think, mentioned this this morning. In any neighborhood, just a baseline level, you have people coming and going all the time. And so you have some high-income people moving in, perhaps, and some high-income people moving out, and some low-income people moving in, and some low-income people moving out. And if those things are all balanced, you have a steady state. Uh, so, but um, then you can have a situation uh, where things start to change. You know, for example, you could see uh, ha uh, high-income people enter at a higher rate, which would drive rents up and then would be followed by uh, lower income people exiting at a higher rate, an excess rate over what they were, how they exited previously. And that would be the kind of classic thing that we picture in our minds as gentrification uh, leading to displacement. But you could also see um, uh, higher income entry, uh, rents increasing perhaps as a result, uh, and then no actual increased exit of low-income people, but as low-income people exit naturally, those units are upgraded, rehabbed, and so the low-income entries are no longer uh, as high as they were. And now, that's not a case. That's not going to be displacement, you know, in the way we were thinking about it. But it's it will still have the same sort of cross-sectionally looking at the data. It will look the same, uh, but but it's a whole different problem, and it, it has to do with the with the loss of the affordable stock in that in that neighborhood. You might also see. Um, exits by both low-income and high-income people to a place where the neighborhood is largely abandoned, uh, like Camden. <laughs> and um, and uh, 20 years ago, perhaps, my neighborhood of Northern Liberty here in Philadelphia, uh, followed by, uh, with, in this case, because of, in Philadelphia's case, because of tax breaks, rehabs, and new construction in that neighborhood, leading rents to, to increase and high-income people entering. No displacement at all, at least not at first. I think Northern Liberty has now gone so far that it, it's going to start resulting in displacement. But so you can have you can have all the, all three of those scenarios. I think people would describe as gentrification 
and yet they have uh, different causes. So Jeffrey Lin said we have to get into a finer grain uh, analysis to see what came first. So I think the sequence of these things, which, which changed first, the high income entries, the low income uh, entries, the exits, you know, who, who was moving? And just high income and low income is a little too simple. Um, we could do high, middle, and low income, white, black, and Hispanic, hipster and non-hipster, and get the entry and exit rates for all those groups, and it gets more complicated. But I think we need to think about that as, as um, kind of a framework for understanding the causes and the consequences of the gentrification. So um, I think that the most significant problem that we might think about from a policy point of view is when we do have that increase in the exit rate that uh, reflects an involuntary uh, increase in the exit rate. Um, you might have a voluntary increase in the exit rate if people who were homeowners find that their, their home values increase and they can you know, cash in uh, and move to a, a different location. Uh, but you really are we really much more concerned with those people who are, are forced out. So it's the increase in uh, exits uh, of low-income people that are um, above and beyond the um, baseline rate, and, and particularly if they're involuntary. So all that's very hard to measure with census data that's not longitudinal, and it only gives you net flows rather than the sort of the separate components of it. But but I think we should, even if we can't do that exactly the way we'd like to, we should think about it that way and try to get as close to it as we can. So um, uh, uh, so I'm going to talk first about the, the, the Chapel and Zuck paper, talking about early warning systems. And I thought you were um, more um, uh, positive about them in your presentation than, in, than the paper itself. Uh, and, you know, but some of the questions that, that um, uh, you do address in, in the paper are, you know, what are they warning of? Who is being warned? And... You know, what, what do you do with this warning when you get it? Uh, and uh, all of those things um, uh, are uh, questions that when you look at the variety of different things that have been tried, they clearly don't all support different uses equally. Um, there was also, I mean, I thought a, sort of a, a slightly um, a note in there that um, seemed like a little bit out of place in the paper and um, uh, kind of this Marxist critique of mapping. <laughs> so, that, <laughs> That I would say. So I wore my map, my tie with maps on it because I want to defend mapping a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I don't think we have to worry too much about um, the the, the uh, hegemony of the elites using mapping to to control development too much because these 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 websites and so forth haven't really had that much impact overall. Um, and secondly, I think it's 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 just as easy, in fact, easier probably to lie with regressions and cost-benefit analysis <laughs> as with maps, right? So, uh, in defense of mapping. Um, uh, you mentioned that the, the prior efforts at this kind of exercise, uh, which were mostly looking at neighborhood decline, uh, many of them have disappeared, and uh, what could be regarded in some ways as an exercise in, in uh, futility. Um, and, you know, what, and some of the same difficulties may affect the current efforts, uh, so, like, what, what are these difficulties that, 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 that hamper these efforts? Well, one is that when you build these, these kind of data warehouses, um, uh, they're, they're sort of obsolete by the time the, the ink is dry, or, or um, I guess their websites by the time the electrons are dry. Uh, and uh, that then there's also kind of weakness in our funding mechanisms, because lots of foundations and so forth love to build something new. Okay, and so they'll give you money to build a, a data warehouse or, or an early warning system. But then when you have to keep funding it every year just to update it, that's not very sexy. And it's very hard to fund that kind of ongoing uh, ma maintenance of, of that kind of a system. Uh, so that's, that, that, that's an inherent problem, I think. Uh, and the other thing is that when there is some uh, uncertainty about what exactly it's for and who's going to use it and what you're even looking for, um, it's hard to develop a parsimonious set of, of data elements um, and and uh, what we end up with is uh, sort of a, a huge number of elements that's hard to keep current and that's hard for a, a typical user rather than a sophisticated user to be able to, um, to maintain. And again, we don't have that kind of uh, gross movements. We only have the net flows for many things and it's not longitudinal data, so it's, it's kind of tough. I mean, if I really wanted to know where things were gentrifying in, in a city, the first thing I would do is call a couple of real estate agents and they would probably know. Uh, and they could tell me where the hipsters were, too. I mean, just they, they have that kind of, that's what they, they, they engage in. So that's not to say these systems don't have uses. They're very useful for people who want to study what's happening. 
the, uh, the, 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 the kind of the uses of um, validation and so forth, I, I like the quote that you actually also mentioned um, that the, uh, Ur, I think it was the Urban League said, see this thing we told you was happening? Has happened. It's real. It's in the data. So they already knew it was happening. They, the, the system was not an early warning. It was actually late. It came afterwards. But it was still useful because it helped them politically to make whatever case they wanted to make. So, and you also noted that the, that the prediction um, capacity was sort of weak. So um, I, I think that those systems have, have good, good uses for validation, maybe empowerment of community groups. But, but sort of being an early warning system per se is probably not the best uh, uh, use of them. Um, to talk, um, to move to the um, uh, Dastrup and Ellen paper, um, you, uh, you said New York City was the perfect place to study. Actually, New York City is kind of unique. <laughs> so it's a really good if you want to study New York. It's not necessarily <laughs> applicable to a lot of the country, but, which is not, you know, not a bad thing. But, but, you know, you have most public housing residents there in, embedded in better neighborhoods, and I think that's probably pretty uh, not atypical. Um, I thought it was interesting... Um, and thinking about the policies, which is where this panel ends up, um, that public housing really is the ultimate mechanism for protecting residents from gentrification. Because, uh, you know, even if um, they're held harmless effectively for whatever the income uh, rent increase is in the neighborhood, and even if their own income increases, which it did in, in, in those neighborhoods, um, if, they, if their income increases 10%, then their rent increases 10%. So it's a pretty, a pretty good protection mechanism. Uh, I think that... Um, uh, and that gets to the, the protection policy that that uh, uh, we, we were that Lubell talked about. But um, uh, the, the interesting thing is that uh, those people in those neighborhoods, and again, we don't know for sure that it's causal, but um, they have higher incomes than those who lived in neighborhoods, the public housing neighborhoods that were in the middle of not uh, neighborhoods that weren't gentrifying. Um, but that, that is not surprising. After all, there are more people, there are more jobs, probably more, uh, more uh, uh, places for uh, them to generate income. And that could go away if the economy changed. But what was interesting was that the findings in education, that people in those housing projects that were in those improving or, 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 or better off neighborhoods in the public housing projects um, got more education. And that's more of a permanent change. So I think that's one of the more significant findings in that paper that I, that I think is very w much worth noting. Uh, and then also the point that the long-term effects uh, may, for the children growing up in those neighborhoods may be significantly more than for the current residents, as we see in the paper by Raj Chetty looking at the MTO uh, project. So all of that's a, a good news, I think. Uh, turning to the uh, paper that Gerard uh, des described, uh, uh, about the uh, voucher holders, and um, this this is that's a bit of a puzzle in this paper as I was looking at it, um, and I wonder maybe you could explain this to me later. But uh, Table One shows that um, rents increased between 2006 and 2013, and it also shows that the mobility of voucher holders decreased by about three percentage points from 12 to nine over that period. Um, and then in the regressions, however, you show that rent increases increase um, the um, uh, uh, mobility. And I understand that the regression controls for a lot of things, so that's probably it. But it's sort of interesting that there is this difference, and I wonder if you've explored that a little bit and, and have a good feeling for why that flipped when you did the regressions. Uh, I mean, you do have fixed effects by uh, year and MSA, which is a very strong design and controls for many things. So that's probably what it's all about. Um, one thing that um, is interesting is that uh, when that households in general uh, had moved in uh, more in response to unemployment, so they were either being displaced or evicted because they were unemployed, or they were moving to seek uh, better op employment opportunities. And I'm not sure which it is, and they have very different implications. Whereas voucher holders were not. So depending on whether you think those moves were adaptive or um, reactive. You might think that voucher holders um, were protected from the unemployment changes, or you might think that they have inertia because they've got vouchers that are slowing them down from, from uh, pursuing better opportunities when th there's unemployment. So the question is, how do you interpret that? I don't think you don't, you don't really, in the paper, spell out whether you're looking at that as a positive or a negative, or at least spell out both possibilities. Um, the, the interesting finding in Table 6 about black, the black and Hispanic effect of rent increases being smaller than for whites um, is um, 
it makes me think that maybe it has to do with uh, racial segregation, that in those with the rents increasing in the metro area, which is what you look at, it may not be increasing in, in um, mostly black and mostly Hispanic neighborhoods, so that they're just not subject to it as much, which sort of raises another question for me, which is uh, I would wonder why you might not want to look at how people, voucher holders, responded to increases in the rents in their neighborhood, right? Because that's the one that they don't get protected from uh, because the, the standards are based on the metropolitan rents. So maybe maybe the, well, you didn't have the ability to do that in the, in the data that you have, but it was, certainly would be the next question I would want to look at. Um, and um, the finding that as rents rise, the voucher holders uh, were um, in lower poverty neighborhoods uh, again, that seems to be a protective effect. It might be a disequilibrium too. I mean, that might over time they might uh, end up uh, resorting again. So, in a, anyway, uh, again, very interesting paper. It makes you think about uh, all the ways, the different ways that these things interact. Um, and finally, um, talking about uh, the Lubell paper. This is a great catalog of all the possible. Well, and he went through quite a few of them, uh, speaking very fast, and, and it, was, it was terrific uh, because there's, there are so many things to do. And it made me think of, you did say that sort of targeting was important, but yet many of the policies you discussed, I don't think you actually have to target them to specific neighborhoods. So it makes me think that the that early warning policy might not be, um, early warning mechanisms might not be what we need. Uh, it's Maybe it's the wrong model because uh, that model says, okay, we figure out what neighborhoods are gentrifying and we try to intervene in that neighborhood based on what our early warning system is telling us. But that's really hard to do because, first of all, it does sort of, it's, it's a while before we see that, and then you have to design an intervention for that neighborhood, and then you have to justify why you're changing something in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood. And then you have the problem of, well, if you make it harder for people to, gen to build, you know, uh, gentrify houses in this neighborhood, they might go to a different neighborhood. I mean, Newark has benefited from, from New York being built out, right? So this, this stuff keeps, to, keeps flowing. Maybe what you really need is to think about policies that you can implement at a broader level uh, that that would um, that would not have to be targeted to specific neighborhoods and you, and you talked about a bunch of them um, uh, the in terms of protect protection in particular uh, the protection public housing was a protection vouchers were a protection you could think about um, uh, issues of where people uh, are protected from rent increases uh, above a certain percentage on, on a yearly basis, even homeowners, you could look at um, maybe having um, homeowners who've been in a place more than five years or more than seven years, you pick a number, uh, are uh, protected from passive increases in their housing value that weren't, that they didn't do any rehabbing, but the neighborhood was going up. And so maybe some percentage of that additional property tax could be uh, uh, eliminated or uh, somehow subsidized. Uh, so um, those are things you could do without having to specify or guess or predict what neighborhood those things were going to happen in. That could just be a policy that, that in places where it's happening, now that, that policy would apply. And if it's not happening, it's, it's, it doesn't have any effect. Uh, that would also be easier. It, it would be easier with a policy like that to get ahead of the curve because you wouldn't have to wait until you knew where things were happening. So... Um, uh, the other thing you talked about was uh, the, the protection, by the way, to fit it back into my earlier framework, the protection ideas are all ways to reduce the low-income exits, the excess low-income exits. The preservation uh, strategies and the inclusion strategies that you discussed are ways to enable or uh, protect the ability for low-income entries to continue to occur. So, again, it fits into that framework of looking at the sort of the, those entries and exits. So uh, all of that, I think, um, uh, is uh, ways in which we could address it. And um, I, I thought uh, that, uh, that that paper really spelled them out well. So I advise you to get a hold of all these papers and, and uh, read them all. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to all of our panelists. So we are open for questions. Yes.
curious if you had any other recommendations for policies for small mom and pops or just other policies outside of the housing building that could help low and moderate income people within the gentrified areas. No. <laughs> I, I, I wish I had. I, I, it's not. I really focused a lot on the housing, um, but it's a good question. Well, somebody mentioned, I think, with Eric this morning, the you know, SBA has got the 7A and the 504 loan guarantees, and the 504 allows businesses to buy real estate. So if you got a hair salon um, and you, it's in a gentrified area, that owner could actually, of the business, buy the property. Um, they might be able to build uh, a lot of equity um, and then maybe open up the next business. And for those of you who are in Washington, D.C., I'm sure you know Bus Boys and Poets. Well, Emmy mm -hmm. Duval's first Bus Boys and Poets was a 504 government guaranteed loan. And the property value escalated like crazy. And then he had collateral to build his empire all across Washington, D.C. So there is a way, um, which there are policies outside the housing domain to help. Sure. You know, Sure. You know, I would say also that the um, one challenge I know is sort of thinking about mixed use properties where there's both a residential and a non-residential component. And these tend to be challenging to finance for a variety of reasons. And, and uh, in some cases, there are federal policies that, that need to be adapted to different local circumstances. But in other cases, it's just um, it takes a lot of brain damage to figure out how to ma marry the two uses. So I would say figuring out a strategy for effect, you know, effectively and equitably financing mixed use development would be something that would be helpful. Yes, sir. Uh, on that note, uh, there are ways in which philanthropy can play a role there, where they're uh, sort of willing to accept some risk. We're, we're in Pittsburgh. We're starting to experiment with this in a in a few key places where, uh, where as a philanthropy, we're underwriting the, the cost of the commercial space. In a way that the uh, the benefits uh, in terms of um, red flow and a few other things that spin off from that thing uh, go to folks in the neighborhood. So for ourselves that work at the Times Endowments, uh, we're not looking at it as, a, as part of our investment strategy because we don't do that. But uh, some some other foundations in our town actually do uh, make mission related investments in in neighboring real estate, uh, and that's you know, that same scenario. But we're doing it to see that the, the Returns flow to folks of, in need in that neighborhood. So there's opportunities there. If I could just add to that, I think there's one caution, which is just importing the housing solutions into this world. So we often hear, let's let's have commercial rent control, right? And that opens up a whole set of issues. But the other thing is that um, in New York, we looked really hard at our zoning code and how our zoning code was limiting our ability to attract good commercial in those mixed use buildings and change the zoning code in a variety of ways to to try to do that. So, you know, it, the the mix between housing and non-housing gets complicated, but I, I think it can be done. One, one more thing, the, the, um, there are a, a lot of good examples uh, of philanthropy uh, participating in these acquisition funds. Mm -hmm. So, you know, New York City and I believe all three of them, San Francisco and Denver, there's all essentially philanthropic guarantees that are sort of in the first loss position or the second loss position just in a way that really helps bring in private capital behind them. Uh, tax incentives also often discourage some commercial. Right? So, for example, many tax incentives will exclude any commercial space from the tax incentive. And so that creates distortions as well. Other questions? Barika. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, sort of thinking about um, the, the spectrum that Karen put up in terms of incentives and then the things that, that um, Jeff went through, um, thinking about both the short term and the long term, and then also sort of the affordability spectrum, and then going back to, to um, Kathy O'Regan's comments, what are we thinking about in terms of policy solutions that focus on shorter term versus longer term versus po and policy solutions that focus on some of the deeper affordability levels um, that are very hard to reach given our current tools versus some of the other higher affordability levels that we have more tools in our toolkit for, given that I think oftentimes what we see is that's, that's the pressure point of when people feel like things are not working for them or are oppositional to what potentially is coming. 
Um, so the it, it, it's really challenging because these um, you know policies are organized in silos and advocacy is organized in silos and it's very hard to cut across. And um, the the best examples I've seen have been. Um, if you're familiar with, um, in the Bay Area, the Great Communities Collaborative, which is doing community organizing for long-term planning. So it's it's getting people on the ground kind of aware of station area plans that are 30 years out in the implementation. And, and so starting to kind of get folks on the ground to think um, longer term is, is a really important piece of the puzzle. I, I, I guess I would argue that um... I don't think there are policies that are shorter term and longer term. I think there are neighborhoods that are closer to needing help and further away from needing help. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think it would be a mistake to say, let's deal with the immediate protection issues now and worry about the inclusionary zoning later, right? Because if you do put the inclusionary requirement in after all the development has taken place, you get zero units, right? So you really have to put the whole framework in place at the outset, right? But you may be able to, and I, I, just, I mean, I agree with Paul to some extent that you, you can and should define citywide policies that apply everywhere. But, you know, when you think about prioritizing your limited resources, for example, of home dollars or CDBG dollars, you really do need to think at the neighborhood level. And, and you know, a lot of, uh, of cities don't plan at the neighborhood level. Uh, LA is, they're doing a very sort of very neighborhood specific, you know, it's a good example. So I, I do think you really need to have, uh, uh, be thinking about neighborhoods uh, uh, time-wise rather than policies. Um, in terms of deeper affordability, I mean, I think it's a really important and fair criticism that the framework that I put up there doesn't deal with the lowest income households, except to the extent that you are succeeding in preserving existing subsidized resources. And the reason is that the cities don't tend to have the level of resources that are needed really to reach down that, to that low in income level. This is really where the federal government comes in in providing Section 8 vouchers and public housing and, and project-based Section 8 other really deep subsidies. So one way to think about those is to think about these, how do you marry these together, right? How do you use the local policy framework to give you site control over a property and then layer a federal subsidy on top of that. So for example, in Montgomery County, Maryland, they have an inclusionary zoning policy um, that brings units down to a, a moderately affordable level, not deep affordability like 30% of AMI. But then the housing authority gets right a first refusal to purchase a, up to a third, I think, of those units. And so they buy those units and they use them as public housing, right? And so now you're sort of layering the subsidy on top of that. You can take project-based, you can take housing vouchers and you can attach them to specific structures as project-based vouchers. So I would love to say that cities could on their own solve this problem and, and, and you know, to the extent that they can and they have the resources, fabulous. It's just, it's gonna be really, really challenging. There is the, we didn't mention the Federal Housing Trust Fund, the National Housing Trust Fund. This is a new resource that is being made available uh, from the federal government. Uh, it's a sizable resource um, and it is targeted. 90% of the funds are supposed to go to people with uh, incomes below 30% of the area median income. Uh, and when the fund is below a certain point, I think it's 100%. So it's, it's really very, very deeply targeted on extremely low income people. So I would kind of pay attention to that. It's not enough, right? We need more, but I, you know, you got to make do with what you have. Great. Uh, okay, last question back here. Yes, uh, I, there's not been a mention of uh, building uh, quality or building uh, condition mm -hmm. yet today, and you know, it's probably because I'm from Baltimore. Most people have the education are stronger market uh, neighborhoods, but of course, in Baltimore. A lot of displacement is, oh, I had to move when the roof caved in. And, you know, that, that was an affordable house until mm -hmm. it wasn't a house anymore. And, uh, and also, what's identified here with Baltimore is where the land value is approaching zero, and, the, and, and there's enough money in the rent or home price to maintain the structure mm -hmm. and not to get up above it. So I'm just wondering if that's, I guess maybe it doesn't matter in New York because everything is pretty much occupied to start with, you know, it's much stronger. But I know in a lot of cities, the problem is more like Baltimore. Anyone? Well, certainly here in Philadelphia. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I, 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 it's so interesting because you go to, you know, this conversation and we're talking about gentrification and to a large extent we're talking, the paradigm here is Boston and San Francisco and Seattle and New York and Denver now and Portland. Um, but there's this whole other conversation, right, about Baltimore and Philadelphia and Cleveland and, and Detroit, and, and, and they cross over to some extent. There are individual neighborhoods in these places where you see, you know, but but I, I, I think this is why you really, uh, this is why local housing policy is so important because you really need to tailor the policy to the conditions, right? So in, in that case, I, I, I would say that's not really gentrification in the way that we're talking about it. But you really, you know, you have to thinking about using your housing dollars to preserve and expand uh, quality, right? You know, so you might look at a like a, a policy in Chicago, like the Class Nine tax incentive, which provides a, a tax incentive to landlords who agree to undertake certain improvements designed to deal with some of these housing quality challenges. But they then have to preserve affordability for some period of time. So there's a series of things, but it's a different set of policy solutions. You do have cities that combine both, and that's where the you know it becomes really challenging to figure out. And again, why sometimes you need a neighborhood specific policy, not just you know. Be, New York City probably still has neighborhoods right where where you've got these kinds of quality challenges, right? And Chicago is a great example of a blended community with both kinds of neighborhoods. But also, if I can just add to that, you may have um, deliberate pushing people out through, by letting the place yeah. fall apart. Right. Or right. we have had instances, unfortunately, in New York City where the owners actually destroyed um, mm -hmm. and ruined the building so that they could empty it out. And so, um, you know, it's a very mixed situation, right? And I always worry now being uh, in charge of this at HPD, I always worry about the use of building code violations because building code violations are unfortunately very tied to who complains, and who complains is very different in a gentrifying neighborhood than in a non-gentrifying neighborhood, right? And so we haven't sorted out how to really factor that into the analysis of where building code violations are found, right? Uh, could I add something on there? Uh, uh, New Jersey uh, has uh, recently enacted or given out $1.1 billion in tax breaks for companies to move to Camden, New Jersey. Uh, and uh, $1.1 billion, think about that for a minute. But none of those companies that are moving, including the Philadelphia 76ers moving their practice facility there, none of those companies are really required to hire Camden residents, and many, many of the Camden residents won't be able to be hired because they either have criminal records or they didn't graduate from high school or, or they don't have the right skill set. Um, I cal you know, it's, it's basically $50,000 per uh, family in Camden over the next 10 years. And you could imagine using some of that money, yeah, think about that. You could imagine using some of that money to help these, these uh, families bring their housing units up to code to invest in human capital, or they could have funded, uh, instead of the Philadelphia 76ers, uh, provided hundreds of, of kind of tax breaks to um, restaurants and beauty salons and uh, or backyard auto mechanic places where who people who actually hire Camden residents so in, in, a, in a market like like the one in Baltimore or Camden there's a different set of needs that uh, I think uh, we often fail to address in our public policies well thank you again uh, thank you again so much to the panel and, and to all of us. are we taking a break or, or so we'll take about a five minute stretch break um, please don't leave we have one more really engaging panel coming so take about five minutes <laughs>
So if you don't mind taking one last minute to finish up your conversations, grabbing some coffee uh, and some refreshments, we'll come back. Good afternoon. I think we're going to try and get started momentarily. Okay, so we're going to go ahead. That was the ruling of the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia. So as people are taking their seat, um, let me just it, spend a few moments introducing the panel and the panelists, and then I'm going to make a very brief presentation about what's going on um, in terms of measurement of the issue of gentrification in Philadelphia. And then we'll hear from a group of folks who are approaching the problem from one or another different perspective 
Um, but those prospectors are all um, uh, sort of focused on what are we going to do about this in one way or another. Just wh whatever the research says, what is it that we're going to do? So we heard a lot of presentations say we heard an awful lot of research, and um, I think we learned a bunch about gentrification. We heard discussions about what it is and how much of it there is and who's affected by it. And I think the main takeaway for me is to sort of paraphrase a certain non-presumptive presidential candidate, gentrification is messy. So um, I think that we just don't know exactly um, with precision how to measure it, but we do know when we're working in communities that there are certain uh, things that we observe, natures of change, um, that we like to figure out how to get out in front of and to deal with. So on this panel, um, after uh, my presentation, you'll hear from uh, Beth McConnell. Beth is the policy director at uh, Philadelphia Association of CDCs. That's sort of the umbrella organization for the community development corporations in Philadelphia. And they've developed a really interesting and sort of well thought out and, and broadly vetted uh, equitable development strategy. Um, it's based in uh, deep conversation with their membership. It's based in review of literature, and it's based in data. And all those things combined, I think, allowed them to put together something of uh, real meaning and applicability. After that, you're going to hear from Oramena Newsom. Oramena is the vice president um, of LISC in the D.C. metropolitan area. Um, and she's going to be speaking with you um, a bit about some of the different things that LISC is doing in that D.C., Virginia metropolitan area with respect to the preservation of a stock of affordable housing. Next, you will hear from Jonathan Sage Martinson. Um, Jonathan is the Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of St. Paul, Minnesota. And he's going to present on a, a variety of interesting things that they're doing around uh, a particular transit line, the, afford the, the preservation of affordability around a, a seemingly popular and important transit line in St. Paul. Lastly, you'll hear from Kathy Pettit. Kathy is the director of the National Neighborhood Indicators Pro Neighborhoods Neighborhood Indicators Project at the Urban Institute in Washington. And frankly, whether or not it's gentrification or some other problem over the last 20 years, Kathy and her colleagues have been sort of out in front in terms of helping folks in the communities, uh, sometimes in partnership with community organizations, sometimes with universities, sometimes multiple partnerships, to be able to sort of access and use data to make database decisions. And I think that that's been a really important part of the way uh, people working in communities, you know, over the last 20 years uh, have been able to make some significant progress. So um, I think as you listen to each of the conversations that we'll have today, I would encourage you to listen uh, really uh, with the lens of um, what, is, what is the need to be able to sort of both sort of monitor and act in real time. Markets are changing, and, and in some instances, they're changing quickly. Sometimes they're deteriorating quickly. Sometimes they're doing something that we label gentrification. And other times, they're not doing anything all that much. But it doesn't mean, frankly, that we shouldn't be doing something about it in those places. Either way, I think you ought to try and listen to these uh, presentations with an eye towards, uh, in essence, what is it that we can, we can do and what is it that we can do in real time. Um, some of you may know that uh, Pew released a study of gentrification here in Philadelphia just, uh, I think, earlier this week. Late last week, I'm sorry. Late last week. Um, and there was one little sentence buried in the back that I thought was really interesting. And it, you know, basically in the conclusion of the study, they say, you know, essentially the forces of the marketplace are largely out of the control of government. So this isn't one where government can sort of sit down and say, this is what shall happen in these neighborhoods. It just doesn't work. There's a variety of tools um, that are available. There are a variety of interventions. But it's not one for government to do. It may, however, be one for government to sort of be listening to and figuring out how to respond and to respond in such a way that you get the public purpose that you're trying to achieve. So that one little sentence I thought was real, aside from the rest of the report, which I thought was terrific, that one little sentence buried in the back I think is really important and a really important um, way to think about all the things that you're going to hear about today. Be it from somebody who represents government 
or a, an investor or a CDC or an applied researcher. Any of those things, that message I think remains the same. So with that, I'm gonna quickly run through a presentation on how we're doing some measurement things here in Philadelphia and then turn it over to my colleagues. So um, what we do, and I'm gonna really run through it quickly. How about that? Just kidding. <laughs> Just wanna make sure you're awake. Um, We've decided to approach this problem in a very, very simple way, but in a way that essentially represents the real time that markets change. And essentially what we do is this. We look at something for which virtually every city that we've ever worked in has really good data, and that's real estate sale prices. And we know also that most cities through the census or some other like uh, vehicle, they have decent information about income. So what we do is we say, let's start with this very generalized notion of what's important in some of these places is this ratio of home sale prices to income, right? Um, what we then do is we say, let's look at how that changes over time. But we do two things. One is um, we remove an overall citywide trend from those ratios of how sale prices to income change over time. That's the first thing that we do. And the second thing is we freeze income. So we don't look at how income looks like today and 10 years ago and five years from now, which is the way a lot of work is done. You're using census data and this or American Community Survey and the populations change and you take a measurement and you use the freshest data. For us, the important thing in the measurement that we wanted to make was not who's there now, but who was there at a particular point in time and whether or not there's any particular evidence that they're able to sort of hang in over time. So we take a particular start year, like calendar year 2000, for which there's good income data. We look at home sale prices, and then we inflate income just by consumer price index, and then we watch those home prices change over time, and we look at those ratios. It's just very, very simple thing. It doesn't have any of the richness of any of the research that you're hearing about all day long. But quite frankly, it works. Um, so, so what you're seeing now is a chart of four different neighborhoods here in the city of Philadelphia. The horizontal here is a two-year time period. Because uh, we're doing this measurement in a block group, sometimes the number of transactions in an area is very small, so we'll roll together two-year averages. So we have time dating from 2000 through 2013. And then each of these different color line represents a different neighborhood or a block group in a neighborhood in the city of Philadelphia. This particular uh, line right here is a neighborhood up in the sort of the lower northeast section of the city called Mayfair. It's a neighborhood that today is the same as it was five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It just hasn't changed. And we have, by the way, we have a lot of neighborhoods that look like that, an awful lot of them. Then we look at this neighborhood here, this little red line, that's Francisville. That's a neighborhood very near the Art Museum. The Art Museum, for those familiar with Philly, is an area that probably went through its gentrification process in the 80s and 90s. But this little section never really changed. All of a sudden, what we're seeing here is this uptick in those ratios. All of a sudden, around 2007, 8, all of a sudden, boom, it went. Okay. Now we're going to look at this blue line, this blue line here. That's a neighborhood called Point Breeze, and I'm gonna show you some maps of that. That's about a mile and a half south of here and a mile and a half west of here. A mile and a half east of here would be Camden. So this neighborhood is one that's sort of situated below Center City, and it's feeling the pressure of Center City on the top and the burgeoning sections of South Philadelphia to the east. And you watch what happens there. Um, it essentially sort of clubs along and then sort of evens out here. Now, if we were able to sort of pull these data up until today, you would see pff, that line flip. And lastly, Northern Liberties. I think Paul mentioned Northern Liberties. That's a section that, you know, if we look at our start year, you know, it really just sort of exploded. And in some ways, one of the things you want to say is today, 2000. Well, today on this chart, 2013 or 2016, today, whoever is trying to get into Northern Liberties is not going to have the same economics of the people who were there at that time. So either you're seeing the pressure of displacement or the inability to replace with the same kinds of households based on their income levels. 
And in essence, that's really what this ratio gets at. So let me just show you a series of maps. We're going to do it almost like a flip book. And I'm going to orient you to those maps, and then we'll sort of go through. So this is Point Breeze in the blue, very roughly speaking. Um, much, much of that map is in that very yellow cream color. That means you're looking at those low ratios. As you move from yellow to brown, what you're seeing is a rising of those ratios. So in other words, um, an increasing difficulty of people to be able to essentially replace in that area or to move in if they looked a particular way in 2000. Okay. Um, so what I want you to do, and this is shaded by block group, what I want you to do is just sort of keep your eyes pegged on that blue box. Okay. Watch what happens. Okay, so as we started out, most of this was in that yellow, right? It was in a place where in 2000, 2002, 2004, 2005, the same kinds of people economically could afford to be able to sort of both hang in or replace themselves in a way. But as we moved over the course of time, as those, what you're seeing is as that map recolors, you're seeing the pressure, that real estate market pressure, really at a very small level of analysis, right? These are block groups, right? So it's sort of that pressure is coming down, coming down, coming down from Center City through the Graduate Hospital area down into Point Breeze and across from South Philly. That diagonal right here is Pass Yoke Avenue. If you hang in for a few days, that's a really good section of restaurants if you want to get some of the best food in the city. You'll see that market pressure coming down from the top and across from the east. And I'm going to do it one last time and then turn it over to Beth. Important to recognize, we tried this work uh, doing it at the census tract level, and the problem is you don't see what you see on the ground, which is block by block, developers eating up properties, vacant properties, converting them, tearing them down, putting new ones in. You really need to do this work, particularly if you're going to intervene. And if you're going to be able to get out in front of it, you need to be able to do this at a small enough level of geography that you can see the direction of that market movement. Okay. Thank you. Beth? Uh, well, afternoon, everybody. For those of you that are from out of town, welcome to Philly. It's good to have you here. Spend lots of money while you're here, if you could. Um, and I know we are the last panel in between you and the fresh air, so we'll try to make it really good and worth your while. Um, so I'm, my name is Beth McConnell. I'm the policy director at the Philadelphia Association of Community Development Corporations, PACDC for short. Um, and I'm going to, um, uh, there's very little math in anything that I'm presenting to you today. 12 million plus 12 million equals how much money we want on our housing trust fund is the extent of the amount of math that you're going to hear today. Um, but what I'm going to kind of do is talk a little bit more about citywide in Philadelphia, just picking up on what Ira showed on that kind of narrow uh, slice of South Philly, kind of look a little bit citywide and talk about what we have been doing as a CDC association um, in terms of advocacy of, of what the citywide um, response should be. Um, so this is, um, this is a... a you know, a year and a half almost, yeah, a year and a half ago or so ago, the site of Comcast's new uh, tower, their second tower, skyscraper that they're building in Philadelphia. It's called the Comcast Innovation and Technology Center. I hear rumors of a third one being planned um, as well. And this was on a vacant lot that was uh, downtown in Center City. And, you know, prime real estate, but just remained vacant for I don't know how long, for as long as, for at least two decades, if not longer. Um, <clears throat> and then similarly, the development pressure that we're seeing downtown, if any of you have a chance to kind of get out and walk downtown, you're going to have just warning, hope you have your comfortable shoes on, because you're going to have to cross the street a lot to avoid construction. Um, so just be prepared for that. And that development boom is definitely pushing out into our neighborhoods as well. Um, this is uh, not too far from the area that um, Ira showed uh, on the map. This is in, um, it's alternatively called Point Breeze 
or South Center City, depending on your, if you're a real estate agent or not. Um, <laughs> in, the, in the area around this block, homes a couple years ago, um, within the last 10 years, were selling for $22,000, $77,000. These were built on vacant lots. Um, this picture is also a little bit over a year and a half old. Anybody want to guess how much they sold for? $700,000, around $700,000, brand new construction homes. Um, so, uh, so as you can imagine, that's a big shock for a neighborhood where someone bought their house for $22,000 or inherited it from a, from a relative, a small little tiny two-story row house with a bathroom that's about as big as this podium, and this stuff's going up across the street. It's a, it's a very big change. Um, but we also, as we kind of heard earlier from the gentleman from Baltimore, we still have an awful lot of neighborhoods that look just like this. Um, in fact, uh, you know, vacant, industrial, commercial, and residential properties. I mean, this is a block that people live on now, um, and this is in North Philadelphia. Um, and the, the roofs obviously are caved in, the windows are gone, um, and folks on that block have to live with that kind of blight and vacancy and abandonment every single day, and all of the challenges that come along with it. Um, and so when we think about the policy response to this massive, you know, new development and all of this kind of positive stuff that's happening in some of our neighborhoods, with also the lack of investment in some of our other neighborhoods, you know, as we've talked a lot about today, how does somebody, um, a long-term resident who um, either lives in a changing neighborhood or lives in one that is not changing fast enough, what is our responsibility and obligation to them? How can we ensure that that they not only be able to stay in their neighborhood of choice, choose an, a neighborhood um, or um, uh, be able to uh, uh, get their, the neighborhood that they're living in actually improved um, in the response to all this gentrification or new investment and redevelopment. Um, and it's a pretty important time for us to be thinking more strategically and deliberately about this. Um, you know, this uh, uh, credit to Stephen Hertzenberg from the Keystone Research Center um, looked at the uh, economic recoveries, and this is Pennsylvania, not Philadelphia, but Pennsylvania is a state, since 1949, where you see, you know, the bottom 99% after during a recovery is actually regaining growth and gaining income. But from the period of 2009 to 2012, uh, the bottom 99% actually lost income. So we're definitely, the recovery is very unequal. Um, and if you're a person of color in this region, um, things are very unequal as well. Um, this uh, credit to the policy link, um, which folks may be familiar with their work around um, equity and the National Equity Atlas. And their equity atlas, um, uh, their data says that people of color in the Philadelphia region are earning about $18 an hour versus uh, white folks earning $25 an hour. And their estimates, estimates where if you corrected for that inequality, our regional economy would be $57 billion bigger every year. So that's pretty huge. So, um, you know, and at the same time, while we're seeing all these changes, we're also seeing residential income segregation growing um, in Philadelphia. And this is actually from a Pew um, report from a few years ago as well. Um, and in a city like Philadelphia, where, you know, when I, growing up, one block would be totally different than the next block, we're starting to see that change um, with all this kind of new development coming in and moving um, the high, kind of higher priced uh, uh, properties across the city, or I should say surrounding center city. So what are we going to do about it? <clears throat> So in uh, February of last year, we released our policy platform beyond gentrification uh, toward equitable neighborhoods, an equitable development policy platform for Philadelphia. Um, some of the stuff, the policy recommendations I'm going to go through are going to sound very familiar to you and are not going to sound like rocket science. Um, and part of the reason why we released it is that as a CDC association, you know, CDCs were born out of um, a time of disinvestment. Um, you know, we were managing a city in decline, like many CDCs across the country were created under that same circumstance. And so we had a particular, you know, way of doing our work that was meant to reinvest in neighborhoods. But our city is different now. We're now suddenly a city on, uh, of growth for the first time in 60 years. Um, and so what does that mean for us as a CDC association? How should we pivot or shift our work? Um, and the answer was not all that much. Um, because the reality is, as I talked about earlier, we still have massive neighborhoods where gentrification is not their problem, but a lack of equitable, equitable development sure is. Um, and we know the strategies that work in um, neighborhoods that are lacking disinvestment can also work in neighborhoods where investment is growing if we're, if we're strategic about it. 
Um, so we released this platform last February. Um, it was around the time that we had a mayoral primary, as well as city council primaries in Philadelphia. And uh, we're dem very heavy, heavily democratic city, so whoever wins the primary usually ends up becoming the mayor or council person. So we met, we sat down with every, every uh, candidate for mayor. We briefed them on what was in our platform so they knew all the answers to the really tough questions we were going to ask them at the mayoral forum, uh, which works out quite well. They know the answers when they come in. Um, so we held this uh, forum at uh, Temple University and, and um, uh, had about 300 people there to ask them, again, a series of questions about their response and what their priorities would be if elected mayor. Um, we also did a similar process in terms of engaging candidates for city council um, on what was in it. And it, it worked out quite well. The eventual uh, winner, uh, uh, Jim Kenney, who's now our mayor, uh, we heard him repeating stuff that was in our platform on the campaign trail throughout the next couple of months. Um, and actually, I was able to co-chair his transition, to the, uh, transition Committee on Housing, Planning, and Development, along with some of my other uh, CDC colleagues were on that committee and others. So we really felt like we were able to kind of get this issue in front of him and really get his attention. So there are 20 different recommendations in the platform in five key areas. I'm going to go through every single one of them with painstaking detail. <laughs> um, just really, really fast. I talk really fast. No, so I'm just going to overview the highlights. Um, and then I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we're struggling with still, even after releasing this, this platform and, and the progress that we've made on it. Um, the first is, um, you know, I think a lot of the times when people feel uh, tension around gentrification in neighborhoods, it's because neighbors who are there don't feel like the new development is for them. Um, that it's not going to benefit them and it wasn't done with them in mind, that they're being built around, um, not, being, not being built with. Um, and so um, it's really, we feel it's really important that resident engagement, you know, we need to strengthen the ability of people in their neighborhoods to be part of discussions about the future of their neighborhoods, whether that's when a CDC develops its broader neighborhood plan or when a developer comes in with a large project. And part of doing that requires that you have effective and educated residents and neighborhood-based organizations that can serve as a platform for, for, for setting those tables and engaging in those conversations. And I think Donna, I don't see Donna Carney here, uh, she's left, but uh, heads up the Citizens Planning Institute, which is um, uh, under our planning commission, which serves as a way for people to kind of get education and training about zoning and, and how that whole thing works. And, um, and, and so that's, an, I think, an important way for residents to learn more about the process. But I also think it's important for developers to learn about the community. Um, and, uh, oh, five minutes, I gotta move fast. Um, so that's all I'll say about that. Uh, <laughs> So the second piece is around housing. You know, we need to be creating and preserving quality, affordable home choices in every part of the city. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit later about our land bank, which is a tool for land acquisition and disposition. Um, but the key things that we were kind of pushing for here is, you know, we have a massive need for affordable homes. We have a city with 25% uh, people living in poverty, including a lot of people living in deep, deep poverty. Um, so we need to not only um, repair existing homes, the homeowner, the senior who paid off her mortgage but literally has nothing more than to afford her monthly utility bills but the roof is caving in, we need to invest in repairing those homes so that they don't get displaced. Um, and we also need to be building new quality affordable homes and all those vacant lots uh, and abandoned structures that we have in our neighborhoods. And this is Paseo Verde, which is um, mixed income, platinum lead, there's a blue roof, a green roof, there's a federally qualified health center, it is transit oriented development, any other bell or whistle that you can come up with, it's kind of built in there. Um, and again, half of them are market rate um, and half are for um, uh, income restricted uh, tenants. So we need to be doing more like that. We also need to be expanding economic opportunities. Uh, in order to attack inequality, people have to have jobs and they need to be good paying jobs. This stretches our knowledge as a CDC association a little bit. You know, we're used to talking about our neighborhood commercial corridors and investments in facade programs and we were successful in getting um, uh, 535,000 in last year's city budget um, to fund a program called the Storefront Improvement Program to help uh, low, uh, uh, small business owners on our struggling neighborhood corridors fix up their facades and, and improve their business. But we also know that we need to go way deeper on that um, uh, in terms of uh, local hiring and local sourcing, both the development, uh, in the new, all the new development that's happening in, in our institutions. And, you know, Jeff Hornstein is here, he's been leading a lot of that work with the controller's office. 
Um, and as we talked about this morning, we really need to better understand the threats and impacts of, dis of displacement. We have a lot of anecdotes and a lot of stories. And when we put this out last year, almost no data about what was actually happening in Philadelphia neighborhoods. Um, the report that, that Lei Ding put out uh, earlier this year and his, his other colleagues here at the Fed gives us some new data that we didn't have before, but we need to understand way more in terms of the impact on small businesses, as we've discussed, the impact on renters in order to figure out um, what size of programs and scope do we need. Um, and we do have some programs here in Philadelphia to help homeowners freeze in their property taxes. There's time, we can talk more about that. And then finally, we need to attack blight and vacancy and abandonment in every single one of our neighborhoods. Um, we led the effort to create the Philadelphia Land Bank along with our colleagues at the Coalition for Affordable Communities and Campaign to Take Back Vacant Land, which is here today. Um, and that allows us to consolidate the public ownership of vacant land into one more common sense place. One place is better than four places, right, if it's publicly owned. But then also gives us new tools to acquire vacant tax delinquent parcels in every neighborhood in the city. And then also gives the city the ability, the land bank I should say, to be strategic about how, what we do with those parcels. Such is deciding that we're actually going to be building, using them to build affordable housing in neighborhoods where um, uh, rents and home prices are rising, um, and also using them to spur market rate development, such as through a, a you know a discounted land in neighborhoods where they're not seeing any. Um, and so that is uh, my presentation. I guess I'll just kind of finally say, but this isn't every good idea. Um, one, it's what we thought we could we could chew off and, and what we thought was politically palatable to move in Philadelphia within a certain number of years. And it's also what the contribution of the CDC industry has. You know, to truly build an equitable city, we need good schools. You know, we need better health outcomes. We need a lot of other things. So we tried not to get at everything in this policy platform, but at least the things that we felt as an association that we had a, we could play a leadership role in advancing. So thank you very much. So, good afternoon. Okay, pick it up, pick it up. Yeah. We're getting there, we're getting there, okay. Um, I am Vice President uh, for LISC, uh, and my topic today is specifically about Washington, D.C. We are uh, an investor. We provide loans, grants, equity, and technical support <coughs> to nonprofits who are investing in neighborhoods and bringing about a better quality of life. I am so happy to finally get to the word equity. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. That's, that's where the world I live in. And I, it's so important for me to come here and hear the research and hear the data and, and get new ideas. But it's important for you to remember that in all your research and analysis that this is about equity and securing a quality of life for janitors, waitresses, home health aides, the people who serve our lunch here at this hotel. Um, that that's important for both of us to remember, to remember that. I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about Washington, D.C., your nation's capital, that odd little duck on the Potomac <laughs> River, uh, and the realities there, and so, uh, two things that we're doing in this business of equity, and just a few descriptions of Washington, D.C., landlocked, virtually heightlocked, and there's no such thing as moving around in the city. When you move, if you can't afford to live there, you move to Maryland and Virginia, which has all types of implications one way or the other. Um, and the neighborhoods are the last frontier because it's 64 square miles, 40% which is covered by the federal government. So there's no sort of being in a neighborhood and priced out of that neighborhood and moving to another one. That's just not our reality. So we have to take a stand where we are in the particular neighborhoods. And the other is thing, and then I know race is an issue in this, in this country as a whole. But how many of you can remember when D.C. wasn't called Chocolate City? Not too many. And that is a huge, huge factor in the business of equity in Washington, D.C., because this is a city that has been defined by the African-American culture for multiple generations. So when you speak of change, that is universal. That is a huge piece of it and plays out on a day-to-day -day basis. So one thing that we do have, though, is a recognition in Washington, D.C. that this is happening. 
from the mayor to the council to the private sector. Now, maybe not everything is being done, but we have a city council as a method of equity that at a minimum budgets $100 million a year for affordable housing. We have a trust fund. We have guidelines and regulations, all of which are geared toward providing for this balance. It is a topic of conversation. Um, it is, there's an awareness about it. Uh, there are days you feel like you're dipping out the ocean with a teaspoon, but boy, we got the teaspoon. And we are, you know, attempting to provide for equity. It is not an issue that's on the back burner. It is very much out front. So I just wanted to speak to you a few minutes about two things that we're doing. Well, one thing that we're doing is an example of a, of a preservation tool. And it falls under what I guess the TSA calls um, see something, say something. <laughs> so our effort to say something is we are calling Elevating Equity Initiative. And do you want me to change? You'll change. Oh, okay. So this is working toward equity and inclusiveness uh, in the neighborhoods adjacent to the 11th Street B Bridge Park impact zone. How many of you have heard of the 11th Street Bridge Park in Washington? That's actually pretty good. Okay. So think of D.C.'s form of the High Line. That's what this would be, being built across um, a piers. Actually, this is better if I do it this way. Uh, the um, old 11th Street Bridge was replaced, but they left a set of piers on which they will be building a new park, which is a venue for recreation, environmental education, and the arts. This is connecting across the Anacostia River. On the east side would be the neighborhood that people call Anacostia, on the west side would be Capitol Hill, but there's also the Navy Yard and other neighborhoods, also east of the river Fairlawn and a couple of other neighborhoods. So this is the, what we call the impact area. For over a year, um, the community and those working on the Bridge Park team, including ourselves, went through a community process designed to create what we call the Equitable Development Plan. And this was a plan or a process designed to say, Change is coming. What are we going to do to the best of our ability to give balance, to give the opportunity for those who live where they are now to be able to stay there and to allow new <laughs> lower income people to move there because once this park comes, and it's not just the park, but definitely once this park comes, the values and prices of everything will go up. Not just housing, but the ability to rent space for uh, businesses, for nonprofits who offer early childhood learning centers or medical centers. Just the cost of life will go up. And so we had to decide what do we consider the impact zone. So we decided a mile on either side of the bridge would be our target area where we were going to make a concentrated effort to provide for balance. This led to uh, an equitable development plan, which has 19 recommendations in it, under housing, workforce development, and small businesses, all under the umbrella of equity. I won't go through all the 19 of them. But this is just to give you a sense of the, well, let me go back. So here's west of the bridge, east of the bridge. These are the stats for the two sides uh, of the bridge, and just a sense of the difference in the demographics and the and the income levels and other um, characteristics of those two areas. So the reality is we're more focused on the east side than we are on the west side. The key to the west side, or what we're looking at, is how do you um, preserve the affordable housing that's there, how do you pre preserve the quality of what's there, and also insert new opportunities for lower income people. On the east side of the bridge, we also we have to do that, plus we have to generally raise the quality of life in, uh, in those neighborhoods. This is just a restatement of our mission because we prepared the uh, PowerPoint for a different presentation, so it must be there. Uh, but that's who we are. Elevating equity. LISC has made a $50 million commitment to west of the bridge, east of the bridge, to invest in these neighborhoods based on our five pillars of community development. So we'll be investing in housing 
healthy neighborhoods, uh, economic development activities, um, family income and wealth activities, a host of different things that fall under the 19 recommendations within the plan because we, we are following the plan even though there are other things we may do. Uh, but that is important to have that community vetted plan that you're working from because you can come up with all type of arbitrary things to do but this at least gives us something to work with when we make decisions about how we will invest. So it is our effort to focus on equity, inclusiveness, and an approved quality of life. This neighborhood or on the east side is predominantly African American, historically African American, historically poor, and re reality is the neglected part of the city. The river became a way of not looking across the river and see what was going on. But on the other hand, one of the reasons we're so concerned about this particular neighborhood is the private sector is buying up land by the minute. Not by the hour, by the minute. You literally cannot go to bed at night and wake up the next morning without a big piece of property being sold. And it's at whatever value and what they can get. It's large-scale government development. You will be um, pleased or not so pleased to know that your Homeland Security headquarters will be located in this neighborhood. Can you imagine the effect of having the Homeland Security be he headquartered in your neighborhood? Coast Guard has already moved in. So government actions is really dividing, uh, deciding a lot of this. And as I mentioned earlier, we are landlocked. So this is it. This is the last frontier. If you don't live here, if you get pushed out from here, it's Maryland or Virginia. And let me tell you, the mayor's not happy about that. That does not work for the mayor. It may work for the governors of Maryland and Virginia, but it's not a good thing for the District of Columbia. So that's why we have to start now. Um, we are, will focus on housing and community facilities. We need to learn more about the workforce and small business world of these neighborhoods. We started out with what we know. We've had a long history of investing in housing, arts facilities, health care, early learning centers. What this allows us to do is to take the time to learn the rest of the dynamics in this neighborhood and know how to invest in future activities. So the last slide here just gives us a couple of examples of where we've already started investing, investing this $15 million. Uh, we are a lender and possibly a tax credit uh, equity provider for 71-unit mixed-income apartment building. This is the preservation of an 18-unit apartment building primarily occupied by seniors, um, African-American seniors who've lived in this neighborhood for generations. This is a way of preserving their homes. This is a new development uh, that will use new market tax credits uh, that will house an early learning, learning center and a quali federally qualified health center, which is not available now. New home ownership opportunities, 18-unit condominium that's under construction now. Uh, a new uh, early learning uh, center that's actually specifically for homeless families. And there are a lot of families in this neighborhood in transitional housing, which classifies them as homeless. Um, senior housing, uh, a lot of need for repair, so we're working with a nonprofit. This is their business. This is what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And let me tell you, this will be a excellent uh, opportunity because there is a large number of owner-occupied single-family houses where the owners are 75 and above. And it's not just that there is a um, need for repair. The units are not accessible. So the, the person has now reached a point they cannot get up the stairs, but their bedroom is upstairs. So these are the types of renovations. Um, someone mentioned busboys and poets earlier. I can't remember who that was. Uh, but we are helping to bring busboys and poets to the neighborhood now. You know, we're not unaware. Busboys and poets will attract who? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We know that. But this is America, you know, we have to, you know, we, you cannot tell people where they can live. You know, we, may, we worked hard for equity and for balance, but I'm of a generation where I was told where I could live based on my race, and I will never accept that as an option. What we're responsible for is providing for that balance. 
So, yes, we are supporting the busboys and poets. <laughs> so just a couple more minutes on a specific tool that we're using in Washington, D.C., which most of you will probably think, oh, my God, have they lost their minds. This would never work where I live. So preservation, which is one tool that we'll use in this neighborhood and we use in other neighborhoods. There was a recent study. Finding and keeping affordable housing is by far the dominant stress among low-income residents. This was done by a uh, team of lawyers who provide pro bono services, and they really did a big analysis to determine what they should be prioritizing. Um, so in Washington, D.C., the reality is preserving the occupied multifamily apartments that meet the needs of low-income households is our highest and best way to provide for equity. Constructing new, first of all, there's no land. Secondly, very expensive. So being able to preserve where people already live is our highest and best way of providing for equity. So how do we do that? The Tenant Opportunity Purchase Act. And to my knowledge, no other city in the United States has this, and there's probably a reason for that. Um, this is the law provided, and this was passed in 1987. So I have to give a point to the district government to having some forethought. Uh, this is where when a multifamily property goes on the market, a rental property. So if you own a multifamily property, you put it on the market, it's let's say 35 units. The tenants have the right to say, no, fine, I don't want to purchase the building. If they choose to purchase the building, they have 12 months for a process that would allow them to move through that process, get the acquisition financing, the renovation, renovation dollars, and purchase the property. Now, let me be clear. Not every tenant association should buy their building. That is not what we're <laughs> recommending by any stretch of the imagination. We, however, have provisions for the tenants to work with nonprofits or for-profits to get the landlord that they want or they may become a cooperative or a condominium. So we're not saying that this is a big universal, let every tenant association buy their, uh, buy their property. But it does offer an excellent opportunity for uh, limited displacement as well as for uh, equity in terms of people being able to exercise their rights to, to save their homes. So we just have a few quotes here. We did an analysis of our own investments over the last 30 years. Uh, where we had uh, been able to preserve somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 units of apartments for lower income households. So this is just a, um, a couple of quotes from people who are very excited uh, about the opportunity to stay in their homes. The second one is it's time to start reinvesting into the aging housing stock. The expiring use units, other uh, affordable housing uh, that is just uh, in disrepair, and you have more nonprofits and more for profits who are doing that now because they want to hold on to their property. They want to continue to have the tenants there. They want to themselves make money. So, we are investing in quite a few recapitalization, refinancing, and renovation of, um, of the aging stock in the city as a way to also provide for um, equity and allowing for people to remain in their neighborhoods. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, uh, as Iris said, I'm Jonathan Sage Martinson. I'm the Director of Planning and Economic Development for the City of St. Paul, Minnesota. And I'm going to talk briefly about uh, some collective efforts around um, a new light rail line that was built, open in 2014, that runs between Minneapolis, downtown Minneapolis, and downtown St. Paul. Um, at the risk of being kicked out, I'm not going to really talk about gentrification. I'm going to talk about displacement primarily. This is a light rail line where uh, our collection of, of partners really wanted to see development come. We wanted to see, we had a lot of um, underutilized or vacant land. We wanted to see development come there. Our biggest concern in addition to that development is that it be equitable development, as Ornamenta was saying, and that uh, part of that was to make sure that we mitigated against displacement uh, for the residents and businesses who were there. 
Um, I'm, I, I work for the city of St. Paul. My two previous jobs were in community development in one or more of the neighborhoods along this transit line. So, um, and it's important to note that while, while I'm talking from a city perspective, this is really a collective effort. So the city was involved in all of these pieces, but so were our community development corporations, our foundations, our neighborhood organizations as well. Um, this light rail line is um, a billion dollar investment. It's 11 miles long, so it's bringing huge change to about 10 neighborhoods that uh, are, are very different but included some of the most distressed neighborhoods in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So that, that big opportunity for development, also uh, a big uh, worry for displacing residents in those neighborhoods. So uh, this is just to orientate you, this is the, um, the line itself. Um, uh, on your left is downtown Minneapolis, uh, closest to me is downtown St. Paul. Um, you can see the blue line there, it's our existing light rail line, and then this green line opened in June of 2014 uh, with 23 stations. Um, in the last uh, five years, um, we've uh, counted $4 billion of development that's happened along this 11 miles. So we anticipated, we didn't know, but we anticipated there'd be quite a bit of development interest, um, and there has been. Uh, the neighborhood plans and the 11 miles call for $7 billion worth of development over 30 years, and five years in, we've seen $4 billion of it. So uh, there's been a lot of activity there. I I'm going to talk about a handful of things that were kind of a subset of the work that happened along the M Metro Green Line light rail <coughs> transit that have to do with displacement. So the work to help businesses that were there stay in place, so existing businesses, uh, the work to help people who live there afford to stay there and want to stay there. So that's both around affordable housing, but also in keeping the sort of authentic nature of those neighborhoods in place as they change. So not only could people mechanically afford to stay, but they would want to stay because they recognize the community. And then um, also in terms of being able to afford to stay, there's an emphasis on jobs. Uh, was very clear in some of the early meetings around this one of the neighborhood residents it was a meeting around affordable housing, and one of the neighborhood residents said, I do not care how much rent increases are as long as neighborhood incomes are faster than those rent increases. So there's an emphasis here paid to that jobs component as well. Um, so with those four things, uh, businesses, um, uh, people wanting to stay because they recognize the place in affordable housing, I will start with uh, investing in small businesses. Uh, there. The, our biggest concern was around the smallest of the businesses, uh, the, the independent small shops. There were 700 or so along this 11 miles that were our biggest concern because of their size. And there's a group of 12 organizations from government agencies to neighborhood groups to CDCs um, to LISC and other financial institutions that got together and developed a strategic plan around helping those businesses both through construction but also into the new reality. This was going to be a different corridor when the construction was done. Um, this group of about a dozen organizations came up with roughly 10 or 11 supports, sort of comprehensive supports to uh, provide um, uh, support to the businesses, not only through the construction, as I said, but really this was the motto, prepare, survive, and thrive. So really was to help people prepare for the new reality of what would come, not just get through two years of construction and assume that it was going to be the same neighborhood. Um, it was everything from technical assistance to communications to uh, forgivable loan program, joint marketing, uh, facade improvements. Um, this is the first place to admit for everything I'm going to talk about today, none of this was perfect. Um, this was... Uh, elements that were being invented as the light rail was approaching or construction was approaching. So this was done in real time. And in many cases, we don't know the impacts, the full impacts of both the light rail or the, um, the, the sort of the interventions I'm going to mention for years to come, where we have some early results that I'll mention. Uh, in some cases, folks would have said we needed a lot more money in the forgivable loan program, but there was about $4 million put together to help the smallest businesses uh, make it through that construction. So um, two years after construction is done, uh, we know that uh, about 500 small businesses were assisted. Um, uh, of those that received 200 and 
15 received the forgivable loan. I think there's been three or four defaults on those loans. So very high success rate for those who participated in the business planning. To get a loan, you had to do business planning for the new future of the light rail line. Um, we saw um, 134 new businesses open during that period. We did see 90 close and we saw 31 move out. So there was a net gain, a gain of 13 businesses um, which is not insignificant in um, um, struggling communities with lots of small businesses. There's usually churn. The worry was we'd end up, the, we'd have a beautiful new light rail line and there would be empty commercial space everywhere. The, the immediate response was um, a net gain of 13 businesses. Um, and really those who took advantage of most of those supports did the best. We also, um, as I mentioned before, we wanted to make sure that not only could folks afford to live there, but they recognized the neighborhood and wanted to stay in the neighborhoods that had been theirs. Um, so there was um, a support for these six uh, cultural nodes, um, which were sort of very um, specific cultural identity to these portions of the corridor. And they were, um, they're all sort of on their individual path towards developing that as an economic development tool and a and an anti-displacement tool. But one of the things that actually the Twin Cities list was able to do uh, was to connect them together so they were learning from each other in terms of marketing, uh, supporting their existing businesses. And they're quite different. They're everything from um, the West Bank is near the University of Minnesota. Uh, it's kind of an eclectic theater scene. Uh, Little Mekong has become home for Asian American businesses. Um, the Creative Enterprise Zone is focused on uh, an artist community that was being displaced and, and sort of building off creative uh, businesses. Um, they have been working together now for two years, really building on their assets um, and helping people um, uh, through the change begin to, you know, continue to recognize their place uh, and, and uh, do two things, really help bring more business to the existing businesses there. Again, um, one of our small business owners said, uh, don't pay attention to rental rates, pay attention to income to those businesses so they can afford as, as the world changes. Um, and so that, that was an important uh, part of the overall intervention. Uh, just a minute on affordable housing. Um, so there was um, likewise a group of organizations, this time nearly two dozen organizations that came together to develop a, a strategic plan around affordable housing in the quarter, which got named the Big Picture Project. And it's essentially a 10-year affordable housing plan uh, for these 11 miles. And it took an inventory of the affordable housing in the corridor, sort of what's existing. This, this is a part of that inventory. This is Section 8 and uh, Section 202 housing in the corridor. It set goals for affordable housing over 10 years. It looked at um, uh, current and new policies and programs to help achieve those goals. And then it measured progress. Um, um, both sort of looking nationally at what was happening and then applying it to the uh, to the the real situation here in the corridor. It had three objectives to invest in the after doing all of that, it came up with three objectives: invest in the production and preservation of long-term affordable housing, stabilize the neighborhood and invest in activities that help low-income people stay in their homes. And thirdly, was to strengthen families through coordinated investments, essentially to coordinate with all the job creation, job training, economic development work that was happening. Uh, so just some, some quick um, detail on the plan. It, it set a 10-year goal of a baseline goal of 2,540 uh, new or preserved affordable units with a stretch goal of 4,500. Um, I didn't work for the city of St. Paul at the time but the, the, the cities were insistent that that 2,500 number be the goal because that was the number we had pledged to the region around affordable housing. But collectively, uh, we, we agreed that that wouldn't be enough and we had to stretch to more than that. So 4,500 was sort of st set as the stretch goal. We are five years into this plan and um, we are 53% of the way to the stretch goal. That's completed projects. What's in the pipeline currently, if that were completed, we'd be 93% of the way to the 10-year plan. So uh, challenges still and hurdles to get over for the pipeline, but uh, really great progress in terms of the, uh, the partners to help reach that aggressive goal. Uh, the second strategy was to help people stay in their homes. 
um, and there was a goal of about helping 1,500 households. Uh, the, the results here are strong, not quite as strong in terms of uh, the first strategy, but five years in, about 47% of the goal. And this is foreclosure prevention, home improvement lending, et cetera. Um, and there's, there's about uh, eight or 10 individual programs that we're measuring under this goal. Um, so this, like all of the work in the corridor, this big picture project is also very busy measuring how things are going. I'll give you some of the early re results. One of the other things it's measuring is housing values and rental rates in the corridor to, mm -hmm. to track how those, are going, how those are changing and whether or not they raise this issue of, um, of um, displacement, potential displacement happening in one part of the corridor or another. Uh, five years in, the housing values are actually down 11%. I think that has a lot to do with the, the, the delay of the recovery of the housing market in the Twin Cities. This data is about a year and a half, two years old now, so I, I'm sure it's gone up uh, since then. But that's down, and then you see the median rental rates up almost 40%. So that's obviously a huge concern, something that this group um, noticed and dug in on. Part of the answer is that there's been a lot of new units added uh, as we were hoping would be added. And many of them, particularly downtown Minneapolis and near the University of Minnesota, are those new units are higher uh, rental rates. So we're not seeing the big jump in neighborhoods with existing units. And then uh, second to last, I'll just mention jobs quickly. Uh, again, trying to um, mitigate against displacement by helping existing residents uh, not only get ways to improve their home and stay there, but also connections to better jobs. And so there's um, a number of strategies around helping uh, residents in this corridor get connected to uh, job training and jobs. This picture here is from one, it's a, it's called the Central Corridor Anchor Partnership, and it's the, um, I think it's a total of 10 educational medical institutions that line that 11-mile corridor that are working together to help. This is a scrubs camp, it's called, to help train uh, high school and college students uh, in medical careers um, that they can both train for a train ride away, and they can also then get uh, permanent jobs, also a train ride away from their home. And there's a number of other um, in construction um, and uh, connecting our workforce system better to these neighborhoods as well. And then finally, um, there's all of this, uh, each of these individual efforts had a measurement component, uh, but collectively the work around the green line, which was previously known as the Central Corridor, uh, has an annual report that's put out called the Central Corridor Tracker, and it measures a dozen indicators that is around development and density, uh, livability, et cetera. But here you see nine of those indicators or so um, that are related to this question around displacement. So. This is uh, real-time data that's uh, being measured uh, and published annually to help all the partners understand what's happening, um, where we might see hotspots around displacement. Um, and so this has been an important uh, part of the programs to help people monitor change because there were assumptions about changes five years ago, uh, and they don't always happen as we imagine they will. So this has been the roadmap for folks going forward. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not that cute. Got it. Um, I'm on the last panelist on the last panel, so I um, will try to zip through or at least be energetic as we um, go through. I'm also um, uh, been honored to be on a practitioner panel, but I'm really here representing a team of organizations um, and a project that's just getting started. Um, it's going to pick up on the themes, I think, across the uh, the whole day that we've heard all the day, so I can, we'll be able to zip through things, the, another benefit of being last. So um, as a little background, um, as Ira mentioned, I direct the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership, or NNIP, because we all need our own acronyms. Um, it's a peer learning network of organizations in 30 places that collect and organize local data both across time and across topics in order to help local stakeholders use it. Um, the Furman Center is our partner in um, New York City. 
We also at Urban help new cities get started um, in, who are interested in the model. Um, I'm not going to talk much about NNIP today, but I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards. Oops. So um, I'm here to talk about a, primarily a project that we're just starting out called Turning the Corner, which was designed on the model of our NIP cross-site projects that we've done before. It's, uh, the design was in collaboration with, this is a mouthful, the Phil Federal Reserve Philanthropy Initiative of the Older Industrial Cities Working Group, which I've been practicing for a couple days. Um, the, they had an idea that they came to us uh, almost two years ago now, I think it was, um, and we each are joining forces with the roles that we have. Um, these are more words than you need to read more as reference. The Urban Institute is leading the project design and helping to coordinate cross-site learning. Um, the, uh, the FPI is both um, doing the outreach to their respective audiences and, and to potential cities that I'll talk about in a little bit. And the Kresge Foundation is supporting our national role. But the core of NNIP cross-site projects is it leverages the connections and expertise from national organizations along with local wisdom. So the Detroit is our first city participating and our NNIP partner there that you might know is Data Driven Detroit who are helping in the project design and will be doing the local implementation and research. They also are supported by local funders, the Community Foundation of Southeast Michigan and most recently the Hudson Weber Foundation and then their regional Federal Reserve Bank. So together they will be um, working on the project that, um, that I'll tell you about in the timing in a minute. So I think the goals for the participating cities, I, I'm glad that the, um, what the, the Twin Cities example was able to cue this up. It's to really develop measures for in-depth tracking and more holistic tracking of neighborhood dynamics and especially with the focus of neighborhoods at risk of being unaffordable. So it's really about fostering this common understanding of the issue in order to inform community conversations, which I think has been a thread through the three presentations that we've heard. So cross-site on the national level, we plan to do a summary of the cross-site results like we normally do on our, on our cross-site projects. And um, both about the measures and the findings, the empirical pieces, but also how was the data used locally and how was that done successfully. Through, um, we also expect through the engagement that we'll be learning a lot about policies and programs in different kinds of places with different kinds of markets to share those and to produce protocols and methodology, sort of a, a toolkit of sorts for doing this process in other cities. Um, all of these are going to sound familiar to you from all the whole day. So Urban provides a framework for the research, but each city is really starting out in a different place. So you see how far Twin Cities have come. Baltimore might be in another place, Detroit in another. So we provide the, the, um, the research design structure and the local folks will adapt it. Um, it includes the, both marrying the qualitative side, all those resident perspectives, um, the government agencies, the private developers, along with the quantitative um, measures that we're more um, that we're more used to, and we are including. Um, we might have bitten off more than we can chew. Hopefully not, but we're including concerns just like the community has about the physical displacement, the cultural displacement that we just heard about in the presentation um, below, and the commercial work. So I was really excited to see um, the increase of the study of small businesses and that inclusion in this conversation too, which isn't normally in the conclusion in conversations around gentrification. And then finally, we have a local advisory board. So this is to ensure from the beginning that the data and analysis is not um, something that's sort of interesting in the back office, but is actually being responsive to local priorities and analysis. The people asking the questions will be involved from the beginning. So as I mentioned, we're just getting started. We're in the project design phase. The local folks will start their implementation in the summer. Um, There'll be more intensive cross-site summary next year, but we're really committed to being informal about blogging and sharing information and sharing progress all along the way, given our fantastic dissemination networks that are part of the national, um, national team. 
we are interested in having other cities join the project. We've been talking with Twin Cities, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, others um, who have been expressed interest, um, San Antonio. I think we're particularly interested in having a range of markets, sort of um, not, not just the hot markets like San Francisco or New York, but other mid-market places. FPI has been leading the outreach, and we're asking that um, anyone interested think about what the what their team would look like. So whether it's an NNIP or similar research partner, um, you saw with the tight timeline, they need to have a really existing capacity around data and convening um, the local philanthropy, the Federal Reserve connections, um, and to contribute to cross-site activities, so to really participate in the peer learning along the way. So since we're just getting started, I wanted to share a few of the experiences from, um, from NNIP, and we'll then um, hopefully report back at, if this is annual, next year at our um, reunion conference. Um, I think uh, Karen mentioned our, um, the, the essay that we'll be publishing soon with Solomon Green, um, and in that essay, we really break this out into three uh, components of really raising the expectations for actionable data, like not being satisfied with ACS, saying that you really need this real-time tracker, um, and knowing that it's possible. The, um, the first is access, this raw material, whether that's through open data sites like um, New York and Philly have made progress through, whether it's through um, crowdsourcing, whether it's through getting um, Zillow rents, whatever, you know, looking at that panoply and ex expen uh, expanding it, um, uh, both across topics and um, to get that fine grain, like Ira said, around block groups or, or address level. I'll show you an example in a second. The second is that um, the data, if you've looked at any sort of open data portal, is not going to help you, actually. It's just big, like, you know, 800,000 data sets on data.gov. So you really do need that analytic layer. You need local context. You need what matters. Somebody asked for uh, the person, oh, I think it was Paul asked for parsimonious list of what the indicators are, what are the warning signs, um, what are the really forces behind the trends, all that stuff. It does need um, sort of curation. And then finally, application, this built-in connection to the government and civic actors who have the tools and processes to respond. So I love that point about really educating the um, nonprofits and residents. So, And if you don't layer all of this with the principles um, of equity of what you're trying to accomplish with those goals in mind and participation, which is what also came up in all three of these panels, um, you could have um, all of this for naught. So I think, you know, I think some of the government questions about efficiency or data-driven decisions always make people nervous because they think it's done outside of a framework of um, of actual your your community goals. But um, but it's definitely possible. And if you don't have this in your city, we should you should speak up and ask for it or figure it out. So many of you know the um, examples of Cleveland. We certainly don't have all the answers. Part of NNIP as a peer learning network is struggling together, um, trying to um, just get better over time. So this is pretty small. You don't need to know the details. It's also very utilitarian, if you notice, in, in user design. Their neighborhood stabilization team um, uh, website has, um, I think, up to 20 uh, property data sets linked over time, um, and it ranges from sheriff auctions, foreclosures, property deeds, tax arrears. Um, there's no reason this can't exist in every city in America. Like we should just um, figure out how to do it and make it happen. The um, the, that's the access part, so the data is there. The analysis part is that it goes through our partner um, at the Case Western University has um, flags for speculator purchases. They combine several indicators to combine for a vacancy risk score. Um, there's other layers of short-term analysis that goes through that goes out to the practitioners. And then long-term analysis, what happens to batches of property over time, where are, it gets pushed to neighborhood indicators, which are on a public site. So um, thinking of that, um, the analysis part, and then on um, the application part, um, the land bank uses the exact same data, 
the city agencies, the building department, the code enforcement people, they're working off the same data. The CDCs are working off the same data. So they're also feeding in informal data that they know about acquisition, about landlords. So it's um, everyone is working off a common platform to both work collectively um, and with their individual policy levers. So they have um, the knowledge and the, and the tools to do it. Uh, just a few other like uh, potpourri of NNIP examples I wanted. There must be something about green lines, but um, Boston has a great uh, analysis that they did thinking about their green line in Somerville. They did this with the city and other community development organizations. Um, what they did was sort of forecast out the displacement. So both, um, and what was really great about this is that they looked at different mechanisms of displacement. So will the rents rise, will condo conversions, expiring use, um, and tax increases, um, to figure out um, based on um, experience in other parts of the city, um, what was the number of households who were at risk to really put some numbers around it and to look at which one of those things was really um, most important, where they should be focusing their prevention efforts on. But in addition to the great quant work, they also do qualitative work. They partner with the storytelling group and the immigrant group to do this. Um, it just happened, I think, this week, housing stories, exploring belonging in Boston, um, to combine those community voices with the great numbers that they have. Um, you've heard a lot about DC. We um, partner with LISC um, at the Urban Institute. And our affordable housing preservation network meets once a month looks a year out at all of in the individual properties that are coming up for um, expiring subsidies together. This is an online map that's about to be released, um, thanks to Furman Center open sourcing their system. Um, they go through and they figure out which ones are in gentrifying neighborhoods, who's helping which tenant um, agencies, who knows what about this landlord, do we know he's going to renew. So they share these CDCs, city agencies, HUD, I'll sit around a table and um, and go through one by one because each of those buildings is really precious and we and spend the time to figure that out together. But so that's the um, short term. I think Jeff had like the one by one option. But the other issue is that they took the um, the other energy with, that they put into was to take all the knowledge that they have from ten years of working together to come up with an affordable housing strategy that they presented to the mayor um, last year um, as when she arrived, so to both work at the building level and at the system level to try to uh, make sure that we preserve as much affordable housing as we can in DC. And then finally, um, somebody asked if there was a mover survey. There's um, uh, our partner I tweeted it out in Pittsburgh, um, did a mover survey in Lawrenceville, which is one of the areas they're concerned about um, rapidly gentrifying there. Um, we did hipster bingo on our tour. So that was, um, I'll share that with anyone if they want to see it. But they really asked about why people were coming in. This is a couple of years ago, so it was very early. Um, what attracted them to the neighborhood. They also, through, this was through credit records, they tracked people who left. So they interviewed people and um, interviewed people who left um, about why they um, were leaving the neighborhood. So in Portland has done something similar. So these are small scale. These are not real time um, data, but they can, um, but they gave you um, a better qualitative sense about what was working and how to move forward. So these um, are just some examples of what's possible with an embedded institution, with real-time data, with the policy tools you need, with the political will and, and community process. So um, it's possible to make progress everywhere. If you just wrap this bridge, all that um, research from the beginning and all this wisdom, practitioner wisdom from the end, and um, we have our marching orders, I think, going forward in all of our own cities. So um, we'll be excited to share the Turning the Corner research. We have a um, page on our NNIP website. There's also other examples from our partners there. And um, uh, the steering committee for Turning the Corner, I think everybody is here, actually. So we're all happy to talk to you. You'll be hearing from Michael in a little bit. And there's a, I don't know, is there time for questions? Time for questions. Um, awesome. Yeah, um, question. Uh, this has been a great app. Great day of learning. Um, so um, Eric Belsky in the morning mentioned the Community Reinvestment Act, and I was wondering if anyone else was going to talk about it. You know, I was I was a bit familiar with it. 
and also with PACCD. Uh, I'm with the National Community of the Investment Coalition. So um, there is a little bit, not in a regulation, but in a document called the Interagency Guidance, Question and Answers from CRA. There was some discussion about <coughs> gentrification and that banks received kind of favorable to CRA consideration for projects that kind of have a community plan, like you were talk talking about in Minneapolis, uh, and also projects that don't primarily displace. Um, huh. So just, you know, a question for Aramenta, for Beth, for Jonathan, to what extent were banks involved in these projects to, you know, try to try to pr prevent displacement, to try to promote mixed income, you know, mixed use neighborhoods? Um, or should we be trying to use CRA a little more? You know, banks kind of absent. You know, you talk about $50 million. Are they all risk or were some banks kicking in as well? Uh, well, the $50 million is all this, but the banks are one of our donors. Um, so they are uh, they are a supporter, but at least in my jurisdictions, the bank is very act. Banks are very active. Uh, they are in virtually every project that we lend to. Um, they have their own specific guidelines that they use to invest in the neighborhoods in D.C. So for us, uh, whether it's because that little statement appears in the guidelines or whether they've discovered it's good business, we have active uh, bank participation in in like all of these projects we're doing and a host of others. Um, I'm definitely not, I definitely don't have a um, in my mind an inventory of all the kind of bank activity and CRA activity in Philadelphia, but I do know that the banks have been um, very active supporters of our actually um, of our organization, the PACDC, and working on developing this platform. They fund obviously. There's lots of um, individual member projects, in which obviously the banks are involved. We also have a CDC tax credit program here in Philadelphia, um, where um, <clears throat> it doesn't have to be a bank; it can be any entity that has. Um, city tax liability now it's of a hundred thousand per year or more will donate that for ten years to a CDC every every year for ten years to a CDC and then that funding is used by the CDC to do community development um, I'm sorry economic development in neighborhoods um, so there are some banks that participate in that program as well there's some non banks as well but I think to your point of can we do a better job of, of getting banks to do more um, point well taken <laughs> yes. Um, maybe I just add specifically. I talked about the big picture project, the ten-year affordable housing plan, which had twenty-four partners, um, and we we tried to choose representatives of sectors to sit on that twenty-four person. So there was uh, a, a person or two represented a lot of uh, advocacy organizations. There was a, um, a bank that sat, or I think it was actually two banks that sat representing financial institutions and putting the plan together. And then, of course, they've been uh, helpful as well in, in terms of financing the buildings. There's a particular building I showed a picture of that's a mixed uh, income building um, that uh, those of you who do affordable housing know how hard that is. And, and LISC worked with a bank to create a new mezzanine loan product, and, and the bank was very uh, flexible and trying to help make that work to showcase this opportunity to do a mixed income project. So, uh, for the for the green line, they've they've been quite involved both in the planning and implementation. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, for the index, I think Ira, you developed the, the introduction of the housing value, right? All sales price. Price. Yeah, and uh, why did that be considered? So the question, the question is, why we use home prices instead of rents? Uh, largely availability. Rents are almost never available at anything other than a, a census tract or block group level, and then they're showing up five-year intervals and things like that. And I think, as you saw from that map, these things are changing much smaller and much more rapidly than you'd be able to detect by using <coughs> things like census tract rents and home values and things like that. So that's really the main reason. I think it's also one of the shortcomings of the index, right? Like, we don't know exactly what the implications are for those who are renting. Um, I think we'll have to figure that out as we go forward. But it, that's the reason why. 
other questions? There's no more questions. There's something I forgot to put in my presentation, if oh. I have a second, um, yeah. really quickly. Um, just coming back to Mr. Parker's presentation earlier around small businesses, um, I forgot to mention, we, we partnered on a project with um, the Woodrow Wilson School of um, Public Policy at Princeton University this past year, and actually I had a team of students that looked at three neighborhood commercial corridors, um, one that is kind of considered gentrified, um, one that is in the process of change, um, uh, in, and is near a university where you've got a bunch of uh, university investment and then kind of long-term businesses, and one that is not at all gentrifying at all, but you've got development pressure and real estate pressure on either side of it and could potentially lead to some change. And so we canvassed the business owners similar to what you did and asked them, you know, what do you, what do you think? You know, asked them a whole set of questions, had translators, multiple languages um, to do this. And of course what we found is they're not thinking about gentrification at all. They're thinking about crime, they're thinking about lighting, they're thinking about litter, they're thinking about inventory, they're thinking about sales. Um, and, you know, just because they're not doesn't mean that we shouldn't. Um, you know, think of ways to ensure that they are strong and stable and can weather any changes and benefit from changes. Um, and that's, you know, one of the things that we're kind of looking at some of the recommendations that came out of that research from the students and try to figure out how we can kind of enrich our work around displacement and small businesses and, and um and kind of see if there are some models or approaches that we could take there. The jury's still out. We don't know yet, but yeah. I think we have time for one more, right? You got it. So great, great panel. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, I don't know if this thing's ever going to turn green for me. So, <laughs> um, two, two questions. One for um, for the folks from LISC. You do amazing work in this city and elsewhere. Um, Topa is an amazing tool. I spent a little bit of time in DC. I actually lived in a building that was part rent control and part not. Um, so I'm wondering how many buildings have actually been bought under TOPA? Because it seems like a DC apartment building is worth like a zillion dollars. So how do tenants get together <laughs> to buy it? That's one question. And for Beth, a question for you. Uh, your plan's amazing, of course, very impressive. Strengthening the ability of neighborhoods to groups and in create inclusive communities. There's a lot of neighborhoods like mine in Queen Village where the business the commercial corridor is in in the middle of a neighborhood that's undergoing rapid change. I haven't seen too much from anywhere in the city where anyone's trying to work on that problem in a kind of inclusive way, trying to get the business owners together with the community. What do you need? What do you want? Here's where the disposable income is. Here's where the traditional businesses are. So are there any good examples of where that's happening in the city? Because I'd like some models that we can apply. So, uh, Protopa. I um, actually don't have the final number in my in my head, but I know as LISC itself, we finance close to a hundred properties. But then there's a larger universe. But over the last uh, since 1987, the process or the role of the tenant association and what it ultimately became has shifted. When we first started in '87, early '90s, it was cooperatives. Then we had a period which you could afford to buy. It became condominiums. And now it's rolling into the properties are just staying as rental because those other two options are not as viable anymore. But the thing that is really helping is the fact that it isn't just that the tenant association has to buy the property. They can connect with and pass their rights to a nonprofit who has the capacity and the financial wherewithal to buy the building. And... They can also choose a for-profit. We are seeing an increase in the number of tenant associations who are becoming 50 or 51 percent owners of the building, and the for-profit owns the remains, and they have the systems, the financing, the property management acumen, and that is a very viable option in a market where a 35-unit building could cost $10 million. Uh, and so we, we have a much more diverse potential for the role of the tenant association than we would have had 20 years ago. Um, and just really quickly, Jeff, I think um, New Kensington and People's Emergency Center, uh, People's Emergency Center, are obviously two examples of CDCs that have a lot of capacity to be able to kind of. They do economic development, they do housing, they do vacant land management, they do. They have social services, so they've been able to kind of um, through their. They're not the only two, but I think two good examples. You know, PEC on their Make Your Mark plan for Lower Lancaster Avenue. Um, uh, is a probably really good example of how they've been trying to kind of bring all those different aspects of the neighborhood together and kind of envisioning the community that they want to see. You need a CDC in your neighborhood is what you need. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Thank you. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Michael Grover. I'm the Community Affairs Officer at the Federal Reserve Bank in Minneapolis. Uh, Minneapolis uh, the Minneapolis Fed was one of the co-sponsors today. Look in your folders. You have a document that looks like this. We need your feedback, both in terms of what you thought about the conference today, about the symposium today, um, what was most useful, um, most relevant, things like that. We'd really appreciate it if you, uh, if you fill these out. Um, it's this sort of feedback that we use um, on an ongoing sort of basis to kind of tweak our programs and also to kind of think about what the next step is here. Um, I, I'd like to start off by just saying that I won't be here for very long, so <laughs> my head hurts a lot from listening to all the great information today, and I have to, luckily I, I have tonight to kind of think about it and process a lot of this information, so I, I want to give you plenty of time to do that as well. Um, I'd like to thank each of the partners for who organized the uh, symposium today, Philly Fed, the NYU's Furman Center, uh, as well as HUD, and specifically um, um, talking to, um, pointing out a number of folks from the Philly Fed who did a lot of heavy lifting, Sydney, Lay, and Nathaniel, who were all kind of doing the heavy lifting for the event today. I also want to share all the, uh, or thank all the um, folks who presented on the panels today for providing their insights and ideas that give us really a lot of information to think about. Um, overall, I'm supposed to sum up. <laughs> and, I and I have lots of notes um, back there. I have like three pages of notes. So as opposed to going through all my notes and kind of trying to pull out the interesting stuff, and there's a lot of interesting stuff today, I thought I'd basically say this. Um, I think the papers show that the causes and consequences of gentrification are complex and at times contradictory. And the strategies to address how to respond to gentrification really reflect the, comp the, the complicated and comprehensive nature of how neighborhoods are changing post-recession um, and post the housing crisis. And really, I see this, as, this today where we tried to cram in everything in an eight-hour period is really starting the conversation. Um, hopefully this conversation will continue back in communities where you're coming from, um, and hopefully we'll have this conversation at other venues. I, I didn't get the memo on this being an annual conference, so, so, which I'm all in favor for, but, but maybe we need to come together after a few more years of getting some work done. Um, so for me, some of the interesting findings that I wanted to point out today have a lot to do with where, when, who, and what. Um, distance and timing matter. Um, I think the earlier findings that talked about this key distance between of two to three kilometers outside the central business district or right from downtown are really interesting. And the fact that none of the, or very few of the neighborhoods outside of that dis distance, this donut, haven't really improved all that much. So we have, we have une you know, it brings me back to grad school. We have this une uneven nature of um, urban development that continues um, and that we're still trying to address. Um, I think understanding the demographics, the tastes and choices of some of the groups that are driving um, these changes, especially in the urban cores, are interesting and, and really are something we need to take into consideration. Um, the what. What happens in these neighborhoods to both existing residents and neighborhoods? These findings shows that, that show that what happens to people in businesses, businesses can be subtle, complex, and can vary by place and time. Um, and I think two of the things that I'll pull out from this in terms of the why are that this is a broader conversation we need to have that's connected to two other things that I see as, as big takeaways for me today, which is the broader conversation we need to have about affordable housing and how that has a regional impact, but also this broader conversation about um, uh, and concern really about resegregation. That, re that as um, neighborhoods are improving, that we're only going to um, resegregate um, our metropolitan areas um, and, and be back kind of to, the, um, to a point in time where we weren't necessarily in good shape. Um, so why is the Fed involved in all, of, in all of this? And I think Eric talked a little bit about it this morning by talking about the fact that this really reflects the community development mission of the Fed, which is focused on really um, making low-income communities better places to live, but also improving the lives of low-income households and families as well. And it's, it's really the research that's been going on that we heard about today has a prominent role to play in all of this. 
as former chairman Bernack, as former Fed chairman Ben Bernanke stated, to solve problems, we really need to understand them. We really need to know what's going on. And as researchers, including myself, we have an affirmative responsibility to make our studies of these problems faced by communities more relevant to policymakers and practitioners out in the field who are trying to figure this out. So it's taking what we learned today from the earlier presentations and translating it, that, that information, which I think is something that the Fed can do um, and that researchers should continue to do as well. Um, in conclusion, uh, I think this conversation is, uh, we're at a point in time, and I think Jeff had shared this before, we're at an important time right now where a lot of things are happening, and the start of this conversation is really a good place to get our heads wrapped around this problem. And it would really be a missed opportunity, as Eric Belsky pointed out this morning, where we, public investments are being made, but we don't have a strategy for directing them in a, in a, in a progressive and as in a positive sort of way. So I think I'll leave my comments at that and say that the Federal Reserve Banks of Minneapolis and Philadelphia are, and others too, such as San Francisco and New York, are really committed to supporting these ongoing efforts. And we look forward to, all, to working with all of you as our partners to make that happen. Thank you.